Section 22 of The Life of Frances Power Cobb is told by herself, by Frances Power Cobb. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17. My Social Life in London in the Sixties and Seventies. Part 3. At a later date I had other Oriental visitors. One, a gentleman who had made a translation of the Bhagavad Gita, and who brought his wife and children to England and to my tea-table the wife wore a lovely delicate lilac robe wrapped about her in the most graceful folds but the effect was somewhat marred by the vulgar english side-spring boots very short in the leg which the poor soul had found needful for use in london the children sat opposite me at the tea-table silently devouring my cakes and bonbons staring at me with their large black eyes veritable wells of mistrust and hatred such as only eastern eyes can speak i like dark men and women very well but when the little ones are in question i must confess that a child is scarcely a child to me unless it be a little saxon with golden hair and those innocent blue eyes which make one think of forget-me-nots in a brook where is the heart which can help growing soft at the sight of one of these little creatures toddling in the spring grass picking daisies and cowslips or laughing with sheer ecstasy in the joy of existence a dark child may be ten times as handsome but it has no pretension to my mind to pull one's heart-strings in the same way as a blond babykin's a hindu lady ramabai for whom i have deep respect came to me before i left london and impressed me most favourably she and a few other hindu women who are striving to secure education and freedom for their sisters will be honoured hereafter more than john howard for he strove only to mitigate the too severe punishment of criminals and delinquents they are labouring to relieve the quite equally dreadful lot of millions of innocent women an american missionary mr dahl long resident in india told me that thousands of these unhappy beings never put their feet to the earth or go a step from the house of their husbands to which they are carried from their father's zenana at nine or ten years old so they were borne away as corpses all life for them has been one long imprisonment its sole interest and concern the passions of the baser sort of love and jealousy while writing these pages i have come across the following frightful testimony by the great traveller mrs bishop nay isabella bird to the truth of the above observation concerning the dreadful condition of the women of india i have lived in zenanas and harems and have seen the daily life of the secluded women and i can speak from bitter experience of what their lives are the intellect dwarfed so that the woman of twenty or thirty years of age is more like a child of eight intellectually while all the worst passions of human nature are stimulated and developed in a fearful degree jealousy envy murderous hate intrigue running to such an extent that in some countries i have hardly ever been in a woman's house or near a woman's tent without being asked for drugs with which to disfigure the favourite wife or take away her life or to take away the life of the favourite wife's infant son this request has been made of me nearly two hundred times quoted by lady henry somerset in the woman's signal april twelfth eighteen ninety four i had the pleasure also of visits from several french and belgian gentlemen who were good enough to call on me several were protestant pastors of the ecole moderne m fontaine m theodore bost and m lebois being among them i had long kept up a correspondence with m felix pecot author of a beautiful book les christ et les conscience of whom dean stanley told me that he who knew him well believed him to be the most pious of living men i never had the happiness to meet him but seeing some twenty years later in a report by mr matthew arnold on french training schools enthusiastic praise of m pecot's school for female teachers at fontenay aux roses near paris i sent it to my old friend and we exchanged a mental handshake across time and space an illustrious neighbor of ours in south kensington sometimes came to see me here is a lively complimentary letter from him from monsieur le senateur victor schulcher to miss cobb paris douze mille huit cent quatre-vingt-trois dear honored miss power cobb 
je ne vous ai pas oublié. On ne vous oublie pas quand on a eu l'honneur et le plaisir de vous connaître. Moi, je suis accablé d'ouvrages et je ne fais pas la moitié de ce que je voudrais faire. Je ne manque pas toutefois de lire votre zoophile français qui aidera puissamment notre Ligue à combattre les abus de la vivisection. Tous ceux qui ont quelques sentiments d'humanité écouteront votre voix en faveur des pauvres animaux et vous aideront de toutes leurs forces à les protéger contre un genre d'études véritablement barbare. Quant à moi, l'activité, la persévérance et le talent que vous montrez dans votre œuvre de charité m'inspirent le plus vif et le plus respectueux intérêt. Ne croyez pas ceux qui tentent de vous décourager en prétendant que votre journal est une substance trop aride pour attacher le lecteur français. Je le sais, il est convenu en Angleterre que les Français sont un peuple léger, mais c'est là un vieux préjugé que ne gardent pas les Anglais instruits. Soyez bien assurés que vos efforts ne seront pas plus peine perdue dans mon noble pays que dans le vôtre. Notre société protectrice des animaux a quarante ans d'existence. À mon prochain voyage à Londres, je m'empresserai d'aller vous faire visite pour retrouver le plaisir que j'ai goûté dans votre conversation et pour vous répéter, dear Miss Power Cobb, that I am yours most respectfully and faithfully. V. Schulcher Permettez-moi de vous prier de me rappeler au souvenir de Madame la Doctoresse et de Monsieur le Dr. Hogan. It was Monsieur Schulcher who effected in 1848 the abolition of Negro slavery in the French colonies. He was a charming companion and a most excellent man. I interceded once with him to make interest with the proper authorities in France for the relaxation of the extremely severe penalties which Louise Michel had incurred by one of her extravagances. To my surprise, I learned from him that I had gone to headquarters, since the matter would mainly rest in his hands. He was vice president, practically president, of the Department of Prisons in France. He repeated with indulgence, Mais, madame, elle est folle, elle est parfaitement folle et très dangereuse. I quite agreed, but still thought she was well-meaning and that her sentence was excessive. He promised that when the first year of her imprisonment was over, with which, he said, they made it a rule never to interfere so as not to insult the judges, he would see what could be done to let her off by degrees. He observed, with more earnestness than I should have expected from one of his political school, how wrong, dangerous, and wicked it was to go about with a black flag at the head of a mob. Still, he agreed with my view that the length of Louise Michel's sentence was unjustly great. Eventually, the penalty was actually commuted. I conclude through the intervention of Monsieur Schulcher. Monsieur Schulcher was the most attractive Frenchman I ever met. At the time I knew him, he was old and feeble and had a miserable cough, but he was most emphatically a gentleman a tender, even soft-hearted man, and a brilliantly agreeable talker. He had made a magnificent collection of nine thousand engravings, and told me he was going to present it to the Beaux-Arts in Paris. While sitting talking in my drawing-room, his eye constantly turned to a particularly fine cast which I possess of the psyche of Praxiteles, made expressly for Harriet Hosmer, and given by her to me in Rome. When he rose to leave me, he stood under the lovely creature and worshipped her as she deserves. We also had many delightful American visitors, whose visits gave me so much pleasure and profit that I easily forgave one or two others who provoked Fanny Kemble's remark that if the engineers would lay on Miss P. or Mr. H., the Alps would be bored through without any trouble." Most of my American friendly visitors are, I rejoice to say, still living, so I will only name them with an expression of my great esteem for all and affection for several of them. Among them were Colonel Higginson, Mr. George Curtis, Mrs. Howe, Mrs. Livermore, Mr. and Mrs. Loring Brace, Reverend J. Freeman Clark, Reverend W. Alger, Dr. O. W. Holmes, Mr. Peabody, Miss Harriet Hosmer, Mr. Hazard, Mrs. Lockwood, and my dearly beloved friends, W. H. Channing, Mrs. Apthorpe, Mrs. Wister, Miss Schuyler, and Miss Georgina Schuyler. 
sometimes american ladies would come to me as perfect strangers with a letter from some mutual friend and would take me by storm and after a couple of hours conversation we parted as if we had known and loved each other for years there is something to my mind unique in the attractiveness of american women when they are as usual attractive but they are like the famous little girl with the curl in the middle of her forehead when she was good she was very very good when she was bad she was horrid the wholesome horror felt by us londoners of outstaying our welcome when visiting acquaintances and of trespassing too long at any hour seems to be an unknown sentiment to some americans and also to some australian ladies and for my own part i fear that being bored is a kind of martyrdom which i can never endure in a christian spirit or without beginning to regard the man or woman who bores me with most uncharitable sentiments my young hindu visitors drove me distracted till i discovered that they imagined a visit to me to be an audience and that it was for me to dismiss them i met longfellow during his last visit to england at the house of mr Wyn finch his large leonine head surmounted at that date by a nimbus of white hair was very striking indeed i saw him standing a few moments alone and ventured to introduce myself as a friend of his friends the apthorpes of boston and when i gave my name he took both my hands and pressed them with delightful cordiality we talked for a good while but i cannot remember any particular remark he may have made mr wynne finch was stepfather of alice lestrange who before her marriage with lawrence oliphant was for a long time our most assiduous and affectionate visitor having taken a young girl's engouement for us two elderly women never was there a more bewitching young creature so sweetly affectionate so clever and brilliant in every way it was quite dazzling to see such youth and brightness flitting about us an old letter of hers to my friend which i chanced to have fallen on is alive still with her playfulness and tenderness it begins thus four upper brook street london october third eighteen seventy one oh yes i know it isn't so very long since i heard last and i am in london which i am enjoying and am busy in a thousand little messy things which amuse me and i was with miss cobb on tuesday which was bliss absolute and above all i heard about you from her beside all the talk on that forbidden subject it is so disagreeable of us isn't it i felt that ingratitude for mercies received which characterizes our race so strong in me that i want a sight of your writing as that is all i can get just now etc etc alice was of an extremely sceptical turn of mind which made her subsequent fanaticism the more inexplicable and for months before she fell in with mr oliphant in paris i had been laboring with all my strength to lead her simply to believe in god she did not see her way to such faith at all though she was docile enough to read the many books i gave her and to come with us and her stepfather to hear dr martineau's sermons she incessantly discussed theological questions but always from the point of view of the evil in creation and as she used to say pathetically of the insufferableness of the sufferings of others she argued that the misery of the world was so great that a good god if he could not relieve it ought to hurl it to destruction in vain i argued that there is a higher end of creation than happiness to be wrought out through trial and pain she would never admit the loftier conception of god's purposes as they appeared to me and was to all intents and purposes an atheist when she said good-bye to me before a short trip to paris she came back in a month or six weeks not merely a believer in the ordinary orthodox creed but inspired with the zeal of an energumen for the doctrines very much over and above orthodoxy of mr harris our gentle caressing modest young friend was entirely transformed she stood upright and walked up and down our rooms talking with vehemence about mr harris's doctrines and the necessity for adopting his views obeying his guidance and going immediately to live on the shores of lake erie 
the transfiguration was i suppose a fond one of the many miracles of the little god with the bow and arrows and mr oliphant was certainly not unconcerned therein but still there was no adequate explanation of this change or of the boasting difficult to hear with patience from a clever and sceptical woman of the famous method of obtaining fresh supplies of divine spirit by the process of holding one's breath for some minutes according to mr harris's pneumatology the whole thing was infinitely distressing even revolting to us and we sympathized much with her stepfather my friend's old friend who had loved her like a father and was driven wild by the insolent pretensions of mr harris to stop the marriage of which all london had heard unless his monstrous demands were previously obeyed at last alice walked by herself one morning to her bank and ordered her whole fortune to be transferred to mr harris and this without the simplest settlement or security for her future support after this heroic proceeding the prophet of lake erie graciously consented in a way to her marriage and england saw her and mr oliphant no more for many years what that very helpless and self-indulgent young creature must have gone through in her solitary cottage on lake erie and subsequently in her poor little school in california can scarcely be guessed when she returned to england she wrote to us from hunstanton hall her brother's house offering to come and see us but we felt that it would cause us more pain than pleasure to meet her again and in a kindly way we declined the proposal since her sad death and that of mr oliphant an american friend of mine mr leffingwell travelling in syria wrote me a letter from her house at haifa he found her books still on the shelves where she had left them and the first he took down was parker's discourse of religion inscribed from francis power cobb to alice lestrange a less tragic souvenir of poor alice occurs to me as i write it is so good an illustration of the difference between english and french politeness that i must record it alice was going over to paris alone and as i happened to know that a distinguished and very agreeable old french gentleman of my acquaintance was crossing by the same train i wrote and begged him to look after her on the way he replied in the kindest and most graceful manner as follows Chère mademoiselle vraiment vous me comblez de toutes les manières après l'aimable accueil que vous avez bien voulu me faire vous songez encore à mes ennuis de voyage seul et vous voulez bien me procurer la société la plus agréable agréez en tous mes remerciements quoique je ne puisse m'empêcher de songer que s'il avait moins neigé sur la montagne comme disent les orientaux vous seriez moins confiante je serais trop heureux de me mettre au service de votre amie agréez chère mademoiselle les hommages respectueux de votre dévoué serviteur, baron de T. 1er décembre 1871 They met at Charing Cross, and no man could be more charming than Monsieur le Baron de T. made himself in the train and on the boat. But on arrival at Bologna, it appeared that Alice's luggage had either gone astray or been stopped by the custom house people and she was in a difficulty the train for paris being ready to start and the french officials paying no attention to her entreaty that the trunk should be delivered and put into the van to take with her of course the appearance by her side of a french gentleman with a legion d'honneur in his buttonhole would have probably decided the case in her favour at once but m de t had not the least idea of losing his train and getting into an imbroglio for the sake of a damsel in distress so with many assurances that he was quite désolé to lose the enchanting pleasure of her society up to paris he got into his carriage and was quickly carried out of sight meanwhile a rather ordinary-looking englishman who had noted miss lestrange's awkward situation went up to her and asked in a gruff fashion what was the matter when he was informed he let his train go off and ran hither and thither about the station till at last the luggage was found and restored to its owner then when alice strove naturally to thank him he simply raised his hat said it was of no consequence and disappeared to trouble her no more which therefore was neighbour to him that fell among thieves postscript eighteen ninety eight 
so many recollections of mr gladstone have been published since his death that it seems hardly worth while to record mine i saw him only at intervals and never had the honour of any intimate acquaintance with him but one or two glimpses of him may perhaps amuse my readers as exhibiting his astonishing versatility i met him some time in the sixties in north wales when he came from hawarden to visit at a house where i was spending a few days and joined me in walking to the summit of penmine bach he talked i need not say delightfully all the way as we sauntered up but i remember only his sympathetic rejoinder to my dislike of mules for such mountain expeditions that he had felt quite remorseful on concluding some tour i think in the pyrenees for hating so much a beast to which he had often owed his life some years after this pleasant climb i was surprised and of course much flattered to receive from him the following note i know not who was the friend who sent him my pamphlet it had not occurred to me to do so for carlton gardens march first eighteen seventy six dear miss cobb i do not know whom i have to thank for sending me your word illegible article on vivisection but the obligation is great for i seldom read a paper possessed with such a spirit of nobleness from first to last it is long since we met on the slopes of penmine bach do you ever go out to breakfast and could we persuade you to be so kind as to come to us on thursday march ninth at ten believe me faithfully yours w e gladstone the breakfast in carlton gardens was a very interesting one before it began mr gladstone took me into his library and we talked for a considerable time on the subject of vivisection at the close of our conversation finding him apparently agreeing very cordially with me i asked if he would not join the victoria street society which i had then recently founded he replied that he would rather not do so but that if ever he returned to office he would help me to the best of his power this promise i may here say was given very seriously after making the observation that he was no longer at that time in the position of influence he had occupied in previous years but he obviously anticipated his return to power which actually followed not long afterwards he repeated this promise of help to me four times in conversation and once on one of his famous postcards and again in writing to lord shaftesbury in reply to a memorial which the latter presented to him signed by one hundred of the foremost names as regarded intellect and character in england always mr gladstone repeated the same assurance all his sympathies were with us here is the letter on the card dated april first eighteen seventy seven in reply to my request that he would write a few words to be read by lord shaftesbury at one of our meetings it ran as follows dear miss cobb you are already aware that my sympathies and prepossessions are greatly with you nor do i wish this to be a secret but i am overwhelmed with occupations and i cannot overtake my arrears and my letters have been so constantly put before the world often of course without warrant that i cannot i am afraid appear in the form of an epistle ad hoc more than i can in person faithfully yours w e gladstone april first eighteen seventy seven half the words in his apology for not writing would of course have more than sufficed for the letter desired naturally after all this i looked to mr gladstone as a most powerful friend of the anti-vivisection cause and though i had no sympathy with his religious views and thought his policy very dangerous i counted on him as a man who since his suffrage had been obtained in a great moral question was sure to give it his support in fitting time and place the sequel showed how delusive was my trust to return to the breakfast in carlton gardens there sat down with us to my amusement a gentleman with whom i had already made acquaintance an ex-priest of some distinction rev rudolph suffield who had recently quitted the church of rome but retained enough of priestly looks and manners to be rather antipathetic to me mr gladstone ingeniously picked mr suffield's brains for half an hour eliciting all manner of information on romish doctrines and practice till the conversation drifted to pascal's provinciales 
i expressed my admiration for the book and recalled gibbon's droll confession that he whom byron styled the lord of irony that master spell had learned the sanglant sarcasm of his fifteenth and sixteenth chapters from the pious author of the pensee mr gladstone eagerly interposed with some fine criticisms and ended with the amazing remark i have read all the jesuit answers to pascal to ascertain whether he had misquoted suarez and escobar and the rest and i found that he had not done so you may take my word for it from this theological discussion there was a diversion when a gentleman on the other side of the breakfast-table handed across to mr gladstone certain drawings of the legs of horses they proved to be sketches of several pairs in the panathenaic frieze and were produced to settle the highly interesting question to mr gladstone whether greek horses ever trotted or only walked cantered and ambled i forget how the drawings were supposed finally to settle the controversy but i made him laugh by telling him that a party of the servants of one of my irish friends having paid a visit to the elgin gallery the lady's maid told her mistress next morning that they had been puzzled to understand why all those men without legs or arms had been stuck up on the wall at last the butler had suggested that they were intended to commemorate the railway accidents from that time i met mr gladstone occasionally at the houses of friends and was of course like all the world charmed with his winning manners and brilliant talk though never that i can recall struck by any thought expressed by him which could be called a great one or which lifted up one's spirit it seemed more as if half a dozen splendidly cultivated and brilliant intellects but all of medium height had been incarnated in one vivacious body than a single mind of colossal altitude the religious element in him was in almost feverish activity but it always appeared to me that it was not on the greatest things of religion that his attention fastened it was on its fringe rather than on its robe that mr gladstone was a sincerely pious man i do not question but his piety was of the sacerdotal rather than of the puritan type the single eye was never his if it had been he would not have employed the torturous and ambiguous oratory which so often left his friends and foes to interpret his utterances in opposite senses neither did he appear at all events to his more distant observers to feel adequately the tremendous responsibility to god and man which rested on the well-nigh omnipotent prime minister of england during the years when it was rare to open a newspaper without reading of some military disaster like the death of gordon or of some agrarian murder like the assassination of lord frederick cavendish and a score of hapless irish landlords calamities which his policy had failed to prevent if it had not directly occasioned the gaiety of spirits and the animation of interest respecting a hundred trivial topics which mr gladstone exhibited unfailingly through that fearfully anxious period approached perhaps sometimes too nearly to levity to accord with our older ideal of a devout mind loaded with the weight almost not to be borne of world-wide cares the differences between church and descent occupied mr gladstone i fancy very much at all times one day he remarked to me as if it were a valuable new light on the subject that an eminent nonconformist had just told him that the dissenters generally did not object either to the doctrine or the discipline of the church of england but that they found no warrant in scripture for the existence of a state church mr gladstone looked as if he were seeking an answer to this objection to conformity i replied that i wondered they did not see that the whole old testament might be taken as a history of a divinely appointed state church mr gladstone lifted his marvellous eagle-like eyes with a quick glance which might be held to signify that's an idea when the little incident was told soon after to dean stanley he rubbed his hands and laughingly said this may put off disestablishment yet a while as a member of society mr gladstone as everybody knows was inexhaustibly interesting 
i once heard him after a small dinner party criticize and describe with astonishing vividness and minuteness the sermons of at least twenty popular preachers at last i ventured to interpose with some impatience and say but mr gladstone you have not mentioned the greatest of them all my pastor dr martineau he paused and then said weighing his words carefully dr martineau is unquestionably the greatest of living thinkers speaking of the jews he once afforded the company at a dinner-table a lively and interesting sketch of the ubiquity of the race all over the globe except in scotland the scotch he said knew as well as they the value of bobbies there was a general laugh and some one remarked why then are there so few in ireland mr gladstone answered that he supposed the irish were too poor to afford them fair pasture i said perhaps so now but when you mr gladstone have given the irish farmers fixity of tenure so that they can give security for loans we shall see the jews flocking over to ireland this observation was made in eighteen seventy nine and in the intervening twenty years i am informed that the jews have settled down in ireland like seagulls on the land after a storm the old gombean man has been ousted all over the country and a whole jew quarter near the circular road and a new synagogue in dublin have verified my prophecy at last the day came when the sympathy of which mr gladstone had so often assured lord shaftesbury and myself was to be put to the simplest test mr reed now sir robert reed was to introduce our bill for the prohibition of vivisection into parliament april fourth eighteen eighty three i wrote to mr gladstone a short note imploring him to lift his hand to help us and if it were impossible for him to speak in the house in our favour at least to let his friends know that he wished well to our bill i do not remember the words of that note i know that it was a cry from my very heart to the man who held it in his power to save the poor brutes from their tortures for ever to do what i was spending my life's last years in vainly trying to accomplish he received the note i had a formal acknowledgment of it but mr gladstone did nothing he left us to the tender mercies of sir william harcourt whose audacious and mendacious contradiction of mr george russell our seconder i have detailed elsewhere from that day i never met nor ever desired to meet mr gladstone again a friend whom i greatly admired and valued and whose intercourse i enjoyed during all my residence in london from first to last was mr froude he died just after the first edition of this book of which i had of course sent him a copy was published and i was told it supplied welcome amusement to him in his last days the world i think has never done quite justice to mr froude albeit when he was gone the newspapers spoke of him as the last of the giants he always seemed to me to belong to the loftier race of whom there were then not a few living and though his unhappy nemesis of faith for which i make no defence whatever and his carlyle drew on him endless blame and his splendid history equally endless cavil and criticism his greatness was to my apprehension something apart from his books his essays especially the magnificent one on job give i think a better idea of the man than was derivable from any other source except personal intimacy he touched nothing which he did not enlarge if not adorn subjects expanded when talked of easily and even lightly with him there was a background of space always above and behind him though he had no little cause for it he was not bitter i never saw him angry or heard him express resentment except once when his benevolent efforts had failed to obtain from mr gladstone's government a pension for a poverty-stricken meritorious woman of letters while far less deserving persons received the bounty but when he let the mara waters of mr carlyle's private reflections loose on the world their bitterness seemed to communicate itself to all the readers of the book even the silver pen of mrs oliphant for once was dipped in gall and it was she if i mistake not who in her wrath devised the ferocious adjective frudacious to convey her rage and scorn 
as for myself when that book appeared i frankly told mr froude that i rejoiced because i had always deprecated mr carlyle's influence and thought this revelation of him would do much to destroy it mr froude laughed good-humouredly but naturally showed a little consternation his sentiment about the saturday reviewers who at that time buzzed about his writings and stung him every week was much that of a st bernard or a newfoundland towards a pack of snarling terriers one day a clergyman very well known in london wrote to me after one of our little parties to beg that i would do him the favour when next mr froude was coming to me to invite him also and permit him to bring his particular friend mr x who desired to meet his brother historian i was very willing to oblige the clergyman in question and before long we had a gathering at our house of forty or fifty people among whom were mr froude and mr x i knew that the moment for the introduction had arrived but of course i was not going to take the liberty of presenting any stranger to mr froude without asking his consent that consent was not so readily granted as i had anticipated who mr x let me look at him first there he is i said pointing to a small figure half hidden in a group of ladies and gentlemen that is he is it said mr froude oh no no don't introduce him to me he has the saturday review written all over his face there was nothing to do but laugh and presently when my clerical friend came up and urged me to fulfil my promise and make the introduction to hurry down on some excuse into the tea-room and never reappear till the disappointed mr x had departed i have kept thirty-four letters received from mr froude during the years in which i had the good fortune to contribute to fraser's magazine when he was the editor and later when as friends and neighbours in south kensington we had the usual little interchange of messages and invitations among these to me precious letters there are some passages which i shall venture to copy assured that his representatives cannot possibly object to my doing so i may first as an introduction of myself quote one in a letter to my eldest brother who had invited him to stay at newbridge during one of his visits to ireland mr froude wrote to him i knew your brother henry intimately thirty years ago and your sister is one of the most valued friends of my later life his affection for carlyle spoke in this eager refutation of some idle story in the newspapers february sixteenth there is hardly a single word in it which is not untrue ruskin is as much attached to mr carlyle as ever there is not one of his friends to whom he is not growing dearer as he approaches the end of his time nor has the wonderful beauty and noble tenderness of his character been ever more conspicuous the only difference visible in him from what he was in past years is that his wife's death has broken his heart he is gentler and more forbearing to human weakness he feels that his own work is finished and he is waiting hopefully till it please god to take him away here is evidence of his deep enjoyment of nature he writes october thirty first from durine kenmare i return to london most reluctantly at the end of the week the summer refuses to leave us and while you are shivering in the north wind we retain here the still blue cloudlessness of august this morning is the loveliest i ever saw here the woods swarm with blackbirds and thrushes the autumn note not all unlike to that of spring i am so bewitched with the place that having finished my history i mean to spend the winter here and try to throw the story of the last desmond into a novel in reply to a request that he would attend an anti-vivisection meeting at lord shaftesbury's house he wrote vivisection is a hateful illustration of the consequences of the silent supersession of morality by utilitarianism until men can be brought back to the old lines neither this nor any other evil tendency can be really stemmed till the world learns again to hate what is in itself evil in spite of alleged advantages to be derived from it it will never consent to violent legal restrictions his last letter from oxford is pleasant to recall i am strangely placed here the dons were shy of me when i first came but all is well now and the undergraduates seem really interested in what i have to tell them i am quite free and tell them precisely what i think i do not think that mr froude was otherwise than a happy man 
he was particularly so as regarded his feminine surroundings and a most genial and indulgent husband and father he had also intense enjoyment both of nature and the great field of literature into which he had delved so zealously he once told me that he had visited every spot except the tower of london where the great scenes of his history took place and had ransacked every library in europe likely to contain materials for his work not omitting the record chambers of the inquisition at simancas where he had spent many shuddering days which he vividly described to me he also greatly enjoyed his long voyages and visits to the west indies and to new zealand and especially the one he made to america he admired almost everything i think in america and more than once remarked to me in reference particularly to the subject of mixed education in which i was interested the young men are so nice what might be difficult here is easy there you have no idea what nice fellows they are there was however certainly something in mr froude's handsome and noble physiognomy which conveyed the idea of mournfulness his eyes were wells of darkness on which by some singularity the light never seemed to fall either in life or when represented in a photograph and his laugh which was not infrequent was mirthless i never heard a laugh which it was so hard to echo so little contagious the last time i ever saw mr froude was at the house of our common friend miss elliot where he was always to be found at his best her other visitors had departed and we three old friends sat on in the late and quiet sunday afternoon talking of serious things and at last of our hopes and beliefs respecting a future life mr froude startled us somewhat by saying he did not wish to live again he felt that his life had been enough and would be well content not to awake when it was over but said he in conclusion with sudden vigour i believe there is another life you know i am quite sure there is the clearness and emphasis of this conviction were parallel to those he had used before to me in talking of the probable extension of atheism in coming years but as there is a god said mr froude religion can never die End of section 22. Section 23 of Life of Frances Power Cobb is told by herself by Frances Power Cobb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18 My Social Life in London in the 70s and 80s. Part 1. I must not write here any personal sketch, however slight, of my revered friend Dr. Martineau, since he is still, God be thanked for it, living, and writing as profoundly and vigorously as ever, in his venerable age of eighty-nine. But the weekly sermons which I had the privilege of hearing from his lips for many years, down to 1872, besides several courses of his lectures on the Gospels and on ethical philosophy which I attended, formed so very important, I might say vital, a part of my life in London, that I cannot omit some account of them in my story. Little Portland Street Chapel is a building of very moderate dimensions, with no pretensions whatever to ecclesiastical finery, whether of architecture or upholstery or art of any kind. But it was, I always thought, a fitting, simple place for serious people to meet, to think in, not to gaze round them in curiosity or admiration, or to be intoxicated with colors, lights, incense, and music, as would seem to be the intention of the administrators of a neighboring fane. Our services, I suppose, would have been pronounced cold, bare, and dull by a habitué of a ritualistic or Romanist church, but for my own part I should prefer even to be cold, which we were not, rather than allow my religious feelings to be excited through the gratification of my aesthetic sense. On this matter, however, each one must speak and choose for himself. For me, I was perfectly satisfied with my seat in the gallery in that simple chapel, where I could well hear the noblest sermons and see the preacher of whom they always seemed a part. His word, in the old sense, not, like many other men's sermons, things quite apart from the speaker, as we know him in his home and in the street. Of all the men with whom I have ever been acquainted, the one who most impressed me with the sense shall I call it of congruity, of homogeneity, 
of being in short the same all through was he to whom i listened on those happy sundays they were very varied sermons which dr martineau preached the general effect i used to think was not that of receiving lessons from a teacher but of being invited to accompany a guide on a mountain walk from the upper regions of thought where he led us we were able nay compelled to look down on our daily cares and duties from a loftier point of view and thence to return to them with fresh feelings and resolutions sometimes these ascents were very steep and difficult and i have ventured to tell him that the richness of his metaphors and similes beautiful and original as they always were made it harder to climb after him and that we sometimes wanted him to hold out to us a shepherd's crook rather than a jewelled crozier but the exercise if laborious was to the last degree mentally healthful and morally strengthening there was a great variety also in these wonderful sermons to hear one of them only a listener would come away deeming the preacher par eminence a profound and most discriminating critic to hear another he would consider him a philosopher occupied entirely with the vastest problems of science and theology again another would leave the impression of a poet as great in his prose as the author of in memoriam in verse and lastly and above all there was always the man filled with devout feeling who by his very presence and voice communicated reverence and the sense of the nearness of an all-seeing god i could write many pages concerning these sunday experiences but i shall do better i think if i give my readers who have never heard them some small samples of what i carried away from time to time of them as noted down in letters to my friend here are a few of them mr martineau preached of aiming at perfection at the end he drew a picture of a soul which has made such struggles but has failed then he supposed what must be the feeling of such a soul entering on the future life its regrets and then inquired what influence being lifted above the things of sense the nearness to god and holiness would have on it would it then arise yes and the father would say this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found for evermore i cannot tell you how beautiful it was how true in the sense of those deepest intuitions which i hold to be certainly true because they bear with them the sense of being absolutely highest the echo of a higher harmony than belongs to our poor minds he seemed for a moment to be talking in the old conventional way about repentance when too late and then burst out in faith and hope so far transcending all such ideas that one felt it came from another source mr martineau gave us a magnificent sermon on sunday i was in great luck not to miss it one point was this our moral judgments are always founded on what we suppose to be the inward motive of the actor not on the mere external act itself which may be mischievous or beneficent in the highest degree without properly speaking affecting our purely ethical judgment e g an unintentional homicide now if as our opponents affirm our moral sense came to us ab extra merely as the current opinion which society has attached to injurious or beneficial actions then we should not thus decide our judgment by the internal but by the external and visible part of the act by which alone society is hurt or benefited the fact that our moral judgment regards internal things exclusively is evidence that it springs from an internal source and that we judge another because we are compelled to judge ourselves in the same way here is a note i took after hearing another sermon sunday june twenty third if we confess our sins he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness there are two ways of looking at sin common in our time one is to proclaim it so infinitely black that god cannot forgive it except by a method of atonement itself the height of injustice the other is to treat it as so venial that god may be counted on as certain to pass it over at the first moment of regret and all the threats of conscience may be looked on as those of a nurse to a refractory child threats which are never to be executed 
the first of these views seems to honor god most but really dishonors him by representing him as governing the world on a principle abhorrent to reason and justice the second can never commend itself save to the most shallow minds who make religion a thing of words and treat sin and repentance as trivial things instead of the most awful how shall we solve the mystery it is equally unjust for god to treat the guilty as if they were innocent and the penitent as if they were impenitent each fact has to be taken into account and the most important practical consequences follow from the view we take of the matter first we must never lose hold of the truth that as cause and effect are never severed in the natural world and the whole order of nature would fall to ruin were god ever to interfere with them so likewise guilt and pain are in his providence indissolubly linked and the order of the moral world would be destroyed were they to be divided but beside the realm of law in which the divine penalties are unalterable there is the free world of spirit wherein our repentance avails when we can say to god put me to grief i have deserved it only restore me thy love the great woe is gone we shall be the weaker evermore for our fall but we shall be restored the following remarks were in a letter to miss elliot january eighteen sixty seven i wish i could write a resume of a sermon which dr martineau preached last sunday just think how many sermons some people would make of this one sentence of his text speaking of the longing for rest if duty become laborious do it more fervently if love become a source of care and pain love more nobly and more tenderly if doubts disturb and torture face them with more earnest thought and deeper study this was not a peroration but just one phrase of a discourse full of other such things it seems to me that the spontaneous response of our inner souls to such ideas is just the same proof of their truth as the shock we feel in our nerves when a lecturer has delivered a current of electricity proves his lesson to be true january eighteen sixty seven while you were enjoying your cathedral i was enjoying little portland street chapel having bravely tramped through miles of snow on the way and been rewarded mr martineau said we were always taunted with only having a negative creed and were often foolish enough to deny it but all reformation is a negation of error and return to the three pure articles of faith god duty immortality the distinction was admirably drawn between extent of creed and intensity of faith on february fifth eighteen seventy one dr martineau preached philosophers might and do say that all religion is only a projection of man himself on nature lending to nature his own feelings brightened by a supreme love or shadowed by infinite displeasure does this disprove religion is there no reliance to be placed on the faculties which connect us with the infinite we have two sets of faculties our senses which reveal the outer world and a deeper series giving us poetry love religion should we say that these last are more false than the others they are true all round in fact these are truest imagination is true affection is true do men say that affection is blind no it is the only thing which truly sees love alone really perceives the cynic draws over the world a roof of dark and narrow thoughts and suspicions and then complains of the close unhealthy air memory again is more than mere recollection it has the true artist power of seizing the points which determine the character and reconstructing the image without details suppose there be a god by what faculties could we know him save by those which now tell us of him and why should they deceive us alas the exercise of preaching every sunday became too great for dr martineau to encounter after eighteen seventy two and by his physician's orders those noble sermons came to an end besides dr martineau i had the privilege of friendship with three eminent unitarian ministers now alas all departed rev charles beard of liverpool for a long time editor of the theological review the venerable and beloved john james taylor and rev william henry channing 
to whom i was gratefully attached both on account of religious sympathies and of his ardent adoption of our anti-vivisection cause which he told me he had at first regarded as somewhat of a fad of mine but came to recognize as a moral crusade of deep significance among living friends of the same body i am happy to number rev philip wicksteed the successor of dr martineau in portland street and the exceedingly able president of university hall gordon square an institution in the foundation of which i gladly took part on the invitation of mrs humphrey ward a man in whose books i had felt great interest in my old studies at newbridge and whose intercourse was a real pleasure to me in london was mr w r gregg i intensely respected the courage which moved him in those early days of the fifties to publish such a book as the creed of christendom he was then a young man entering public life with the natural ambitions which his great abilities justified and the avowal of such exorbitant heresies nothing short of pure theism as the book contained was enough at that date to spoil any man's career he was a layman too and a man of the world que diable allait il faire writing on theology at all that book remains to this day a most valuable manual of arguments and evidences against the creed of christendom set forth in a grave and reverent spirit and in a clear and manly style his enigmas of life had i believe a larger literary success the world had moved much nearer to his standpoint and the enigmas concerned the most interesting subjects we had a little friendly controversy over one passage in the essay elsewhere mr gregg had laid it down that hereafter love must retreat from the discovery of the sinfulness of the beloved and that both saint and sinner will accept as inevitable an eternal separation enigmas first edition page two sixty three to this i demurred strenuously in my hopes of the human race pages one thirty two to one thirty six i said the poor self-condemned soul whom mr gregg images as turning away in an agony of shame and hopelessness from the virtuous friend he loved on earth and loves still at an immeasurable distance such a soul is not outside the pale of love divine or human nay is he not even assuming his guilt to be as black as night only in a similar relation to the purest of created souls which that purest soul holds to the all-holy one above if god can love us is it not the acme of moral presumption to think of a human soul being too pure to love any sinner so long as in him there remains any vestige of affection the whole problem is unreal and impossible in the first place there is a potential moral equality between all souls capable of equal love and the one can never reach a height whence it may justly despise the other and in the second place the higher the virtuous soul may have risen in the spiritual world the more it must have acquired the godlike insight which beholds the good under the evil and not less the godlike love which embraces the repentant prodigal in his next edition of his enigmas the seventh after the issue of my book mr gregg wrote a most generous recantation of his former view he said the force of these objections to my delineation cannot be gainsaid and ought not to have been overlooked no doubt a soul that can so love and so feel its separation from the objects of its love cannot be wholly lost it must still retain elements of recovery and redemption and qualities to win and to merit answering affection the lovingness of a nature its capacity for strong and deep attachment must constitute there as here the most hopeful characteristic out of which to elicit and foster all other good no doubt again if the sinful continue to love in spite of their sinfulness the blessed will not cease to love in consequence of their blessedness later on he asks how can the blessed enjoy anything to be called happiness if the bad are writhing in hopeless anguish obviously only in one way by ceasing to love that is by renouncing the best and purest part of their nature or to put it in still bolder language how given a hell of torment and despair for millions of his friends and fellow-men can the good enjoy heaven except by becoming bad and without being miraculously changed for the worse 
the following flattering letters are unluckily all which i have kept of mr gregg's writing park lodge wimbledon common s w february nineteenth my dear miss cobb i have been solacing myself this morning after a month of harrowing toil with your paper in the last theological and i want to tell you how much it has gratified me i don't mean your appreciative cordiality towards myself nor your criticisms on a portion of my speculations which however though i fancy you have rather misread me i will refer to again and try to profit by i dare say you are mainly right the more so as i see mr tom in the same number remonstrates in an identical tone that your paper is i think not only beautiful in thought and much of it original but singularly full of rich suggestions and one of the most real contributions to a further conception of a possible future that i have met with for long it is real thought not like most of mine mere sentiment and imagination i don't know if you are still in town or have began the villeggiatura you spoke of when i last saw you but i dare say this note will be forwarded when did number one appear i particularly like your remark about self-reprobation page four fifty six and from four sixty three onward by the way do you know isaac taylor's physical theory of another life it is very curious and interesting yours faithfully w r gregg i have just finished an introduction about one hundred pages to a new edition of the creed of christendom which will be published in the autumn and it contains some thoughts very analogous to yours park lodge wimbledon common s w august sixth my dear miss cobb i have read your town and country mouse with much pleasure i should have enjoyed your paper still more if i had not felt that it was suggested by your intention to cut london and the desire to put as good a face upon that regrettable design as you could however you have stated the case with remarkable fairness i who am a passionate lover of nature who have never lived in town and should pine away if i attempted it still feel in the decline of years the increasing necessity of creeping towards the world rather than retiring from it i feel as one grows old the want of external stimulus to stave off stagnation the vividness of youthful thought is needed i think to support solitude i retired to westmoreland for fifteen years in the middle of life when i was much worn and it did me good but i was glad to come back to active life and i think my present location wimbledon common for a cottage within five miles of london and coming in five days a week is perfection i dare say you may be right but all your friends will miss you much i not the least yours faithfully w r gregg mr gregg's allusion to my town and country mouse reminds me of a letter which was sent me by some unknown reader on the publication of that article it repeats a famous story worth recording as told thus by an ear witness who though anonymous is obviously worthy of credit athenium club pall mall s w will miss cobb kindly pardon the liberty taken by a reader of her delightful town and country mouse in venturing to substitute the true version of sir george lewis's too famous dictum in the hearing of the writer he was asked by one of his subordinates in the government as they were getting into the train returning to town well how do you like life in herefordshire ah it would be very tolerable if it were not for the amusements was his reply miss cobb has high authority for the misquotation for the times invariably commits it and the present writer has again and again intended to correct it and failed to execute the intention if they are pleasures they are pleasures and the paradox is absurd instead of amusing but the oppressive stupidity of many of the amusements to the author of influence of authority etc may well call up in the mind a sort of amiable cynicism which was a feature of his own character on arriving late and unexpectedly at home for a fortnight's rest he found his own study occupied by two young ladies sisters as a bedroom it being the night of lady teresa's ball with his exquisite good nature he simply set about finding some other roost and all the complaint he ever made was that which has become perhaps not too famous 
at the time of the franco-prussian war as will be remembered by every one living at the time in london the cleavage between the sympathizers with the two contending countries was almost as sharp as it had been previously during the american war between the partisans of the north and of the south dean stanley was one of our friends who took warmly the side of the germans and i naturally sent him a letter i had received from a frenchman whom we both respected remonstrating rather bitterly against the attitude of england the dean in returning m p s letter wrote as follows deanery march twenty fifth eighteen seventy one dear miss cobb although you kindly excuse me from doing so i cannot but express and almost wish that you could convey to m p the melancholy interest with which we have read his letter interesting of course it is but to us i know not whether to you it is deeply sad to see a man like m p so thoroughly blind to the true situation of his country not a word of repentance for the aggressive and unjust war not a word of acknowledgment that had the french as they wished invaded germany they would have entered berlin and seized the rhenish provinces without remorse or compunction not a spark of appreciation of the moral superiority by which the germans achieved their successes i do not doubt that excesses may have been committed by the german troops but i feel sure that they have been exceeded by those of the french and would have been yet more had the french entered germany and how very superfluous to attack us for having done just the same as in eighteen forty eight our sad crime was not to have prevented the war by remonstrating with the french emperor and people in july eighteen seventy and of that poor p takes no account alas for france yours sincerely a p stanley the following is a rather important note as recording the dean's sentiments as regarded cardinal newman i cannot recall what was the paper which i had sent him to which he alludes i think i had spoken to him of my friendship with francis newman and of the information given me by the latter that he could never remember his brother putting his hand to a single cause of benevolence or moral reform i had asked him to solicit his support with that of cardinal manning already obtained to the cause for which i was then beginning to work on behalf of animals january fifteenth eighteen seventy five my dear miss cobb i return this with many thanks i think you must have sent it to me partly as a rebuke for having so nearly sailed in the same boat of ignorance and inhumanity with dr newman i have just finished with a mixture of weariness and nausea his letter to the duke of norfolk even the fierce innuendos and deadly thrusts at manning cannot reconcile me to such a mass of cobwebs and evasions when the sum of the theological teaching of the two brothers is weighed will not the soul of francis be found to be a counterbalance as a contribution to true solid catholic even in any sense of the word christianity all the writings of john henry i have sent my paper on vestments to the contemporary yours sincerely a p stanley read it in the light of his old letter to b ulithorne published in illegible the papers on vestments to which dean stanley alludes had interested and amused me much when he read it at sion college and i had urged him to send it to one of the reviews here is a report of that evening's proceedings which i sent next day to my friend miss elliot january fourteenth eighteen seventy five i do so much wish you had been with us last night at sion college dean stanley was more delightful than ever he read a splendid paper full of learning wit and sense on ecclesiastical vestments in the course of it he said referring to the position of the altar etc that on this subject he had nothing to add to the remarks of his friend the dean of bristol whose authority on all matters connected with english ecclesiastical history was universally admitted to be the best after the reading of his paper which lasted an hour and a quarter that odious dr l got up and in his mincing brogue attacked dean stanley very rudely then they called on martineau and he made a charming speech beginning by saying he had nothing to do with vestments having received no ordination and might for his part repeat the poem nothing to wear then he went on to say that if the church were ever to regain the nonconformists it would certainly not be by proceeding in the sacerdotal direction he was much cheered 
Reverend H. White made, I thought, one of the best speeches of the evening. Altogether, it was exceedingly amusing. On the occasion of the interment of Sir Charles Lyell in Westminster Abbey, I sent the dean, by his request, some hints respecting Sir Charles's views and character, and received the following reply. February 25, 1875. My dear Miss Cobb, your letter is invaluable to me. Long as was my acquaintance with Sir Charles Lyell, and kind as he was to me, I never knew him intimately, and therefore most of what you tell me was new. The last time he spoke to me was in urging me, with the greatest earnestness, to ask Colenso to preach. Can you tell me one small point? Had he a turn for music? I must refer back to the last funeral, when I could not preach, of Sir Sterndale Bennett, and it would be a convenience for me to know this, yes or no. You will come, if you come to the sermon, and any friends, through the deanery at 2.45 on Sunday. Yours sincerely, A. P. Stanley some time after this i sent him one of my theological articles on the life after death he acknowledged it thus kindly deanery november second dear miss cobb many thanks your writing on this subject is to me more nearly to the truth at least more nearly to my hopes and desires than almost any others which are now floating around us yours sincerely a p stanley this next letter again referred to one of my books and to cardinal newman october twelfth eighteen seventy six my dear miss cobb many thanks for your book you will see by my letter last night that i had already made good progress in it as borrowed from the library i shall much value it do not trouble yourself about newman's letter i am much more anxious that the public should see it than that i should i am amazed at the impression made upon me by the characteristics of newman most of the selections i had read before but the net result is of a farrago of fanciful disingenuous nonentities all except the personal reminiscences yours truly a p stanley one day i had been calling on him at the deanery and said to him after describing my office in victoria street and our frequent committee meetings there now mr dean do you think it right and as it ought to be that i should sit at that table as honourable secretary with lord shaftesbury on my right and cardinal manning on my left and that you should not sit opposite to complete the reunion of christendom he laughed heartily agreed that he certainly ought to be there and promised to come but time failed and only his honoured name graced our lists the following is the last letter i have preserved of dean stanley's writing it is needless to say how much pleasure it gave me october sixteenth eighteen seventy six dear miss cobb i have just finished re-reading with real admiration and consolation your hopes of the human race may i ask these questions one is it in or coming into a second edition if the latter is it too much to suggest that the note on five thirty four paragraph three could if not omitted be modified i appreciate the motive for its insertion but it makes the lending and recommending of the book difficult two who is one of the greatest men of science page twenty three where is there an authentic appearance of the pope's reply to odo russell page one o seven yours sincerely a p stanley i afterwards learned from dean stanley one day when i was visiting him at the deanery after his wife's death that he had read these essays to lady augusta in the last weeks of her life finding them as he told me the most satisfactory treatment of the subject he had met and that after her death he read them over again he gave me with much feeling a sad photograph of her as a dying woman after telling me this mr motley the historian of the netherlands having also lost his wife not long afterwards spoke to dean stanley of his desire for some book on the subject which would meet his doubts and dean stanley gave him this one of mine dean stanley it is needless to say was the most welcome of guests in every house which he entered there was something in his high-mindedness i can use no other term his sense of the glory of england his love of his church on extremely erastian principles as the national religion his unfailing courtesy his unaffected enjoyment of drollery and gossip and his almost youthful excitement about each important subject which cropped up which made him delightful to every one in turn 
there was no man in london i think whom it gave me such pleasure to meet in the sixties and seventies as the great dean and he was uniformly most kind to me the last occasion i think on which i saw him in full spirits was at a house where the pleasantest people were constantly to be found that of mr and mrs simpson in cornwall gardens renan and his wife were there and i was so favoured as to be seated next to renan dean stanley being on the other side of our tactful hostess the dean had been showing renan over the abbey in the morning and they were both in the gayest mood but i remember dean stanley speaking to renan with indescribable and concentrated indignation of the avowal mr gladstone had recently made that the clerkenwell explosion had caused him to determine on the disestablishment of the irish church i have found an old letter to my friend describing this dinner i had a most amusing evening yesterday kind mrs simpson made me sit beside renan and dean stanley was across the corner so we made with nice mrs w r g and mr m a very jolly little party at our end of the table the dean began with grace rather sotto voce with a blink at renan who kept on never minding his renan's looks are even worse than his picture leads one to expect his face is exactly like a hog so stupendously broad across the ears and jowl but he is very gentlemanly in manner very winning and full of fun and finesse we had to talk french with him but the dean's french was so much worse than mine that i felt quite at ease and rattled away about the triduos at florence to appease the wrath of heaven on account of his vie de jesus and had some private jokes with him about his malice in calling the publicans of the gospels douaniers and the ass a baudet he said he did it on purpose and that when he was last in italy numbers of poor people came to him and asked him for the lucky number for the lotteries because they thought he was so near the devil he must know i gave him your message about the hengwort manuscripts and he apologized for having written about the mesquine considerations which had caused them to be locked up to wit that several leaves of the red book of hergest had been stolen by two enthusiastic welsh scholars and solemnly vowed to alter the passage in the next edition and thanked you for the promise of obtaining leave for him to see them i also talked to m renan of his essay on the poesy de la race celtique and made him laugh at his own assertion that irishmen had such a longing for the infinite that when they could not attain to it otherwise they sought it through a strong liquor qui s'appelle le whisky sir mount stuart grant duff's delightful volume on renan has opened to my mind many fresh reasons for admiring the great french scholar whose works i had falsely imagined i had known pretty well before reading it but when all is said the impression he has left on me and i should think on most other people is one of disappointment and shortfalling m renan has written of himself the well-known and often laughed at boast seul dans mon siècle j'ai pu comprendre jésus-christ et saint françois de cise i do not know about his comprehension of saint francis though i should think it a very great tour de force for the brilliant french academician and critic to throw himself into that typical medieval mind but as regarded the former person i should say that of all the tens of thousands who have studied and written about him during these last nineteen centuries renan was in some respects the least able to comprehend him the man who could describe the story of the prodigal as a delicieuse parabole is as far out of christ's latitude as the pole from the equator one abhors aesthetics when things too sacred to be measured by their standard are commended in their name renan seems to me to have been for practical purposes a pantheist without a glimmer of that sense of moral and personal relation to god which was the supreme characteristic of christ when he translates christ's pity for the magdalens as jealousy pour la gloire de son père dans ses belles créatures and introduces the term femme d'une vie équivoque as a rendering for sinners he strikes a note so false that no praise lavished afterwards can restore harmony the late lord houghton was one of the men of note who i met occasionally at the houses of friends i had known him in italy and he was always kind to me and invited me to his christmas parties at frystone which were said to be delightful but to which i did not go for a poet he had an extraordinarily rough exterior and blunt manner 
one day we had a regular set-to argument lasting a long time he attacked the order of things with the usual pessimist observations on all the evil in the world and implied that i had no reasonable right to my faith i answered as best i could with some earnestness and he finally concluded the discussion by remarking with concentrated contempt you might almost as well be a christian next day i went to westminster abbey and was sitting in the dean's pew when to my amusement lord houghton came in just below with a party of ladies and took a seat exactly opposite me he behaved of course with edifying propriety but i could not help reflecting with a smile on our argument of the night before and wondering how many members of that and similar congregations who were naturally counted by outsiders as faithful supporters of the orthodox creed were as little so au fond as either lord houghton or i with carlyle though i saw him very frequently i never interchanged more than a few banal words of civility when his biography appeared i was as i frankly told the illustrious biographer exceedingly glad that i had never given him the chance of attaching one of his pungent epigrams to my poor person i had been introduced to him by a lady at whose house he happened to call one afternoon when i was sitting with her and where he showed himself as it seems to me the roughest men invariably do in the society of amiable countesses extremely apprivoise also i continually met him out walking with one or other of his great historian friends who were also mine but i avoided trespassing on their good nature or addressing him when he walked up and down alone daily before our door in cheney walk till one day when he had been very ill i ventured to express my satisfaction in seeing him out of doors again he then answered me kindly i never shared the admiration felt for him by so many able men who knew him personally and therefore had means which i did not possess of estimating him aright to me his books and himself represented an anomalous sort of human fruit the original stock was a hard and thorny scotch peasant character with a splendid intellect superadded the graft was not wholly successful a flavor of the old acrid slow was always perceptible in the plum the following letter was received by dr hoggan in reply to a letter to mr carlyle concerning vivisection keston lodge beckenham twenty eighth august eighteen seventy five mr carlyle has received your letter and has read it carefully he bids me say that ever since he was a boy when he read the accounts of magendi's atrocities he has never thought of the practice of vivisecting animals but with horror i may mention that i have heard him speak of it in the strongest terms of disgust long before there was any speech about public agitation on the subject he believes that the reports about the good results said to be obtained from the practice of vivisection to be immensely exaggerated with the exception of certain experiments by harvey and certain others by sir charles bell he is not aware of any conspicuous good that has resulted from it but even supposing the good results to be much greater than mr carlyle believes they are and apart too from the shocking pain inflicted on the helpless animals operated upon he would still think the practice so brutalizing to the operators that he would earnestly wish the law on the subject to be altered so as to make vivisection even in institutions like that with which you are connected a most rare occurrence and when practised by private individuals an indictable offence you are not sure that the operators on living animals can be counted on your fingers mr carlyle with an equal share of certainty believes vivisection and other kindred experiments on living animals to be much more largely practised and that they are by no means uncommonly undertaken by doctors apprentices and other miserable persons you are mistaken if you look upon the times as a mirror of virtue on this very subject when it at first began to be publicly discussed last winter it printed a letter from blank which your letter itself would prove to be altogether composed of falsehoods with mr carlyle's compliments and good wishes i remain dear sir yours truly mary carlyle aitken mr carlyle supported our anti-vivisection society from the outset for which i was very grateful to him but having promised to join our first important deputation to the home office to urge the government to bring in a bill in accordance with the recommendations of the royal commission 
he failed at the last moment to put in an appearance having learned that cardinal manning was to be also present i was told that he said he would not appear in public with the cardinal who was he thought the chief emissary of beelzebub in england when this was repeated to me my remark was infidels is riz time was when cardinals would not appear in public with infidels nothing has surprised me more in reading the memoirs and letters of mr and mrs carlyle than the small interest either of them seems to have felt in the great subjects which form the life work of their many illustrious visitors while the humbler folk who touched the same circles were vehemently attracted or else repelled by the political philosophical and theological theories and labors of such men as mazzini mill colenso jowett martineau and darwin and every conversation and almost every letter contained new facts or animated discussions regarding them the carlyles received visits from these great men continually with it would seem little or no interest in their aims or views one way or the other in approval or disapproval and wrote and talked much more seriously about the delinquencies of their own maid-servants and the great and never to be sufficiently appealed against cock and hen nuisance end of section twenty three section twenty four of life of francis power cobb is told by herself by francis power cobb the sleeper vox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen my social life in london in the seventies and eighties part two i had known cardinal manning in rome about eighteen sixty one or eighteen sixty three when he was monsignor manning and went a little into english society resplendent in a beautiful violet robe he was very busy in those days making converts among english young ladies and one with whom we were acquainted the daughter of a celebrated authoress fell into his net he had at all times a gentle way of ridiculing english doings and prejudices which was no doubt telling one of the stories he told me was of an italian sacristan asking him what was the red prayer-book which all the english tourists carried about and read so devoutly in the churches of course murray's handbooks a few years afterwards when he had returned to england as archbishop of westminster i met him pretty frequently at miss stanley's house in grosvenor crescent he there attacked me cheerfully one evening miss cobb i have found out something against you i have discovered that voltaire was part owner of a slave-ship i beg you to believe said i that i have no responsibility whatever respecting voltaire but i would ask your grace whether it be not true that las casas the saintly dominican founded negro slavery in america a church of england friend coming up and laughing i discharged a second barrel and was not the protestant saint newton of olney much worse than all the captain of a slave-ship one evening at this pleasant house i was standing on the rug in one of the rooms talking to mr matthew arnold and two or three other acquaintances of the same set the archbishop on entering shook hands with each of us and we were all talking in the usual easy sub-humorous london way when a tall military-looking man a major g came in and seeing manning walked straight up to him went down on one knee and kissed his ring a bomb falling amongst us would scarcely have been more startling and manning englishman as he was to the backbone under his fine roman feathers was obviously disconcerted though dignified as ever in a letter to a friend dated february nineteenth eighteen sixty seven i find i said i had an amusing conversation with archbishop manning the other night at miss stanley's he was most good-humoured coming up to me as i was talking to sir c trevelyan about rome and saying i am glad you are thinking of going to rome next winter miss cobb it proves you expect the pope to be firmly established there still we had a rather long talk about Passalia, who he says has recanted a fact i heard strongly contradicted later mr j now sir h j came behind him in the midst of our talk and almost pitched the archbishop on me with such a push as i never saw given in a drawing-room the dean and lady augusta came in later and she asked eagerly where was manning having never seen him 
he had gone away so i told her of the enthusiastic meeting which had afforded a spectacle to us all an hour before between him and archdeacon dennison it was quite a scene of ecclesiastical reconciliation a reunion of christendom they had been told each that the other was in the adjoining room and archdeacon dennison literally rushed with both hands outspread to meet the cardinal whom he had not seen since his conversion in later years i received at least half a dozen notes from time to time from his eminence asking for details of our anti-vivisection work and exhibiting his anxiety to master the facts on which he proposed to speak at our meetings here are some of these notes archbishop's house westminster s w june twelfth eighteen eighty two dear miss cobb i should be much obliged if you would send me some recent facts or utterances of the montagazza kind for the meeting at lord shaftesbury's i have for a long time lost all reckoning from overwork and need to be posted up believe me always faithfully yours henry e cardinal archbishop cardinal manning to miss f p c eastern road brighton dear miss cobb i can assure you that my slowness in answering your letter has not arisen from any diminution of care on vivisection i was never better able to understand it for i have been for nearly three weeks in pain day and night from neuralgia in the right arm which makes writing difficult i have not seen mr holt's bill and i do not know what it aims at before i can say anything i wish to be fully informed the bill of last year does not content me but we must take care not to weaken what we have gained i hope to stay here over sunday and should be much obliged if you could desire someone to send me a copy of mr holt's bill has sufficient organized effort been made to enforce mr cross's act believe me always yours very truly henry e cardinal archbishop archbishop's house westminster s w june twenty second eighteen eighty four dear miss cobb i will attend the meeting of the twenty sixth unless hindered by some unforeseen necessity but i must ask you to send me a brief i am so driven by work that for some time i have fallen behind your proceedings send me one or two points marked and i will read them up my mind is more than ever fixed on this subject believe me yours faithfully henry e cardinal archbishop archbishop's house westminster s w january twenty seventh eighteen eighty seven my dear miss cobb for the last three weeks i have been kept to the house by one of my yearly colds but if possible i will be present at the meeting of the society if i should be unable to be there i will write a letter i clearly see that the proposed physiological and pathological institute would be centre and sanction of ever advancing vivisection i hope you are recovering health and strength by your rest in the country believe me always faithfully yours henry e cardinal archbishop archbishop's house westminster s w july thirty first eighteen eighty nine my dear miss cobb my last days have been so full that i have not been able to write i thank you for your letter and for the contents of it the highest counsel is always the safest and best cost us what it may we may take the cost as the test of its rectitude i hope you will go on writing against this inflation of vain glory calling itself science believe me always very truly yours henry e cardinal archbishop at no less than seven of our annual meetings at one of which he presided did cardinal manning make speeches all these i have myself reprinted in an ornamental pamphlet to be obtained at twenty victoria street the reasons for his adoption of our anti-vivisection cause were i am sure mainly moral and humane but i think an incident which occurred in rome not long before our campaign began may have impressed on his mind a regret that the catholic church had hitherto done nothing on behalf of the lower animals and a desire to take part himself in a humane crusade and so rectify its position before the protestant world pope pius the ninth had been addressed by the english in rome through lord amphill then mr odo russell a representative there with a request for permission to found a society for prevention of cruelty to animals in rome where as all the world knows it was almost as deplorably needed as at naples 
after a considerable delay the formal reply through the proper office was sent to mr russell refusing the indispensable permission the document conveying this refusal expressly stated that a society for such a purpose could not be sanctioned in rome man owed duties to his fellow men but he owed no duties to the lower animals therefore though such societies might exist in protestant countries they could not be allowed to be established in rome the late lord arthur russell coming back from italy to england just after this event told me of it with great detail and assured me that he had seen the papal document in his brother's possession and that if i chose to publish the matter in england he would guarantee the truth of the story at any time i did very much choose to publish it thinking it was a thing which ought to be proclaimed on the housetops and i repeated it in seven or eight different publications ranging from the quarterly review to the echo soon after this if i remember rightly began the anti-vivisection movement and almost immediately when the society for protection of animals from vivisection afterwards called the victoria street society was founded by dr hoggan and myself cardinal manning gave us his name and active support he took place in our first deputation to the home office and spoke at our first meeting which was held on the tenth june eighteen seventy six at the westminster palace hotel on that occasion when it came to the cardinal's turn to speak he began at once to say that much misapprehension existed as to the attitude of his church on the subject of duty to animals as he said this with his usual clear calm deliberate enunciation he looked me straight in the face and i looked at him he proceeded to say it was true that man owed no duty directly to the brutes but he owed it to god whose creatures they are to treat them mercifully this was i considered a very good way of reconciling adhesion to the pope's doctrine with humane principles and i greatly rejoiced that such a mezzo termine could be put forward on authority of course in my private opinion the cardinal's ethics were theoretically untenable seeing that if it were possible to conceive of such a thing as a creature made by a man as people in the thirteenth century believed that arnaldus de villanova had made a living man or even such a thing as a creature made by the devil that most wretched being would still have a right to be spared pain if he were sensitive to pain and would assuredly be a proper object of measureless compassion that a dog or horse is a creature of god that its love and service to us come of god's gracious provisions for us that the animal is unoffending to its creator while we are suppliants for forgiveness for our offences all these are true and tender reasons for additional kindness and care for these our dumb fellow-creatures but they are not as the cardinal's argument would seem to imply the only reasons for showing mercy towards them nevertheless it was a great step i may say an historical event that a principle practically including universal humanity to the lower animals should have been enunciated publicly and formally by a prince of the church of rome that cardinal manning was not only the first great roman prelate to lay down any such principle but that he far outran many of his contemporaries and co-religionists in so doing has become painfully manifest this year eighteen ninety four from the numerous letters from priests which have appeared in the tablet and catholic times bearing a very different complexion cardinal manning repeated almost verbatim the same explanation of his own standpoint in his speech on march ninth eighteen eighty seven when he occupied the chair at our annual meeting he said it is perfectly true that obligations and duties are between moral persons and therefore the lower animals are not susceptible of those moral obligations which we owe to one another but we owe a sevenfold obligation to the creator of those animals our obligation and moral duty is to him who made them and if we wish to know the limit and the broad outline of our obligation i say at once it is his nature and his perfections one is most profoundly that of eternal mercy hear hear and therefore 
although a poor mule or a poor horse is not indeed a moral person yet the lord and maker of that mule and that horse is the highest lawgiver and his nature is a law to himself and in giving a dominion over his creatures to man he gave them subject to the condition that they should be used in conformity to his own perfections which is his own law and therefore our law on the first occasion a generous roman catholic nobleman present gave me twenty pounds to have the cardinal's speech translated into italian and widely circulated in italy i have good reason to believe that when cardinal manning went to rome after the election of leo the thirteenth he spoke earnestly to his holiness on the subject of cruelty to animals generally in italy and especially concerning vivisection and that he understood the pope to agree with him and sanction his attitude i learned this from a private source but his eminence referred to it quite unmistakably in his speech at lord shaftesbury's house on the twenty first june eighteen eighty two as follows i am somewhat concerned to say it but i know that an impression has been made that those whom i represent look if not with approbation at least with great indulgence at the practice of vivisection i grieve to say that abroad there are a great many whom i beg to say i do not represent who do favor the practice but this i do protest that there is not a religious instinct in nature nor a religion of nature nor is there a word in revelation either in the old testament or the new testament nor is there to be found in the great theology which i do represent no nor in any act of the church of which i am a member no nor in the lives and utterances of any one of those great servants of that church who stand as examples nor is there an authoritative utterance anywhere to be found in favor of vivisection there might be the chatter the prating and the talk of those who know nothing about it and i know what i have stated to be the fact for some years ago i took a step known to our excellent secretary and brought the subject under the notice and authority where alone i could bring it and those before whom it was laid soon proved to have been profoundly ignorant of the outlines of the alphabet even of vivisection they believed entirely that the practice of surgery and the science of anatomy owed everything to the discovery of vivisectors they were filled to the full with every false impression but when the facts were made known to them they experienced a revulsion of feeling cardinal manning also as i happen likewise to know made a great effort about eighteen seventy eight or eighteen seventy nine to induce the then general of the franciscans to support the anti-vivisection movement for the love of st francis and his tenderness to animals in this attempt however cardinal manning must have been entirely unsuccessful as no modern franciscan that ever i have heard of has stirred a finger on behalf of animals anywhere or given his name to any society for protecting them either from vulgar or from scientific cruelty knowing this i confess to feeling some impatience when the name of st francis and his amiable fondness for birds and beasts is perpetually flaunted whatever the lack of common humanity to animals visible in catholic countries happens to be mentioned it is a very small matter that a saint six hundred years ago sang with nightingales and fed wolves if the monks of his own order and the priests of the church which has canonized him never warn their flocks that to torment god's creature is even a venial sin and when forced to notice barbarous cruelties to a brute invariably reply non è cristiano as if all claims to compassion were dismissed by that consideration the answer of the general of the franciscans to cardinal manning's touching appeal was that he had consulted his doctor and that his doctor assured him that no such thing as vivisection was ever practised in italy i was kindly permitted to call at archbishop's house and see cardinal manning several times and i find the following little record of one of my first visits in a letter to my friend written the same or next day i had a very interesting interview with the cardinal 
i was shown into a vast dreary dining-room quite monastic in its whitey brown walls poverty-stricken furniture crucifix and pictures of half a dozen bishops who did not exhibit the beauty of holiness the cardinal received me most kindly and said he was so glad to see me and that he was much better in health after a long illness he is not much changed it was droll to sit talking tete-a-tete -tete with a man with a pink octagon on his venerable head and various little scraps of scarlet showing here and there to remind one that gratis the english gentleman and you will find the roman cardinal he told me really with effusion that his heart was in our work and he promised to go to the meeting to-morrow i told him we all wished him to take the chair he said it would be much better for a layman like lord coleridge to do so i said i don't think you know the place you hold in english i paused and added avec intention protestant estimation he laughed very good-humouredly and said i think i do very well at the meeting on the following day when he did take the chair i had opportunities as honourable secretary of which i did not fail to avail myself of a little quiet conversation with his eminence before the proceedings i spoke of the moral results of darwinism on the character and remarked how paralyzing was the idea that conscience was merely an hereditary instinct fixed in the brain by the interests of the tribe and in no sense the voice of god in the heart or his law graven on the fleshly tablets he abounded in my sense and augured immeasurable evils from the general adoption of such a philosophy i asked him what was the catholic doctrine of the origin of souls he answered promptly and emphatically oh that each one is a distinct creation of god the last day on which his eminence attended a committee meeting in victoria street i had a little conversation with him as usual after business was over and reminded him that on every occasion when he had previously attended we had had our beloved president lord shaftesbury present shall i tell your eminence i asked what mrs f now lady b told me lord shaftesbury said to her shortly before he died about our committees here he said that if our society had done nothing else but bring you and him together and make you sit and work at the same table for the same object it would have been well worth while to have founded it did lord shaftesbury say that said the cardinal with a moisture in his eyes did he say that i loved lord shaftesbury and these i reflected were the men whom narrow bigots of both creeds looked on as the very chiefs of opposing camps and bitter enemies the one rejoiced at an excuse for meeting the other in friendly cooperation the other said as his last word i loved him i was greatly touched by this little scene and going straight from it to the house of the friend who told me of lord shaftesbury's remark i naturally described it to her and to mr lowell who was taking tea with us ah yes lady b said i remember it well and i could show you the very tree in the park where we were sitting when lord shaftesbury made that remark but she added why did you not tell the cardinal that he included you what lord shaftesbury said was that the society had brought the cardinal and you and himself to work together mr lowell was interested in all this and the evidence it afforded of the width of mind of the great philanthropist so often supposed to be a narrow evangelical alas he also has gone over to the majority i met him often and liked him as every one did extremely though in so many ways different he had some of mr gladstone's peculiar power of making every conversation wherein he took part interesting of turning it off dusty roads into pleasant paths he had not in the smallest degree that tiresome habit of giving information instead of conveying impressions which makes some worthy people so unspeakably fatiguing as companions i had once the privilege of sitting between him and lord tennyson when they carried on an animated conversation and i could see how much the great poet was delighted with the lesser one who was also a large-hearted statesman a silver link between two great nations i shall account it one of the chief honours which have fallen to my lot that tennyson asked leave through his son to pay me a visit 
needless to say i accepted the offer with gratitude and fortunately i was at home in our little house in cheney walk when he called on me he sat for a long time over my fire and talked of poetry of the share melodious words ought to have in it of the hatefulness of scientific cruelty against which he was going to write again and of the new and dangerous phases of thought then apparent much that he said on the latter subject was i think crystallized in his locksley hall sixty years later after he had risen to go and i had followed him to the stairs i returned to my room and said from my heart thank god the great poem which had been so much to me for half a lifetime was not spoiled the man and the poet were one nothing that i had now seen or heard of him in the flesh jarred with what i had known of him in the spirit after this first visit i had the pleasure of meeting lord tennyson several times and of making lady tennyson's charming acquaintance the present lord tennyson being exceedingly kind and friendly to me in welcoming me to their house on one occasion when i met lord tennyson at the house of a mutual friend he told me with an innocent surprise that i could not but find diverting that a certain great professor had been positively angry and rude to him about his lines in the children's hospital concerning those who carve the living hound i tried to explain to him the fury of the whole clique at the discovery that the consciences of the rest of mankind has considerably outstepped theirs in the matter of humanity and that while they fancied themselves in his words the heirs of all the ages in the foremost files of time it was really in the dark ages as regarded humane sentiment or at least one or two centuries past in which they lingered practising the art of torture on beasts as men did on men in the sixteenth century i also tried to explain to him that his ideal of a vivisector with red face and coarse hands was quite wrong and as false as the representation of lady macbeth as a tall and masculine woman lady macbeth must have been small thin and concentrated not a big bony conscientious scotchwoman and vivisectors some of them at all events are polished and handsome gentlemen with peculiarly delicate features for drawing out nerves etc as scion describes lord tennyson from the very first beginning of our anti-vivisection movement in eighteen seventy four to the hour of his death never once failed to append his name to every successive memorial and petition and they were many which i and my successors sent to him and he accepted and held our honorable membership and afterwards the vice-presidency of our society from first to last the last time i saw lord tennyson was one day in london after i had taken luncheon at his house when i rose to leave the table and he shook hands with me at the door as we were parting as we supposed for that season he said to me good-bye miss cobb fight the good fight go on fight the good fight i saw him no more but i shall do his bidding please god to the end i shall insert here two letters which i received from lord tennyson which though trifling in themselves i prize as testimonies of his sympathy and good will i am fortunately able to add to them two papers of some real interest the contemporary estimate of tennyson's first poems by his friends the kembles and the announcement of the death of arthur hallam by his friend john mitchell kemble to fanny kemble they have come into my possession with a vast mass of family and other papers given me by mrs kemble several years ago and belong to a series of letters marvellously long and closely written by john kemble during and after his romantic expedition to spain along with the future archbishop trench and the other young enthusiasts of eighteen thirty the way in which john mitchell kemble speaks of his friend alfred tennyson's poems is satisfactory but much more so is the beautiful testimony he renders to the character of hallam it is touching and uplifting too to read the rather singular words of a holier heart applied to the subject of in memoriam by his young companion farringford freshwater isle of wight june fourth eighteen eighty dear miss cobb i have subscribed my name and i hope that it may be of some use to your cause my wife is grateful to you for remembrance of her and i am ever yours a tennyson 
aldworth hasselmere surrey january ninth eighteen eighty two my dear miss cobb i thank you for your essay which i found very interesting though perhaps somewhat too vehement to serve your purpose have you seen that terrible book by a swiss reviewed in the spectator aye pitié pray pardon my not answering you before i am so harried with letters and poems from all parts of the world that my friends often have to wait for an answer yours ever a tennyson farringford freshwater isle of wight june twelfth eighteen eighty two dear miss cobb i am sorry to say that i shall not be in london the twenty first so that i cannot be present at your meeting many thanks for asking me my father has been suffering from a bad attack of gout and does not feel inclined to write more about vivisection you have as you know his warmest good wishes in all your great struggle when are we to see you again can you not pay us a visit at hasselmere this summer with our kindest regards yours very sincerely hallam tennyson extract from letter from john m kemble to fanny kemble no date in packet of eighteen thirty to eighteen thirty three i am very glad that you like tennyson's poems if you had any poetry in you you could not help it for the general system of criticism and the notion that a poet is to be appreciated by everybody if he be a poet are mighty fallacies it was only the high priest who was privileged to enter the holy of holies and so it is with that other holy of holies no less sacred and replete with divinity a great poet's mind therein no vulgar foot may tread to meet this objection it is often said that all men appreciate etc etc shakespeare and milton etc to this i answer by a direct denial no man in a hundred thousand cares three straws for milton and though from being a dramatic poet shakespeare must be better understood i believe i may say that not one in a hundred thousand feels all that is to be felt in him there is no man who has done so much as tennyson to express poetical feeling by sound titian has done as much with colours indeed i believe no poet to have lived since milton so perfect in his form except goethe in this matter shelley and keats and byron even wordsworth have been found wanting coleridge expresses the greatest admiration for charles tennyson's sonnets we have sent him alfred's poems which i am sure will delight him extract from letter from john mitchell kemble to fanny kemble it is with feelings of inexpressible pain that i announce to you the death of poor arthur hallam who expired suddenly from an attack of apoplexy at vienna on the fifteenth of last month though this was always feared by us as likely to occur the shock has been a bitter one to bear and most of all so to the tennysons whose sister emily he was to have married i have not yet had the courage to write to alfred this is a loss which will most assuredly be felt by this age for if ever man was born for great things he was never was a more powerful intellect joined to a purer and holier heart and the whole illuminated with the richest imagination the most sparkling yet the kindest wit one cannot lament for him that he has gone to a far better life but we weep over his coffin and wonder that we cannot be consoled the roman epitaph on two young children sibi met ipsis dolorum abstulerunt suis reliquary from themselves they took away pain to their friends they left it is always present to my mind and somehow the miserable feeling of loneliness comes over one even though one knows that the dead are happier than the living his poor father was with him only they had been travelling together in hungary and were on their return to england but there had been nothing whatever to announce the fatal termination of their journey indeed bating fatigue arthur had been unusually well our other friends though all mourning for him as if he had been our brother are well in my chapter on italy i have written some pages concerning mr and mrs browning and printed two or three kind letters from him to me it is a great privilege i now feel to have known even in such slight measure these two great poets but what an unspeakable blessing and honour it has been for england all through the victorian age to have for her representatives and teachers in the high realm of poetry two such men as tennyson and browning men of immaculate honour 
blameless and beautiful lives and lofty and pure inspiration not one word which either has ever published need be blotted out by any recording angel and widely different as they were their high doctrine was the same the one tells us that good will be the final goal of ill the other that god's in his heaven all's right with the world i have also had the good fortune to find other english poets ready to sympathize with me on the subject of vivisection sir henry taylor wrote many letters to me upon it and called my attention to his own lines which go so deep into the philosophy of the question and which i have since quoted so often pain in man bears the high mission of the flail and fan in brutes tis purely piteous here is one of his notes to me the roost bournemouth november twenty fifth eighteen seventy five dear miss cobb i return your papers that they may not be wasted i wish you all the success you deserve which is all you can desire but i can do nothing my hands are full here and my pockets are empty two months ago i succeeded in forming a local society for the prevention of cruelty in this place we have ordered prosecutions every week since and have obtained convictions in every case and these local operations are all that i can undertake or assist believe me yours sincerely henry taylor he was also actively interested in an effort to improve the method of slaughtering cattle by using a mask with a fixed hole in the centre through which a long nail may be easily driven straight through the exact suture of the skull to the brain causing instant death sir henry specially approved the masks for this purpose made i believe under his own direction at bournemouth by mr menden a saddler at lansdowne mr lewis morris has also written some beautiful and striking poems touching on the subject of scientific cruelty and i have reason to hope that a younger man whom many of us look upon as the poet of the future in england mr william watson is entirely on the same side in short if the priests of science are against us the prophets of humanity the poets are with us in this controversy almost to a man it will be seen that we had politicians historians and thinkers of various parties among our friends in london but there were no novelists except that very agreeable woman miss jewsbury and the two misses betham edwards mr anthony trollope i knew but slightly i also had some acquaintance with a very popular novelist then a young man who was introduced in the full flush of his success to mr carlyle whereon the sage of chelsea greeted him with the encouraging question well mr blank when do you intend to begin to do something serious with mr wilkie collins i exchanged several friendly letters concerning some information he wanted for one of his books the following letter from him exhibits the serious spirit at all events as mr carlyle might admit in which he set about spinning the elaborate web of his exciting tales ninety gloucester place portman square w twenty third june eighteen eighty two i most sincerely thank you for your kind letter and for the pamphlets which preceded it the address seems to me to possess the very rare merit of forcible statement combined with a moderation of judgment which sets a valuable example not only to our enemies but to some of our friends as to the portrait i feel such a strong universal interest in it that i must not venture on criticism you have given me exactly what i most wanted for the purpose that i have in view and you have spared me time and trouble in the best and kindest of ways if i require further help you shall see that i am gratefully sensible of the help that has been already given i am writing to a very large public both at home and abroad and it is quite needless when i am writing to you to dwell on the importance of producing the right impression by means which keep clear of terrifying and revolting the ordinary reader i shall leave the detestable cruelties of the laboratory to be merely inferred and in tracing the moral influence of those cruelties on the nature of the man who practises them and the result as to his social relations with the persons about him i shall be careful to present him to the reader as a man not infinitely wicked and cruel and to show the efforts made by his better instincts to resist the inevitable hardening of the heart the fatal stupefying of all the finer sensibilities produced by the deliberately merciless occupations of his life 
if i can succeed in making him in some degree an object of compassion as well as of horror my experience of readers of fiction tells me that the right effect will be produced by the right means believe me very truly yours wilkie collins of another order of acquaintances was that excellent man mr james spedding also mr babbage in whose horror of street music i devoutly sympathized and mr james ferguson the architect in whose books and ideas generally i found great interest he avowed to me his opinion that the ancient jews were never builders of stone edifices and that all the relics of stone buildings in palestine were the work either of tyrians or of the idumean herod or of other non-jewish rulers his conversation was always most instructive to me and i rejoiced when i had the opportunity of writing a long review for fraser i think of his tree and serpent worship with which he was so well pleased that he made me a present of the magnificent volume of which i believe only a hundred copies were printed mr ferguson taught me to see that the whole civilization of a country has depended historically on the stones with which it happens naturally to be furnished if these stones be large and hard and durable like those of egypt we find grand everlasting monuments and statues made of them if they be delicate and beautiful like pentelic marble we have the parthenon if they be plain limestone or freestone as in our northern climes richness of form and detail take the place of greater simplicity and we have the great cathedrals of england france and germany where there is no good stone only brick we may have fine mansions but not great temples and where there is neither clay for bricks nor good stone for building the natives can erect no durable edifices and consequently have no places to be adorned with statues and paintings and all the arts which go with them i do not know whether i do justice to mr ferguson in giving this resume of his lesson but it is my recollection of it and to my thinking worth recording End of section twenty four Section 25 of Life of Frances Power Cobb is told by herself, by Frances Power Cobb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 18. My Social Life in London in the 70s and 80s. Part 3. One of the friends of whom we saw most in London was Sir William Boxall, whose exquisite artistic taste was specially congenial to my friend, and his varied conversation and love of his poor, dear old dog Gary to me after lord coleridge's charming obituary of him nothing need be added in the way of tribute to his character and gifts or to the refined feeling which inspired him always i may add however what the lord chief justice naturally would not say on his own account namely that boxall in his later years of weakness and almost constant confinement to the house frequently told us when we went to visit him how lord coleridge had found time from all his labours to come frequently to sit with him and cheer him and after a whole day spent in the hot law courts would dine on his old friend's chops and spend the evening in his dingy rooms in welbeck street here is a letter from sir william which i happen to have preserved it refers to an article i had written in the echo on the death of landseer my dear miss cobb your sympathetic notice of my old friend landseer and his friends has delighted me a grain of such feeling is worth a newspaper load of worn-out criticism i thank you very sincerely for it i should have called upon you but i have been shut up with the cold which threatened me when i last saw you yours very sincerely w boxall october sixth eighteen seventy nine there is no hope of my getting to dolgelly it will be a great escape for miss lloyd for i am utterly worn out i find that the most common opinion about lord shaftesbury is that he was an excellent and most disinterested man who did a vast amount of good in his time among the poor and in the factories and on behalf of the climbing boy sweeps but that he was somewhat narrow-minded and dry if not stern in character perhaps some would add that his extreme evangelicalism had in it a tinge of calvinistic bigotry i shared very much such ideas about him till one day in eighteen seventy five when i had gone to stanhope street to consult lord and lady mount temple my unfailing helpers and advisers about some matter connected with lord henniker's bill then before parliament 
for the restriction of vivisection after explaining my difficulty lady mount temple said we must consult lord shaftesbury about this matter come with me now to his house i yielded to my kind friend but not without hesitation fearing that lord shaftesbury would in the first place be too much absorbed in his great philanthropic undertakings to spare attention to the wrongs of the brutes and in the second that his religious views were too strict to allow him to cooperate with such a heretic as i even if as i was assured he would tolerate my intrusion how widely astray from the truth i was as regarded his sentiments in both ways the sequel proved he had already it appeared taken great interest in the anti-vivisection controversy then beginning and entered into it with all the warmth of his heart not as something taking him off from service to mankind but as a part of his philanthropy he always emphatically endorsed my view that if we could save vivisectors from persisting in the sin of cruelty we should be doing them a moral service greater than to save them from becoming pickpockets or drunkards he also felt what i may call passionate pity for the tortured brutes he loved dogs and always had a large beautiful collie lying under his writing-table and was full of tenderness to his daughter's siamese cat and spoke of all animals with intimate knowledge and sympathy as to my heresies though he knew of them from the first they never interfered with his kindness and consideration for me which were such as i can never remember without emotion i shall speak in its place in another chapter of the share he took as leader and champion of our party in all the subsequent events connected with the anti-vivisection agitation i wish here only to give if it may be possible for me some small idea to the reader of what that good man really was and to remove some of the absurd misconceptions current concerning him for example he was no bigot as to sabbatarian observances i told him once that i belonged to the society for opening museums on sundays he said i think you are mistaken the working men do not wish it see i have here the result of a large enquiry among their trades unions and clubs nearly all of them deprecate the change but i am on this point not at all of the same opinion as most of my friends i have told them and they have often been a little shocked at it that i think if a lawyer has a brief for a case on monday and has had no time to study it on saturday he is quite justified in reading it up on sunday after church neither did he share the very common bigotry of teetotalism he said to me the teetotalers have added an eleventh commandment and think more of it than of all the rest again when as is well known lord palmerston left the choice of bishops for many years practically in his hands i believe that seven owed their sees to him and he of course selected evangelical clergymen who would uphold what he considered to be vital religious truth he was yet able to concur heartily in the appointment of arthur stanley to the deanery of westminster he told me that lord palmerston had written to him before inviting dr stanley and said that he would not do it if he lord shaftesbury disapproved and that he had answered that he was well aware that dr stanley's theological views differed widely from his own but that he was an admirable man and a gentleman with a special suitability for this post and a claim to some such high office and that he cordially approved lord palmerston's choice i do not suppose that dean stanley ever knew of this possible veto in lord shaftesbury's hands but he entertained the profoundest respect for him and expressed it in the little poem which he wrote about him of which lord shaftesbury gave me a manuscript copy which appears in dean stanley's biography he compares the aged philanthropist to a great rock's shadow in a weary land it was a charge against howard and some other great philanthropists that while exhibiting the enthusiasm of humanity on the largest scale they failed to show it on a small one and were scantily kind to those immediately around them nothing could be less true of lord shaftesbury while the direction of a score of great charitable undertakings rested on him and his study was flooded with reports bills before parliament and letters by the hundred 
he would remember to perform all sorts of little kindnesses to individuals having no special claim on him and never by any chance did he omit an act of courtesy no more perfectly high-bred gentleman ever graced the old school and no young man i may add ever had a fresher or warmer heart indeed i know not where i should look among old or young for such ready and full response of feeling to each call for pity for sympathy for indignation and i may add for the enjoyment of humour the least gleam of which caught his eye a moment he was always particularly tickled with the absurdities involved in the doctrine of apostolic succession and whenever a clergyman or a bishop did anything he much disapproved he was sure to stigmatize it from that point of view one day he was giving me a rather long account of some deputation which had waited on him and endeavored to bully him as he described the scene there they stood in a crowd in the room and i said to them gentlemen i'll see you good heavens i thought where did he say he would see them i'll see you at the bottom of the red sea before i'll do it the revulsion was so ludicrous and the allusion to the red sea instead of another place so characteristic that i broke into a peal of laughter which when explained made him also laugh heartily another day i remember his great amusement at a story not reported i believe in the times but told me by an m p who was present in the house when sir p o had outdone sir boyle roche he spoke of the ingratitude of the irish to mr gladstone who had broken down the bridges which divided them from england a lady whose reputation was less unblemished than might have been wished and of whom i fought very shy in consequence went to call on him about some business when i saw him next he told me of her visit and said when she left my study i said to myself there goes a dashing cyprian one needed to go back a century to recall this droll old phrase more than once he repeated chuckling with amusement the speech of an old beggar woman to whom he had refused alms and who called after him you withered specimen of bygone philanthropy on another occasion when he was in the chair at a small meeting one of the speakers persisted in expressing over and over his conviction that the venerable chairman could not be expected to live long lord shaftesbury turned aside to me and said sotto voce i declare he's telling me i'm going to die immediately there he is saying it again was there ever such a man nobody was more awake than he to the dodges of interested people trying to make capital out of his religious party a most ridiculous instance of this he described to me with great glee at the time of the excitement now long forgotten about the madiai family barnum actually called upon him lord shaftesbury and entreated him to allow of the madiai being taken over to be exhibited in new york it would be such an affecting sight said barnum to see real christian martyrs as an instance of his thoughtfulness i may mention that having one day just received a ticket for the private view of the academy he offered it to me and i accepted it gladly observing that since the recent death of boxall i feared we should not have one given to us and that my friend would be pleased to use it oh i am so glad said lord shaftesbury and from that day every year till he died he never once failed to send her addressed by himself his tickets for each of the two annual exhibitions when one thinks of how men who do not do in a year as much as he did in a week would have scoffed at the idea of taking such trouble one may estimate the good nature which prompted this overworked man to remember such a trifle unfailingly the most touching interview i ever had with him was one of the last in his study in grosvenor square not long before his death our conversation had fallen on the woes and wrongs of seduced girls and ruined women and he told me many facts which he had learned by personal investigation and visits to dreadful haunts in london he described all he saw and heard with a compassion for the victims and yet a horror of vice and impurity which somehow made me think of christ and the woman taken in adultery after a few moments silence during which we were both rather overcome he said when i feel age creeping on me and i know i must soon die 
i hope it is not wrong to say it but i cannot bear to leave the world with all the misery in it no words can describe how this simple expression revealed to me the man in his inmost spirit he had long passed the stage of moral effort which does good as a duty and had ascended to that wherein even the enjoyment of heaven itself which of course his creed taught him to expect immediately after death had less attractions for him than the labor of mitigating the sorrows of earth i possess two hundred and eighty letters and notes from lord shaftesbury written to me during the ten years which elapsed from eighteen seventy five when i first saw him till his last illness in eighteen eighty five many of them are merely brief notes giving me information or advice about my work as honorable secretary of the victoria street society of which he was president but many are long and interesting letters the editor of his excellent biography probably did not know i possessed these letters nor did i know he was preparing lord shaftesbury's life or i should have placed them at his disposal i can only here quote a few as characteristic or otherwise specially interesting to me castle weems weems bay n b september third eighteen seventy eight dear miss cobb your letter is very cheering we were right to make the experiment we were right to test the man and the law cross and his administration of it both have failed us and we are bound in duty i think to leap over all limitations and go in for the total abolition of this vile and cruel form of idolatry for idolatry it is and like all idolatry brutal degrading and deceptive may god prosper us these ill-used and tortured animals are as much his creatures as we are and to say the truth i had in some instances rather be the animal tortured than the man who tortured it i should believe myself to have higher hopes and a happier future yours truly shaftesbury july tenth eighteen seventy nine dear miss cobb i have sent your letter to judas of x i find no fault in it but that of too much courtesy to one so lost to every consideration of feeling and truth did you know him as i know him you would find it difficult to restrain your pen and your tongue some good will come out of the discussion i have unmistakable evidence that many were deeply impressed but adhesion to political leaders is a higher law with most politicians than obedience to the law of truth what do you think now of the doctrine of apostolic succession would st peter st paul and st john have made such a speech as that of my lord of p yours truly shaftesbury castle weems weems bay n b september sixteenth eighteen seventy nine dear miss cobb you do that bishop too much honor he is not worth notice it is frightful to see that the open champions of vivisection are not bradlaugh and mrs b but bishops fathers in god and pastors of the people we shall soon have bradlaugh and his company claiming the apostolical succession and if that succession be founded on truth mercy and love with as good a right as dr g dr m or d d anything else your letter has crushed if such a hard substance can be crushed his lordship of c yours truly shaftesbury the next letter is an acknowledgment of the following verses which i had sent to him on his eightieth birthday they were repeated by the late chamberlain of the city of london sir benjamin scott in his oration on the presentation of the freedom of the city to lord shaftesbury i print the letter though all too kind in its expression about my poor verses on account of the deeply interesting review of his own life which it contains a birthday address to anthony ashley cooper seventh earl of shaftesbury k g april twenty eighth eighteen eighty one for eighty years many will count them over but none save he who knoweth all may guess what those long years have held of high endeavor of world-wide blessing and of blessedness for eighty years the champion of the right of hapless child neglected and forlorn of maniac dungeoned in his double night of woman overtasked and labor-worn of homeless boy in streets with peril rife of workman sickening in his airless den of indian parching for the streams of life of negro slave in bonds of cruel men 
o oh, friend of all the friendless neath the sun whose hand hath wiped away a thousand tears whose fervent lips and clear strong brain have done god's holy service lo these eighty years how meet it seems thy grand and vigorous age should find beyond man's race fresh pangs to spare and for the wronged and tortured brutes engage in yet fresh labours and ungrudging care o oh, tarry long amongst us live we pray hasten not yet to hear thy lord's well done let this world still seem better while it may contain one soul like thine amid its throng whilst thou art here our inmost hearts confess truth spake the kingly seer of old who said found in the way of god and righteousness a crown of glory is the hoary head lord shaftesbury to miss f p c twenty four grosvenor square w april thirtieth eighteen eighty one dear miss cobb had i not known your handwriting i should never have guessed either that you were the writer of the verses or that i was the subject of them had i judged them simply by their ability and force i might have ascribed them to the true author but it required the envelope and the ominous word eighty to justify me in applying them to myself they both touched and gratified me but i will tell you the origin of my public career which you have been so kind as to commend it arose while i was a boy at harrow school about i should think fourteen years of age an event occurred the details of which i may give you some other day which brought painfully before me the scorn and neglect manifested toward the poor and helpless i was deeply affected but for many years afterwards i acted only on feeling and sentiment as i advanced in life all this grew up to a sense of duty and i was convinced that god had called me to devote whatever advantages he might have bestowed upon me to the cause of the weak the helpless both man and beast and those who had none to help them i entered parliament in eighteen twenty six and i commenced operations in eighteen twenty eight with an effort to ameliorate the conditions of lunatics and then i passed on in a succession of attempts to grapple with other evils and such has been my trade for more than half a century do not think for a moment that i claim any merit if there be any doctrine that i dislike and fear more than another it is the doctrine of works whatever i have done has been given to me whatever i have done i was enabled to do and all happy results if any there be must be credited not to the servant but to the great master who led and sustained him my course however has raised up for me many enemies and very few friends but among those friends i hope that you may be numbered yours truly shaftesbury i sent him another little souvenir two years later to lord shaftesbury on his eighty-second birthday with a china tablet the lord of rome historians say lamented he had lost a day when no good deed was done scarce one such day methinks appears in the long record of the years of england's worthier son if on this tablet's surface light his hourly toils should shaftesbury write all may be soon effaced but in our grateful memories graven and in the registries of heaven they will not be erased london april twenty eighth eighteen eighty three the next letter refers to my lectures on the duties of women which i had just delivered twenty four grosvenor square w may fourteenth eighteen eighty dear miss cobb i admire your lectures but do you not try to make the sex a little too pugnacious and why do you give truth to the men and deny it to the women if you mean by truth abstinence from fibs i think that the females are as good as the males but if you mean steadiness of friendship adherence to principles conscientiously not superficially entertained and sincerity in a good cause why the women are far superior yours truly shaftesbury twenty four grosvenor square w may twenty first eighteen eighty dear miss cobb your lecture on vivisection was admirable we must be mealy-mouthed no longer shall you and i have a conversation on your lectures and the duties of women we shall not i believe have much difference of opinion perhaps none i approve them heartily 
but there are one or two expressions which though intelligible to myself would be greatly misconstrued by a certain portion of englishmen i could give you instances by the hundred of the wonderful success that by a merciful providence has followed with our ragged children male and female in fact though after long intervals we have lost sight of a good many we have very few cases indeed of the failure of our hopes and efforts in thirty years we took off the streets of london and sent to service or provided with means of honest livelihood more than two hundred and twenty thousand waifs and strays yours truly shaftesbury july twenty third eighteen eighty dear miss cobb i have had a very friendly letter from gladstone but on reference to him for permission to publish it he seems unwilling to assent our testimony thank god is cumulative for good we may hope and we must pray for better things i send you gladstone's letter pray return it to me and take care that it does not appear in print i am glad that you liked the dinner it was i think a success in showing civility to foreign friends yours truly shaftesbury lord shaftesbury made the following remarks about the future state of animals in a very sympathizing reply to a letter i had written to him in which i mentioned to him that my dog had died september twenty ninth eighteen eighty three i have ever believed in a happy future for animals i cannot say or conjecture how or where but i am sure that the love so manifested by dogs especially is an emanation from the divine essence and as such it can or rather it will never be extinguished twenty four grosvenor square w may fourteenth eighteen eighty five my dear miss cobb you must not suppose that because i did not answer your letter at the moment i am indifferent to you or your correspondence far from it but when i have little to do being almost confined to the house i have much to write and to get through my work i must frequently be relieved by a recumbent posture nevertheless by god's mercy i am certainly better and i think that were we blessed with some warm genial weather i should recover more rapidly brian is a good man he is able diligent zealous and has an excellent judgment i have not been able to attend his committee but his reports to me show attention and good sense i have left as perhaps you have seen the lunacy commission it was at the close of fifty-six years of service that i did so i dare say that you have had time to read my letter of resignation in the times of the eighth i am very glad that miss lloyd is determined to print those lines they are very beautiful and you must be sure to send a copy to miss marsh she admires them as much as i do the thought of calvary is the strength that has governed all the sentiments and actions of my manhood and later life and you can well believe that i greatly rejoice to find that one whom i prize so highly has kindred sympathies may god prosper you yours truly shaftesbury the most remarkable woman i have known not excepting mrs somerville described in my chapter on italy elizabeth barrett browning and mrs beecher stowe was beyond any doubt or question my dear friend fanny kemble i have told of the droll circumstances of our first meeting at newbridge in the early fifties from that time till her death in eighteen ninety two her brilliant iridescent genius her wit her spirit her tenderness the immense go and momentum of her whole nature were sources of endless pleasure to me when i was lame i used to feel that for days after talking with her i could almost dispense with my crutches so much did she literally lift me up mrs kemble paid us several visits here in wales and was perhaps even more delightful in our quiet country quarters than in london she would sit out for many hours at a time in our beautiful old garden which she said was to her an idol and talk of all things in heaven and earth touching in turn every note in the gamut of emotion from sorrowful to joyous one summer she came to us early and thus sat daily under a great cherry tree in the midst of the garden which was at the time a mass of odorous and snowy blossoms alas the blossoms have returned and are blooming as i write but the friend sleeps under the sod in kensal green 
mr henry james's obituary article and mr bentley's generous-hearted letter concerning her in the times in rebuke of the mean and grudging notice of her which that paper had published seem to me to have been by far the most truthful sketches which appeared of the grand old lioness as thackeray called her everybody could admire and most people a little feared her but it needed to come very close to her and brush past her formidable thorns of irony and sarcasm to know and love her as she most truly deserved to be loved there is always something startling and perhaps the reverse of attractive to those of us who have been brought up in the usual english way to repress our emotions in women who have been trained reversely by histrionic life to give all possible outwardness and vividness of expression to those same emotions it is only when we get below both the extreme demonstrativeness on one hand and the conventional reserve and self-restraint on the other and meet on common ground of deep sympathies that real friendship is established a friendship which in my case was at once an honour and a delight mrs kemble in her generous affection made a present to me of the manuscripts of her memoirs which subsequently i induced her to take back and publish herself as her old woman's gossip her records of a girlhood and records of later life besides these which as i have said i returned to her one after another she gave me and i still possess an immense packet of her own old letters to her beloved h s harriet salinger and others and the materials of five large and thick volumes of autograph letters addressed to her extending over more than fifty years they include whole correspondences with w dunn edward fitzgerald henry greville mrs jameson john mitchell kemble george combe and several others and besides these there are either one or half a dozen letters from almost every man and woman of eminence in england in her time mr bentley has very liberally purchased for me for publication about one hundred letters from edward fitzgerald to mrs kemble the rest of the mrs kemble's correspondence i have as i have mentioned bound together in five volumes and i do not intend to publish them had any of mrs kemble's records remained inedited at the time of her death i should have undertaken as she no doubt intended me to do the task of writing her biography the work was however so fully done by herself in her long series of volumes that there was neither need nor room for more i am happy to add in conclusion that in the arrangements i have made regarding my dear old friend's literary remains i have the consent and approval of her daughters i knew mrs gaskell a little but not enough to harmonize in my mind the woman i saw in the flesh with the books i liked so well as mary barton and libby marsh's three eras of mrs stowe's delightful conversation on the terrace of our villa on bellasguardo i have written my recollections and recorded the glimpses i had of mrs browning i have also described harriet hosmer and rosa bonheur our sculptor and painter friends from the latter of whom i have just eighteen ninety eight received the kindest letters and her impressive photograph and mary carpenter my leader and fellow worker at bristol i must not speak here of the affection and admiration i entertain for my dear living friend anna swanick the translator of aeschylus and faust and for louisa lee schuyler one of the leaders in the organization of relief in the great civil war of america and who founded and carried to its present marvellous extent of power and usefulness the state charities aid association of new york again i have known in england madame bodichon who furnished girton with its first thousand pounds mrs josephine butler mrs webster the classic poetess and mrs emily pfeiffer another poetess and very beautiful woman at whose house i once witnessed an interesting scene a large party of ladies and gentlemen dressed in the attire of athenians of the periclean age miss swanick and i who were alone permitted to attend in english costume were immensely impressed by the ennobling effect of the classic dress not only on young and graceful people but on those who were quite the reverse i never saw harriet martineau but was so desirous of doing it that i intended to make a journey to ambleside for the purpose 
and with that view begged our mutual friend the late mrs hensley wedgwood to ask leave to introduce me to her it was an unfortunate moment and i only received the following kind message i need not say how happy i should have been to become acquainted with miss cobb but the time is past and i am only fit for old friends who can excuse my shortcomings i have lost ground so much of late that the case is clear i must give up all hopes of so great a pleasure will you say this to her and ask her to receive my kind and thankful regards i venture to send on the grounds of our common friendships of my living beloved and honoured friends mrs william gray lady mount temple mrs sheriff mrs fawcett miss caroline stephen miss julia wedgwood lady battersea and miss florence davenport hill i must not here speak i have had the pleasure also of meeting that very fine woman worker miss octavia hill george eliot i did not know nor as i have just said did i ever meet harriet martineau but with those two great exceptions i think i may boast of having come into contact with nearly all the most gifted englishwomen of the victorian era and thus when i speak as i shall do in the next chapter of my efforts to put the claims of my sex fairly before the world i may boast of writing with practical personal knowledge of what women are and can be both as to character and ability the decade which began in eighteen eighty brought me many sorrows the first was the death of my second brother thomas cobb of easton lis i loved him much for his own sweet and affectionate nature and much too for the love of our mother which he shared especially with me i was also warmly attached to his beautiful and good scotch wife who survived him only a few years and to his dear children who were my pets in infancy and have been almost like my own daughters ever since my brother ought to have been a very successful and brilliant barrister but his life was broken by the faults of others and when in advanced years he wrote with immense patience and research a really valuable history of the norman kings thought to be so by such competent judges as mr william longman and the historical society of normandy which asked leave to translate it the book was practically killed by a cruel and most unfair review which attributed to him mistakes which he had not made and refused to publish his refutation of the charge if this review were written as we could not but surmise by an eminent historian now dead whose own book my brother had very unwisely ignored i can only say it was a malicious and spiteful deed my brother's ambition was not strong enough to carry him over such a disappointment and he never attempted to write again for the press but spent his later years in the solitary study of his favourite old chronicles and his shakespeare a little later my eldest brother also died leaving no children i must be thankful at my age that the youngest the rector of malden though five years older than i still survives in health and vigour rejoicing in his happy home and family of affectionate daughters i trust yet to welcome him into the brotherhood of the pen when his great monograph on luton church historical and descriptive sees the light this year i also lost in this same decade my earliest friend harriet sellinger and a younger very dear one emily shane mrs shane and her admirable husband had been much drawn to me by religious sympathies and i regarded her with more heartfelt respect i might say reverence than i can well express she endured twenty years of seclusion and suffering with the spirit at once of a saint and of a philosopher had her health enabled her to take her natural place in the world i have always felt assured she would have been recognized as one of the ablest as well as one of the best women of the day and more than the equal of her two gifted sisters catherine and susanna winkworth the friendship between us was of the closest kind i often said that i went to church to her sick-room in her last days when utterly crushed by incessant suffering and by the death of her beloved husband and her favourite son she bore in whispers to me she could scarcely speak for mortal weakness this testimony to our common faith i sent for you to tell you i am more sure than ever that god is good
all these deaths and the heart-wearing anti-vivisection work combined with my own increasing years to make my life in london less and less a source of enjoyment and more of a strain than i could bear in eighteen eighty four miss lloyd with my entire concurrence led our dear little house in hereford square to our friend mrs kemble and we left london altogether and came to live in wales End of section twenty five section twenty six of life of francis power cobb is told by herself by francis power cobb this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine claims of women part one it was not till i was actively engaged in the work of mary carpenter at bristol and had begun to desire earnestly various changes of law relating to young criminals and paupers that i became an advocate of women's rights it was good old rev samuel j may of syracuse new york who when paying us a visit pressed on my attention the question why should you not have a vote why should not women be enabled to influence the making of the laws in which they have as great an interest as men my experience probably explains largely the indifference of thousands of women not deficient in intelligence in england and america to the possession of political rights they have much anxiety to fulfil their home duties and the notion of undertaking others requiring as they fully understand conscientious enquiry and reflection rather alarms than attracts them but the time comes to every woman worth her salt to take ardent interest in some question which touches legislation then she begins to ask herself as mr may asked me why should the fact of being a woman close to me the use of plain direct means of helping to achieve some large public good or stopping some evil the timid the indolent the conventional will here retreat and try to believe that it concerns men only to right the wrongs of the world in some more effectual way than by single-handed personal efforts in special cases others again and of their number was i become deeply impressed with the need of woman's voice in public affairs and thenceforth attach themselves to the woman's cause more or less earnestly for my own part i confess i have been chiefly moved by reflection on the sufferings and wrongs borne by women in great measure owing to the deconsideration they endure consequent on their political and civil disabilities whilst i and other happily circumstanced women have had no immediate wrongs of our own to gall us we should still have been very poor creatures had we not felt bitterly those of our less fortunate sisters the robbed and trampled wives the mothers whose children were torn from them at the bidding of a dead or living father the daughters kept in ignorance and poverty while their brothers were educated in costly schools and fitted for honourable professions such wrongs as these have inspired me with the persistent resolution to do everything in my power to protect the property the persons and the parental rights of women i do not think that this resolve has any necessary connection with theories concerning the equality of the sexes and i am sure that a great deal of our force has been wasted on fruitless discussions such as why has there never been a female shakespeare a celt claiming equal representation with a saxon or any representation at all might just as fairly be challenged to explain why there has never been a celtic shakespeare or a celtic tennyson my own opinion is that women en masse are by no means the intellectual equals of men en masse and whether this inequality arise from irremediable causes or from alterable circumstances of education and heredity is not worth debating if the nation had established an intellectual test for political equality and admission to the franchise was confined to persons passing a given standard well and good then no doubt there would be as things now stand fifty per cent of men who would win votes and perhaps only thirty per cent of women so much may be freely admitted but then that thirty per cent of females would obtain political rights and those who failed would be debarred by a natural and real not an arbitrary inferiority 
such a state of things would not present such ludicrous injustice as that which obtains for example in a parish not a hundred miles from my present abode there is in the village in question a man universally known therein as the idiot a poor slouching squinting fellow who yet rents a house and can do rough field work though he can scarcely speak intelligibly he has a vote of course the owner of his house and of half the parish who holds also the advowson of the living is a lady who has travelled widely understands three or four languages and studies the political news of europe daily in the columns of the times that lady equally of course has no vote no power whatever to keep the representation of her county out of the hands of the demagogues naturally admired by the idiot and his compeers under the regulations which create inequalities of this kind is it not rather absurd to insist perpetually as is the practice of our opponents on the intellectual inferiority of women as if it were really in question i hold however that whatever be our real mental rank to be tested thoroughly only in future generations under changed conditions of training and heredity we women are the equivalents though not the equals of men and to refuse a share in the law-making of a nation to the most law-abiding half of it to exclude on all largest questions the votes of the most conscientious temperate religious and above all most merciful and tender-hearted moiety is a mistake which cannot fail and has not failed to entail great evil and loss i wrote as i have mentioned in chapter fifteen a great many articles chiefly in fraser and macmillan on women's concerns about the year eighteen sixty one two three what shall we do with our old maids female chastity lay in monastic women in italy in eighteen sixty two the education of women social science congress and women's part in them and later the fitness of women for the ministry of religion these made me known to many women who were fighting in the woman's cause miss bessie parks now madame belloc madame bodichon mrs gray miss Shiriff, mrs peter taylor miss becker and others and when committees were formed for promoting woman suffrage i was invited to join them i did so and frequently attended the meetings though not regularly we had several members of parliament and other gentlemen notably mr frederick hill brother of my old friend recorder hill and of sir roland who generally helped our deliberations and many able women among others mrs augusta webster the poetess and lady anna gore langton an exceedingly sensible woman who also held drawing-room suffrage meetings at which i spoke in her house we had for secretary miss lydia becker a woman of singular political ability for whom i had a sincere respect her premature death has been an incalculable loss to the women of england she gave me the impression of one of those ill-fated people whose outward persons do not represent their inward selves i am sure she had a large element of softness and sensitiveness in her nature unsuspected by most of those with whom she laboured she was a most courageous and straightforward woman with a single eye to the great political work which she had undertaken and which i think no one has understood so well as she after miss becker's lamented death the great schism between unionists and home rulers extended far enough to split even our committee which was avowedly of no party into two bodies i naturally followed my fellow unionist mrs fawcett when she reorganized the moiety of the society and established an office for it in college street westminster believing her to be quite the ablest woman economist and politician in england i entertain the hope that she may at last carry a woman suffrage bill and live to see qualified single women recording their votes at parliamentary elections when that time arrives everyone will scoff at the objections which have so long closed the right of way to us of the weaker sex beside the committee of the society for woman suffrage i also joined for a time the committee which long afterwards effected the splendid achievement of procuring the passage of the married women's property act the greatest step gained up to the present time for women in england 
i can claim no part of that real honor which is due in greatest measure to mrs jacob bright the question of granting university degrees to women was opened as far back as eighteen sixty two in that year i read in the guild hall in london at the social science congress a paper pleading for the privilege dean millman who occupied the chair was very kind in praising my crude address and enjoyed the little jokes wherewith it was sprinkled but next morning every daily paper in london laughed at my demand and for a week or two i was the butt of universal ridicule nevertheless just seventeen years afterwards i was invited to join a deputation headed by lady stanley of alderley to thank lord granville for having as president of london university conceded those degrees to women precisely as i had demanded i took occasion at the close of the pleasant interview to present him with one of the very few remaining copies of my original and much ridiculed appeal from this time i wrote and spoke not unfrequently on behalf of women's political and civil claims one article of mine in fraser eighteen sixty eight was reprinted more than once it was headed criminals idiots women and minors and inquired whether the classification should be counted sound i hope that the discussion it involved on the laws relating to the property of married women was of some service in helping on the great measure of justice afterwards granted another paper of mine circulated by the london national society for women's suffrage for whom i wrote it was entitled our policy it was in effect an address to women concerning the best way to secure the suffrage i began this pamphlet by the following remarks there is an instructive story told by herodotus of an african nation which went to war with the south wind the wind had greatly annoyed these Selians by drying up their cisterns so they organized a campaign and set off to attack the enemy at headquarters somewhere i presume about the sahara the army was admirably equipped with all the military engines of those days swords and spears darts and javelins battering rams and catapults it happened that the south wind did not however suffer much from these weapons but got up one fine morning and blew the sands of the desert have lain for a great many ages over those unfortunate Selians, and as herodotus placidly concludes the story the nosimans possessed the territory of those who thus perished it seems to me that we women who have been fighting for the suffrage with logical arguments syllogisms analogies demonstrations and reductions to the absurd of our antagonist's position in short all the weapons of ratiocinative warfare have been behaving very much like those poor Selians who imagined that darts and swords and catapults would avail against the simoom the obvious fact is that it is sentiment we have to contend against not reason feeling and prepossession not intellectual conviction had logic been the only obstacle in our way we should long ago have been polling our votes for parliamentary as well as for municipal and school board elections to those who hold that property is the thing intended to be represented by the constitution of england we have shown that we possess such property to those who say that tax-paying and representation should go together we have pointed to the tax-gatherers papers which alas lie on our hall tables wholly irrespective of the touching fact that we belong to the protected sex where intelligence education and freedom from crime are considered enough to confer rights of citizenship we have remarked that we are quite ready to challenge rivalry in such particulars with those illiterates for whose exercise of political functions our senate has taken such exemplary care finally to the ever-recurring charge that we cannot fight and therefore ought not to vote we have replied that the logic of the exclusion will be manifest when all the men too weak too short or too old for the military standard be likewise disenfranchised and when the actual soldiers of our army are accorded the suffrage but it is sentiment not logic against which we have to struggle and we shall best do so i think by endeavouring to understand and make full allowance for it and then by steady working shoulder to shoulder so as to conquer or rather win it over to our side 
in eighteen seventy six may thirteenth i made a rather long and elaborate speech on the subject of women's suffrage in a meeting at st george's hall at which mr russell gurney the recorder of london took the chair john bright had spoken against our bill in the house and though i had not intended to speak at our meeting i was spurred by indignation to reply to him in this address i spoke chiefly of the wrongs of mothers whose children are taken from them at the will of a living or dead father i ended by saying i advocate woman suffrage as the natural and needful constitutional means of protection for the rights of the weaker half of the nation i do this as a woman pleading for women but i do it also and none the less confidently as a citizen and for the sake of the whole community because it is my conviction that such a measure is no less expedient for men than just for women and that it will redound in coming years ever more and more to the happiness the virtue and the honor of our country several years after this i wrote a letter which was printed in the american woman's tribune may first eighteen eighty four it expresses so exactly what i feel still on the subject that i shall redeem it if possible from oblivion the following are the passages for which i should like to ask the reader's attention if i may presume to offer an old woman's counsel to the younger workers in our cause it would be that they should adopt the point of view that it is before all things our duty to obtain the franchise if we undertake the work in this spirit and with the object of using the power it confers whenever we gain it for the promotion of justice and mercy and the kingdom of god upon earth we shall carry on all our agitation in a corresponding manner firmly and bravely and also calmly and with generous good temper and when our opponents come to understand that this is the motive underlying our efforts they on their part will cease to feel bitterly and scornfully toward us even when they think we are altogether mistaken the people may conscientiously consider that we are mistaken in asking for woman suffrage is another point which it surely behoves us to carry in mind we naturally think almost exclusively of many advantages which would follow to our sex and to both sexes from the entrance of woman into political life but that there are some lions in the way and rather formidable lions too ought not to be forgotten for myself i would far rather that women should remain without political rights to the end of time than that they should lose those qualities which we comprise in the word womanliness and i think nearly every one of the leaders of our party in america and in england agrees with me in this feeling the idea that the possession of political rights will destroy womanliness absurd as it may seem to us is very deeply rooted in the minds of men and when they oppose our demands it is only just to give them credit for doing so on grounds which we should recognize as valid if their premises were true it is not so much that our opponents at least the better part of them despise women as that they really prize what women now are in the home and in society so highly that they cannot bear to risk losing it by any serious change in their condition these fears are futile and faithless but there is nothing in them to affront us to remove them we must not use violent words for every such violent word confirms their fears but on the contrary show the world that while the revolutions wrought by men have been full of bitterness and rancor and stormy passions if not of bloodshed we women will at least strive to accomplish our great emancipation calmly and by persuasion and reason i was honored about this time by several friendly advances from american ladies and gentlemen interested like myself in woman's advancement the astronomer professor maria mitchell wrote me a charming letter which i exceedingly regret should have been lost as i felt particular interest in her great achievements i had the pleasure of receiving mrs julia ward howe in hereford square and also mrs livermore whose speech at one of our suffrage meetings realized my highest ideal of a woman's public address her noble face and figure like that of a roman matron her sweet manners and playful humor without a scintilla of bitterness in it as if she were a mother remonstrating with a foolish schoolboy son were all delightful to me 
colonel j w higginson who has been so good a friend and adviser to women also came to see me and gave me some bright hours of conversation on his wonderful experiences in the war during which he commanded a colored regiment which fought valiantly under his leadership finally i had the privilege of being elected a member of the famous sorosis club of new york and of receiving the following very pleasant letter conveying the gift of a pretty gold and enamel brooch the badge of the sisterhood dear madam the ladies of sorosis the woman's club of new york beg your acceptance of the accompanying pin the insignia of their organization which they send by the hand of their foreign correspondent mrs laura curtis ballard trifling as is this testimonial in itself they feel that if you knew the genuine appreciation of you and your work that goes with it the gratitude with which each one regards you as a faithful worker for women you would not consider it unworthy your acceptance with best wishes for your continued health which in your case means continued usefulness i am dear madam with great respect and esteem your obedient servant celia burley corresponding secretary sorosis thirty seven huntingdon street brooklyn new york june twenty first eighteen sixty nine the part of my work for women however to which i look back with most satisfaction was that in which i labored to obtain protection for unhappy wives beaten mangled mutilated or trampled on by brutal husbands one day in eighteen seventy eight i was by chance reading a newspaper in which a whole series of frightful cases of this kind were recorded here and there among the ordinary news of the time i got up out of my armchair half dazed and said to myself i will never rest till i have tried what i can do to stop this i thought anxiously what was the sort of remedy i ought to endeavor to put forward a parliamentary blue book had been printed in eighteen seventy five entitled reports on the state of the law relating to brutal assaults and the following is a summary of the results there was a large consensus of opinion that the law as it now stands is insufficient for its purpose lord chief justice coburn mr justice lush mr justice mellor chief baron kelly barons bramwell pigott and pollock all expressed the same judgment pages seven through nineteen the following gave their opinion in favor of flogging offenders in case of brutal assaults lord chief justice coburn mr justices blackburn mellor lush quain archibald brett grove chief baron kelly barons bramwell pigott pollock charles and amphlett only lord coleridge and lord denman hesitated and mr justice keating opposed flogging of chairmen of quarter sessions sixty-four out of sixty-eight whose answers were sent to the home office and the recorders of forty-one towns were in favor of flogging after all this testimony of the opinions of experts collected of course at the public expense three years elapsed during which absolutely nothing was done to make any practical use of it during the interval scores of bills interesting to the represented sex passed through parliament but this question on which the lives of women literally hung was never mooted something like five thousand women judging by the published judicial statistics were in those years brutally assaulted i e not merely struck but maimed blinded trampled on by strong men in heavy shoes and in many cases murdered outright and thousands of children were brought up to witness scenes which as colonel lee said infernalize a whole generation where lay the fault scarcely with the government or even with parliament but with the simple fact that under our present constitution women having no votes can only exceptionally and through favor bring pressure to bear to force attention even to the most crying of injustices under which they suffer the home office must attend first to the claims of those who can bring pressure to bear on it and members of parliament must bring in the measures pressed by their constituents and thus the unrepresented must go to the wall the cases of cruelty of which i obtained statistics furnished to me mainly by the kindness of miss a shore almost surpassed belief it appeared that about fifteen hundred cases of aggravated 
over and above ordinary assaults on wives took place every year in england on an average about four a day many of them were of truly incredible savagery and the victims were in the vast majority of cases not drunken viragos who usually escape violence or give as good as they receive but poor pale shrinking creatures who strove to earn bread for their children and to keep together their miserable homes and whose very tears and pallor were reproaches which provoked the heteropathy and cruelty of their tyrants after much reflection i came to the conclusion that in spite of all the authority in favour of flogging the delinquents it was not expedient on the women's behalf that they should be so punished since after they had undergone such chastisement however well merited the ruffians would inevitably return more brutalised and infuriated than ever and again have their wives at their mercy the only thing really effective i considered was to give the wife the power of separating herself and her children from her tyrant of course in the upper ranks where people could afford to pay for a suit in the divorce court the law had for some years opened to the assaulted wife this door of escape but among the working classes where the assaults were tenfold as numerous and twenty times more cruel no legal means whatever existed of escaping from the husband returning after punishment to beat and torture his wife again i thought the thing to be desired was the extension of the privilege of rich women to their poorer sisters to be effected by an act of parliament which should give a wife whose husband had been convicted of an aggravated assault on her the power to obtain a separation order under summary jurisdiction mr alfred hill j p of birmingham son of my old friend recorder hill most kindly interested himself in my project and drafted a bill to be presented to parliament embodying my wishes meanwhile i set about writing an article setting forth the extent of the evil the failure of the measures hitherto taken in various acts of parliament and finally the remedy i proposed this article my friend mr percy bunting was good enough to publish in the contemporary review in the spring of eighteen seventy eight i also wrote an article in truth on wife torture afterwards reprinted meanwhile i had obtained the most cordial assistance from mr frederick pennington and mr hopwood both of whom were then in parliament and it was agreed that i should beg mr russell gurney to take charge of the bill which these gentlemen would support i went accordingly armed with the draft bill to the recorder's house in kensington palace gardens and as i anxiously desired to find him at home i ventured to call as early as ten thirty mr gurney read the draft bill carefully and entirely approved it then i said you will take charge of it i earnestly hope no said mr gurney i cannot do that i am too old and overworked to undertake all the watching and labour which may be necessary but i will put my name on the back of it with pleasure i knew of course that his name would give the measure great importance and also help me to find some other m p to take charge of it so i could not but thank him gratefully at that moment of our interview his charming wife entered the room leading a little boy i believe his nephew naturally i apologized to mrs gurney for my presence at that unholy hour of the morning and said i came to mr gurney in my anxiety as the friend of women mr gurney hearing me put his hands on the little lad's shoulder and said to him do you hear that my boy i hope that when you are an old man as i am some lady like miss cobb may call you the friend of women at last the bill embodying precisely the purport of that drawn up for me by mr hill and subsequently published in the contemporary review was read a first time the names of mr herschel now lord herschel and sir henry holland afterward lord nutsford being on the back of it every arrangement was made for the second reading and for avoiding the opposition which we expected to meet from a party which seems always to think that by calling certain unions holy a church can sanctify that which has become a bond of savage cruelty on one side and soul-degrading slavery on the other just at this crisis lord penzance who was bringing a bill into the house of lords to remedy some defects concerning the costs of the intervention of the queen's proctor in matrimonial cases 
introduced into it a clause dealing with the case of the assaulted wives and giving them precisely the benefit contemplated in our bill and in my article namely that of separation orders to be granted by the same magistrates who have convicted the husband of aggravated assaults upon them that lord penzance had seen our bill then before the lower house it was ordered to be printed february fourteenth and had had his attention called to the subject either by it or by my article in the contemporary review i have taken as probable but have no exact knowledge i went at once to call on him and thank him from my heart for undertaking to do this great service of mercy to women and also to pray him to consider certain points about the custody of the children of such assaulted wives lord penzance received me with the utmost kindness and likewise gave favourable consideration to a letter or two which i ventured to address to him it is needless to say that his advocacy of the measure carried it through the house of lords without opposition i believe that in speaking for it he said that if any noble lord needed proof of the grievous want of such protection for wives they would find it in my article which he held in his hand there was still we feared an ordeal to go through in the house of commons but the fates and hours were propitious and the bill coming in late one night as already passed by the house of lords and with lord penzance's great name on it escaped opposition and was accepted without debate by the twenty seventh may eighteen seventy eight it had become the law of the land and has since taken its place as chapter nineteen of the forty first victoria an act to amend the matrimonial causes acts the following are the clauses which concern the assaulted wives four if a husband shall be convicted summarily or otherwise of an aggravated assault within the meaning of the statute twenty fourth and twenty fifth victoria chapter one hundred section forty three upon his wife the court or magistrate before whom he shall be so convicted may if satisfied that the future safety of the wife is in peril order that the wife shall be no longer bound to cohabit with her husband and such order shall have the force and effect in all respects of a degree of judicial separation on the ground of cruelty and such order may further provide one that the husband shall pay to his wife such weekly sum as the court or magistrate may consider to be in accordance with his means and with any means with which the wife may have for her support and the payment of any sum of money so ordered shall be enforceable and enforced against the husband in the same manner as the payment of money is enforced under an order of affiliation and the court or magistrate by whom any such order for payment of money shall be made shall have power from time to time to vary the same on the application of either the husband or the wife upon proof that the means of the husband or wife have been altered in amount since the original order or any subsequent order varying it shall have been made two that the legal custody of any children of the marriage under the age of ten years shall in the discretion of the court or magistrate be given to the wife at first the magistrates were very chary of granting the separation orders one london police magistrate had said that the house of commons would never put such power in the hands of one of the body and he was i suppose proportionately startled when just six weeks later it actually lay in his own by degrees however the practice of granting the orders on proper occasions became common and appears now to be almost a matter of course i hope that at least a hundred poor souls each year thus obtain release from their tormentors and probably the deterrent effect of witnessing such manumission of ill-treated slaves may have still more largely served to protect women from the violence of brutal husbands End of section twenty six Section twenty seven of Life of Frances Power Cobb is told by herself by Frances Power Cobb. The Sleepervox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nineteen The Claims of Women Part two Six years after the act had passed in eighteen eighty four, I received a letter from a very energetic and prominent woman worker with whom I had a slight acquaintance, in which the following passages occur 
i quote them here though with some hesitation on the score of vanity for they have comforted me much and deeply and will do so to my life's end on wednesday last i was two hours with a widow of o near w one of those persons who make a country so good brave loving and hard-working for thirty-three long years she lived with a fiend of a husband and suffered furious blows kicks and attacks with ropes hot water and crockery was hurled down cellar steps etc starved and insulted all the time up early and at work managing a large shop and superintending thirty-five girls i wish you could have been there to hear her tell me that the law was altered now and how her niece had got a separation for brutal treatment and best of all her two bairns children as for the eight shillings a week ordered the wife never bothers after that the lord has stopped that villain's ways and she wants no more i could not help crying as i looked at the exquisitely clean person and home the determined face and thought of the diabolical horrors this good clever woman had gone through i told her how you had got the law altered and she kept saying she's a lady she's a lady bring her to o missus and we'll procession her down the street you have love and gratitude from our hearts i assure you we live wider lives and better for your presence i have ventured to write freely on a subject some would find wearisome but your heart is big and will sympathize and i am always longing for you to know the active result of your achieved work this that poor battered bruised women are relieved are safer and bless you and so do i from a full heart i am dear miss cobb yours faithfully a s if i could hear before i die that i had been able to do as much for tortured brutes i should say nunc dimittis and wish no more some time after this i have kept no copy or record of date i delivered a lecture which was a good deal noticed at the time on the little health of ladies it was an exposure of the evils resulting to families from the state of semi-invalidism in which so many women live usually gently lapped therein by interested advisers i exhorted women to do as a duty to god and man everything possible to avoid falling into this wretched condition with the self-indulgence and neglect of home and social duties leading to it or consequent on it i did not then know as much as i subsequently learned of the inner history of a great deal of this misery or i might have added to my warning some remarkable denunciations by honourable doctors of the practices of their colleagues a singular incident followed the publication of this address in one of the magazines there was a lady whose husband was a wealthy manufacturer in the north of england who came to london once or twice a year and for several years called on me having much sympathy with my various interests she appeared to be a confirmed invalid crawling with great difficulty out of her carriage into our dining-room and lying on a sofa during her visits one day i was told she had come and i was hastening to receive her downstairs when a tall elegant woman whom i scarcely recognized walked firmly and lightly into my drawing-room and greeted me cordially with laughter in her eyes at my astonishment so glad to see you so well i exclaimed but what has happened to you it is you who have effected the cure she answered good gracious how why i read your little health of ladies and i resolved to set my doctor at naught and go about like other people and you see how well i am there was really nothing the matter with me but want of exercise i saw her several times afterwards in good health and once she brought me a beautiful gold bracelet with clasp of diamonds set in black enamel which she had had made for me and which she forced me to accept as a token of her gratitude i am fond of wearing it still another incident strongly confirmed my belief in the source of much of the evil and misery arising from the little health of ladies travelling one day from brighton i fell into conversation with a nice-looking well-bred woman the only other occupant of the railway carriage speaking of the salubrity of brighton she said i am sure i have reason enough to bless it 
i was for fourteen years a miserable invalid on my sofa in london my doctor telling me i must never go out or move at last i said to my husband it is better to die than to go on thus and in defiance of our doctor he brought me away to brighton and there i soon grew as you see quite strong and and i must tell you i have a little baby and my husband is so happy that clever gynaecologist lost i dare say a hundred or perhaps two hundred a year by the escape of his patient from his assiduous visitations but the lady gained health and happiness her husband his wife's companionship and both of them a child how much of the miseries and ill health and in many cases death of women of the poorer classes especially lies at the door of medical practitioners and operators too fond by half of the knife is known to those who have read the recent articles and correspondence respecting the women's hospitals and human vivisection therein in the daily chronicle may eighteen ninety four and in the homeopathic world for june quite apart from the doctors however a great deal of the sickliness of women is undoubtedly due to wretched fashions of tight lacing and wearing long and heavy skirts and tight thin boots which render free exercise of their limbs impossible nothing makes me really despair of my sex except looking at fashion plates or seeing what is much worse still being wicked as well as foolish the adornments so many women use of dead birds stuck on their empty heads and heartless breasts these things are a disgrace to women for which i have often felt they deserve to be despised and swept aside by men as soulless creatures unworthy of freedom but alas it is precisely the women who adopt these idiotic fashions in dress and wear abominable cruelty egrets as ornaments who are not despised but admired by men who reserve their indifference and contempt for their homely and sensible sisters men in these respects are as silly as the fish in the river caught by a gaudy artificial fly on a hook or enticed into a net by a scrap of scarlet cloth and a glittering morsel of brass i often wonder whether women are generally as little capable of forming a discriminating judgment of men lastly there is a cause of female ill-health which always impresses me with profoundest pity and which has never i think been fairly brought to the front as the origin of a large part of feminine feebleness i mean the common want among women who earn their livelihood of sufficiently brain-nourishing and stimulating food let any man the strongest in the land in body and mind subsist for one week on tea without milk and bread and butter and at the end of that time he will i venture to predict have lost half of his superiority his nervous excitability and cheerfulness may remain or even be enhanced but the faculty of largely grasping and strongly dealing with the subjects presented to him and of doing thorough and complete work nay even the desire of such perfection and finish will have abated and the fatal slovenliness of women's work will probably have begun to show itself the physical conditions under which the human spirit can alone in this life carry out its purpose and attain its maximum of vigour are more or less lacking to half the women even in our country and almost completely wanting to the poor prisoners of the zenanas of india and the cripples of china exercise in the open air wholesome and sufficient food plenty of sleep at night every one of these sine qua non elements of real health of mind as well as of body are out of reach of one woman out of every two yet we remark curiously on the inferiority of their work it is a vicious circle in which they are caught they take lower wages because they can live more cheaply than men and they necessarily live on those low wages too poorly to do anything but poor work and again their wages are paltry because their work is so poor i confess however that on the other hand the spectacle of feminine feebleness and futility when as continually happens it is exhibited without the smallest excuse from inadequate food supply is indescribably irritating nay to me humiliating and exasperating 
watch for example of what i mean by feminine futility a woman asked to open a just arrived box or a bottle of champagne or of soda water she has been given a cold chisel for opening the box and a hammer but they are invariably astray when required or she does not think it worth while to fetch them for up or down stairs so she kneels down before the box and begins by fumbling with her fingers at the knots in the cord after five minutes efforts and broken nails she gives this up in despair and thinks she must cut it but how she never by any chance has a knife in her pocket so she first tries her scissors which she does keep there but which being always quite blunt fail to sever the rope and then she fetches a dinner knife and gives one cut when the feminine passion for economy suggests to her that she can save the rest of the cord by pushing it with immense effort an inch or two along the box first at one side and then at the other then she hopes by breaking open the top of the box at one end only to get out the contents without dealing further with the recalcitrant rope and she endeavors to pull it open where the nails seem least firm alas those nails will never yield to her weak hands so her scissors are in requisition again and being inserted and used as a wedge immediately break off at the points and are hastily withdrawn with an exclamation of agonizing regret for the blunt but precious instrument something must be thrust in however to prize open the box the cold chisel and hammer having been at last sought but sought in vain the kitchen cleaver covered with the fat of the last joint it has cut is brought into play or happy thought she knows where her master keeps a fine sharp chisel and this is pushed in of course against a nail which breaks the edge and makes it useless for ever the poker serves sufficiently well as a hammer to knock in the chisel or the cleaver and to bang up the protruding lid of the box and at last one plank of the top is loosened and she tears it off triumphantly with a cry of rejoicing there now we shall get at everything in the box the goods however stubbornly refuse to be extricated through the hole on any terms and eventually all the planks have to be successively broken up and the long cared for cord for the preservation of which so much trouble has been undergone is cut into little pieces of a foot or two in length each attached to a hopelessly entangled knot while the box itself is entirely wrecked the case of the soda water or champagne bottle is worse again so much so that experience warns the wise to forbear from calling for effervescent drinks where parlour-maids prevail the preliminary ineffectual attempt to loosen the wires with the fingers the proper pliers being of course missing the resort to a steel carving fork to open them and in default of the steel fork to a silver one which is of course bent immediately the endeavour to cut the hempen cord with the bread knife with the result of blunting that tool against the wire the struggle to cause the cork to fly by wobbling it with the right hand while clasping the neck of the bottle till it and the contents are hot in the left then on the failure of this bold attempt the cutting off the head of the cork with a carving knife and at the same time a small slice of the operator's hand which of course bleeds profusely the consequent hasty transference of the bottle and the job to a second attendant the hurried search of the same in the side drawer for the corkscrew her rush to the kitchen to fetch that instrument where it has been nefariously borrowed and where the point of the screw has been broken off the difficult and crooked insertion of the broken screw into the cork the repeated frantic tugs at the bottle held tight between the knees finally the climax when the cork bursts out and the champagne along with it up in the reddening face and over the white muslin apron of the poor anxious woman who hurries nervously to wipe it off and then pours the small quantity of liquor which remains bubbling over the glasses till the tablecloth is swamped such in brief is feminine futility as exhibited in the drawing of corks luckily it is possible to find parlour-maids who know how to use and will keep at hand both cold chisels and corkscrews but they are exceptions the normal woman in the presence of a nailed down box or a champagne bottle behaves as i have depicted from careful study and the irritation she produces in me is past words 
especially if a man be waiting for his beverage and observing the spectacle of the helplessness of my sex if man be a tool-making animal i am afraid that woman is a tool-breaking one i think every girl as well as every boy ought to be given a month's training in a carpenter's shop to teach her how to strike a nail straight what is the difference between the proper insertion and extraction of nails and of screws why chisels should not be employed as screwdrivers how far preferable for making holes are gimlets to hairpins or the points of scissors and finally the general superiority of glue over paste or gum for sticking wooden furniture when broken by her besom of destruction my dear friend emily shane wrote an excellent tract which i should like to see republished urging that it is absurd to go on talking of the house being the proper sphere of a woman while we neglect to teach her the very rudiments of a housefrau's duties and leave her to find them all out at her husband's expense when she marries the nature of gas and of gasometers and how not to cause explosions nor be cheated in the bill the arrangements of waterworks in houses pipes drains cisterns ballcocks and all the rest for hot and cold water the choice of properly mortised not merely glued furniture what constitutes a good kitchen range and how coal should be economized in it how to choose fresh meat etc such should be her lessons to this might be usefully added an inkling of the laws relating to masters and servants debts bills etc etc and of the elementary arrangements of banking and investing money it was once discovered at my school that a very clever young lady who could speak four languages and play two instruments well could not read the clock i think there are many grown-up women well educated according to the ordinary standard of their class whose ignorance concerning the simplest matters of household duty is not a whit less absurd in eighteen eighty one i prepared and delivered to an audience of about one hundred fifty ladies in the westminster palace hotel a course of six lectures on the duties of women my dear friend miss anna swanick took the chair for me on these occasions and performed her part with such tact and geniality as to give me every advantage my auditors were very attentive and sympathetic and altogether the task was made very pleasant to me i repeated the course again at clifton the same year mrs beddow the wife of dr john beddow the anthropologist who was then living at that place most obligingly lending me her large drawing-rooms these lectures when printed went through three editions in england and i think eight in america the last being brought out by miss willard who adopted the little book as the first of a series on women's concerns published by her vast and wonderful organization the w c t u my object in giving these lectures was to impress women as strongly as might be in my power with the unspeakable importance of adding to our claims for just rights of all kinds the adoption of the highest standard of duty and the strict preservation amongst us of all womanly virtues while adding to them those others to the growth of which our conditions have hitherto been unfavorable namely truth and courage i desired also to discuss the new views current among us respecting filial and conjugal obedience the proper attitude to be held towards unrepentant vice and many other topics finally i wish to place the efforts to obtain political freedom on what i deem to be their proper ground i ask what ought we to do at present as concerns all public work wherein it is possible for us to obtain a share the question seems to answer itself in its mere statement we are bound to do all we can to promote the virtue and happiness of our fellow-men and women and therefore we must accept and seize every instrument of power every vote every influence which we can obtain to enable us to promote virtue and happiness why are we not to wish and strive to be allowed to place our hands on that vast machinery whereby in a constitutional realm the great work of the world is carried on and which achieves by its enormous power tenfold either the good or the harm which any individual can reach which may be turned to good or turned to harm according to the hands which touch it 
in almost every case it is only by legislation that the roots of great evils can be reached at all and that the social diseases of pauperism vice and crime can be brought within hope of cure you will judge from these remarks the ground on which as a matter of duty i place the demand for woman's political emancipation i think we are bound to seek it in the first place as a means a very great means of fulfilling our social duty of contributing to the virtue and happiness of mankind and advancing the kingdom of god there are many other reasons viewed from the point of expediency but this is the view from that of duty we know too well that men who possess political rights do not always or often regard them in this fashion but this is no reason why we should not do so we also know that the individual power of one vote at any election seems rarely to affect any appreciable difference but this also need not trouble us for little or great if we can obtain any influence at all we ought to seek for it and the multiplication of the votes of women bent on seeking conscientious candidates would soon make it not only appreciable but weighty nay further the direct influence of a vote is but a small part of the power which the possession of the political franchise confers its indirect influence is far more important in a government like ours where the basis of representation is so immensely extensive the whole business of legislation is carried on by pressure the pressure of each represented class and party to get its grievances redressed to make its interests prevail it is one of the sore grievances of women that not possessing representation the measures which concern them are for ever postponed to the bills promoted by the represented classes e g the married woman's property bill was if i mistake not six times set down for reading in one session in vain the house being counted out on every occasion thus in asking for the parliamentary franchise we are asking as i understand it for the power to influence legislation generally and in every other kind of franchise municipal parochial or otherwise for similar power to bring our sense of justice and righteousness to bear on public affairs what is this after all my friends but public spirit in one shape called patriotism in another philanthropy the extension of our sympathies beyond the narrow bounds of our homes and disinterested enthusiasm for every good and sacred cause as i said at first all the world has recognized from the earliest times how good and noble and wholesome a thing it is for men to have their breasts filled with such public spirit and we look upon them when they exhibit it as glorified thereby do you think it is not equally an ennobling thing for a woman's soul to be likewise filled with these large and generous and unselfish emotions i draw the lectures to a conclusion thus none of us i am sure realize how blessed a thing we might make of our lives if we could but give ourselves heart and soul to fulfil all the obligations personal social and religious which rest upon us to gain the strength to think to feel to do only the holy right to yield no step in the awful race no blow in the fearful fight to live in purity and truth and courage a life of love to god and to man striving to make every spot where we dwell every region to which our influence can extend god's kingdom where his will shall be done on earth as it is in heaven some time after the delivery of these addresses when the primrose league was in full activity i wrote at the request of the committee of the women's suffrage association a circular letter to the dames of whom i am one begging them to endeavor to make the granting of votes to women a plank in their platform i received many friendly letters in reply but the men who influenced the league apparently finding that they could make the dames do their political work for them without votes discouraged all movement in the desired direction and i do not suppose that anything was gained by my attempt my last effort on behalf of women was to read a paper on women's duty to women at the conference of women workers held at birmingham in november eighteen ninety 
this address was received with such exceeding kindness and sympathy by my audience that the little event has left very tender recollections which i am glad to carry with me i will record here two paragraphs which i should like to leave as my last appeal on behalf of my sex it may be an open question whether any individual woman suffers more severely in body or mind than any individual man there are some who say that all our passions matched with theirs are as moonlight is to sunlight and as water is to wine a sentiment which i am happy to tell you lord tennyson has angrily disclaimed as his own declaring that he only put it into the mouth of an impatient fool but that our whole sex together suffers more physical pain more want more grief than the other is not i think open to doubt even if we put aside the poor chinese women maimed from infancy the hindu women against whose cruel wrongs their noble countryman malabari has just been pleading so eloquently in london if we put these and all the other prisoners of eastern harems and miserable wives of african and australian savages out of question and think only of the comparatively free and happy women of christendom how much more liable to suffering if not always actually condemned to suffer is the life of women to be weak is to be miserable and we are weak always comparatively to our companions and weak often absolutely and in reference to the wants we must supply the duties we must perform now it seems to me that just in proportion as any one is possessed of strength of mind or of body or of wealth or influence so far it behooves him or her to turn with sympathy and tender helpfulness to the weakest and most forlorn of god's creatures whether it be man or woman or child or even brute the weight of the claim is an exact ratio of the feebleness and helplessness and misery of the claimant thus then i would sum up the counsels which i am presuming to offer to you you will all remember the famous line of terence at which the old roman audience rose in a tumult of applause i am a man nothing human is alien to me i would have each of you add to this in an emphatic way mulier sum nihil muliebra a me alienum puto i am a woman nothing concerning the interests of women is alien to me take the sorrows the wants the dangers above all the dangers of our sisters closely to heart and without ceasing to interest yourself in charities having men and boys for their objects recognize that your earlier care should be for the weakest the poorest those whose dangers are worst of all for after all ruin can only drive a man to the workhouse it may drive a woman to perdition think of all the weak the helpless the wronged women and little children and the harmless brutes and save and shield them as best you can even as the mother bird will shelter and fight for her little helpless fledglings this is the natural field of feminine courage then when you have found your work whatever it be give yourself to it with all your heart and make the resolution in god's sight never to go to your rest leaving a stone unturned which may help your aims half and half charity does very little good to the objects and is a miserable slovenly affair for the workers and when the end comes and the night closes in the long last night of earth when no man can work any more in this world your milk and water half-hearted charities will bring no memories of comfort to you they are not so many good works which you can place on the credit side of your account in the mean commercial spirit taught by some of the churches nay rather they are only solemn evidences that you knew your duty knew you might do good and did it not or did it half-heartedly what a thought for those last days when we know ourselves to be going home to god god whom at bottom after all we have loved and shall love for ever that we might have served him here might have blessed his creatures might have done his will on earth as it is done in heaven but we have let the glorious chance slip by us for ever end of section twenty seven
Section 28 of Life of Frances Power Cobb is told by herself, by Frances Power Cobb. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 Claims of Brutes, Part 1. Readers who have reached this twentieth chapter of my life will smile, as I have often done of late years, at the ascription to me in sundry, not very friendly publications, of exclusive sympathy for animals and total indifference to human interests i have seen myself frequently described as a woman who would sacrifice any number of men women and children sooner than that a few rabbits should be inconvenienced many good people apparently suppose me to represent a personal survival of totemism in england and to worship dogs and cats while ready to consign the human race generally to destruction the foregoing pages describing my life in old days in ireland and the years i spent afterwards working in the slums of bristol ought i think to suffice to dissipate this fancy picture as a matter of fact it has only been of late years and since their wrongs have appealed alike to my feelings of pity and to my moral sense that i have come to bestow any peculiar attention on animals or have been concerned with them more than is common with the daughters of country squires to whom dogs horses and cattle are familiar subjects of interest from childhood i have indeed always felt much affection for dogs that is to say for those who exhibit the true dog character which is far from being the case of every canine creature their eagerness their joyousness their transparent little wiles their caressing and devoted affection are to me more winning even i may say more really and intensely human in the sense in which a child is human than the artificial cold and selfish characters one meets too often in the guise of ladies and gentlemen it is not the four legs nor the silky or shaggy coat of the dog which should prevent us from discerning his inner nature of thought and love limited thought it is true but quite unlimited love that he is dumb is to me only another claim as it would be in a human child on my consideration but because i love good dogs and in their measure also good horses and cats and birds i once had a dear and lovely white peahen i am not therefore a morbid zoophilist i should be very sorry indeed to say or think like byron when my dog dies that i had but one true friend and here he lies i have thank god known many men and women who have all a dog's merits of honesty and single-hearted devotion plus the virtues which can only flourish on the high level of humanity and to them i give a friendship which the best of dogs cannot share that there are some timons in the world whose hearts embittered by human ingratitude have turned with relief to the faithful love of a dog i am very well aware surely the fact makes one appeal the more on behalf of the creatures who thus by their humble devotion heal the wounds of disappointed or betrayed affection and who come to cheer the lonely the unloved the dull-witted the blind the poverty-stricken whom the world forsakes i think lamartine was right to treat this love of the dog for man as a special provision of divine mercy and to marvel par quelle pitié pour nos corps il vous donne pour aimer celui qui n'aime plus personne not a few deep thanksgivings i believe have gone up to the maker of man and brute for the silent sympathy expressed perhaps in no nobler way than by the gentle licking of a passive hand which as yet saved a human heart from the sense of utter abandonment but i have no such sorrowful or embittering experience of human affection i do not say the more i know of men the more i love dogs but the more i know of dogs the more i love them without any invidious comparisons with men women or children as regards the children indeed i have always been fond of those which came in my way and if the tenth commandment had gone on to forbid coveting one's neighbour's child i am not sure that i should not have had to plead guilty to breaking it many times in my old home i possessed a dear pomeranian dog of whom i was very fond who being lame used constantly to ensconce herself though forbidden by my father in my mother's carriage under the seat 
and never showed her little pointed nose till the britska had got so far from home that she knew no one would put her down on the road then she would peer out and lie against my mother's dress and be fondled later on i had the companionship of another beautiful mouse-coloured pomeranian brought as a puppy from switzerland in my hard-working life in bristol in the schools and workhouse she followed me and ingratiated herself everywhere and my solitary evenings were much the happier for dear hajin's company many years afterwards she was laid under the sod of our garden in hereford square another dog of the same breed whom i sent away at one year old to live in the country was returned to me eight years afterwards old and diseased the poor beast recognized me after a few moments eager examination and uttered an actual scream of joy when i called her by name exhibiting every token of tender affection for me ever afterwards when one reflects what eight years signify in the life of a dog almost equivalent to the distance between sixteen and sixty in a human being some measure is afforded by this incident of the durability of a dog's attachment happily kind dr hoggan cured poor d of her malady and she and i enjoyed five happy years of companionship ere she died here in hengward i have dedicated my friend of man to her memory among my smaller literary tasks in london i wrote an article for which mr leslie stephen then editing the cornhill magazine in which it appeared was kind enough to express particular liking it was called dogs whom i have met and gave an account of many canine individualities of my acquaintance i also wrote an article in the quarterly review on the consciousness of dogs of which i have given above page one twenty seven mr darwin's favourable opinion both of these papers are reprinted in my false beasts and true such has been the sum total i may say of my personal concern with animals before and apart from my endeavours to deliver them from their scientific tormentors it was as i have stated the abominable wrongs endured by animals which first aroused and has permanently maintained my special interest in them my great-grandfather had an office in the yard at newbridge for his magisterial work and over his seat he caused to be inscribed the text deliver him that is oppressed from the hand of the adversary i know not whether it were a juvenile impression but i have felt all my life an irresistible impulse to rush in wherever any one is oppressed and try to deliver him her or it as the case may be from the adversary in the case of beasts their helplessness and speechlessness appeal i think to every spark of generosity in one's heart and the command open thy mouth for the dumb seems the very echo of our consciences everything in us manly or womanly and the best in us all is both answers it back when i was a little child living in a house where hunting coursing shooting and fishing were carried on by all the men and boys i took such field sports as part of the order of things and learned with delight from my father to fish in our ponds on my own account somehow it came to pass that when at sixteen my mind went through that strange process which evangelicals call conversion among the first things which my freshly awakened moral sense pointed out was that i must give up fishing i reflected that the poor fishes were happy in their way in their proper element that we did not in the least need or indeed often use them for food and that i must no longer take pleasure in giving pain to any creature of god it was a little effort to me to relinquish this amusement in my very quiet uneventful life but as the good quakers say it was borne in on me that i had to do it and from that time i have never held a rod or line though i have been out in boats where large quantities of fish were caught on the atlantic coast and i freely admit that angling scarcely comes under the head of cruelty at all and is perfectly right and justifiable when the fish are wanted for food and are killed quickly i used to stand sometimes after i had ceased to fish over one of the ponds in our park and watch the bright creatures dart hither and thither and say in my heart a little thanksgiving on their behalf instead of trying to catch them fifty years after this incident i read in john woolman's the quaker saints journal chapter eleven this remark 
i believe where the love of god is verily perfected and the true spirit of government watchfully attended a tenderness towards all creatures made subject to us will be experienced and a care felt in us that we do not lessen that sweetness of life in the animal creation which the great creator intends for them under our government to me as i have said it it was almost the first and not an advanced much less perfected religious impulse which led me to begin to recognize the claims of the lower animals on our compassion of course i disliked then and always hunting coursing and shooting but as a woman i was not expected to join in such pursuits and i did not take on myself to blame those who followed them i do not now allow of any comparison between the cruelty of such field sports and the deliberate chamber sport of vivisection i shall now relate as succinctly as possible the history of the anti-vivisection movement so far as i have had to do with it of course an immense amount of work for the same end has been carried on all these twenty years by other zoophilists with whom i have had no immediate connection or perhaps cognizance of their labours but without whose assistance the society which i helped to found certainly could not have made as much way as it has done i only presume here to tell the story of the victoria street society and the occurrences which led to its formation in the year eighteen sixty three there appeared in several english newspapers complaints of the cruelties practised in the veterinary schools at alford near paris the students were taught there as in most other continental veterinary schools to perform operations on living animals and so to acquire at the cost of course of untold suffering to the victims the same manipulative skill which english students gain equally well by practising on dead carcasses living horses were supplied to the alford students on which at the time i speak of they performed sixty operations apiece including every one in common use and many which were purely academic being never employed in actual practice because the horse after enduring them becomes necessarily useless these operations lasted eight hours and the aspect of the mangled creatures hoofless eyeless burned gashed eviscerated skinned mutilated in every conceivable way appalled the visitors who reported the facts while it afforded they said a subject of merriment to the horde of students the english society for prevention of cruelty to animals laudably exerted itself to stop these atrocities and appealed to the emperor to interfere not perhaps very hopefully since as i have heard napoleon the third was in the habit of attending these hideous spectacles in his own imperial person on the thursdays on which they took place this circumstance taken in connection with the empress's patronage of bullfights has made sedan seem to me an event on which the animal world at all events has to be congratulated some years later mr james cowie took over to france an appeal signed by five hundred english veterinarians entreating their french colleagues to adopt the english practice of using only dead carcasses for the exercises of students through this and other good offices it is understood that the number and severity of the operations performed at alfort and elsewhere in france were then greatly reduced unhappily the humane regulations made in eighteen seventy eight are now evaded and the dreadful cruelties above described have been actually witnessed by dr peabody and dr baudry in eighteen ninety five on reading of these cruelties i wrote an article the rights of man and the claims of brutes which i hoped might help to direct public attention to them in this paper i endeavoured to work out as best i could the ethical problem which i at once perceived to be beset with difficulties of a definition of the limits of human rights over animals my article was published by mr froude in fraser's magazine for november eighteen sixty three and was subsequently reprinted in my studies ethical and social it was so far as i know the first effort made to deal with the moral questions involved in the torture of animals either for the sake of scientific and therapeutic research or for the acquirement of manipulative skill in the thirty years which have elapsed since i wrote it i have seen reason to raise considerably the claims which i then urged on behalf of the brutes 
but i observe that new recruits to our anti-vivisection party usually begin exactly where i stood at that time and announce their ideas to me as their mature conclusions the same month of november eighteen sixty three in which my article written some weeks before while i was ill and lame at les bains appeared in fraser i was living near florence and was startled by hearing of similar cruelties practised at the specola where professor schiff had his laboratory my friend miss blagden and i were holding our usual weekly reception in via bricchieri on bellosguardo and we learned that many of our guests had been shocked by the rumours which had reached them in particular the american physician who had accompanied theodore parker to florence and attended him in his last days dr appleton of harvard university told us that he himself had gone over professor schiff's laboratory and had seen dogs pigeons and other animals in a frightfully mangled and suffering state a tuscan officer had seen a cat so tortured that he forced schiff to kill it some fifty or sixty letters had been or were afterwards lodged at the mairie from neighbours complaining of the disturbance caused by the cries and moans of the victims in the specula after much conversation i asked what could be done to check these systematic cruelties which no tuscan law could then touch in any way it was suggested that a memorial should be addressed to professor schiff himself urging him to spare his victims as much as possible this memorial i drafted at once and it was translated into italian and sent round florence for signatures mrs somerville placed her name at the head of it and through her earnest exertions and those of her daughters and of several other friends the list of supporters soon became very weighty among the english signatures was those of walter savage landor who added some words so violent that i was obliged to suppress them and among the italians almost the whole historic aristocracy of old florence corsis and corsinis and aldobrandinis and strozzis and a hundred more the reading of whose names recalled medician times in all there were seven hundred eighty three signatories very few of them were of the mezzocetto class and none belonged to the red republican party schiff was himself a red and as such he might apparently commit any cruelty he thought fit inasmuch as he and the other vivisectors we were told by a lady prominent in that party were seeking the religion of the future in the brains and entrails of the tortured beasts the same lady expressed to me her wish that every animal in creation should be immolated if only to discover a single fact of science another englishwoman also married to a foreigner wrote to the daily news to pray schiff for actively pursuing vivisection the memorial as often happens did no direct good professor schiff tossing it aside and politely qualifying the signatories in the nazione newspaper as un tas de marquis but it certainly caused the subject to be much discussed and doubtless prepared the way for the complaints and lawsuits concerning the nuisances of the moaning dogs which eventually made florence an unpleasant abode for professor schiff he retreated thence to geneva in eighteen seventy seven the florentine societa protatrice degli animali was founded by countess baldelli in eighteen seventy three and has led to the agitation there against vivisection ever since meanwhile on the presentation of the memorial professor schiff wrote a letter in the nazione the chief newspaper of florence denying the facts mentioned in the letter of the official correspondent of the daily news and challenging the said correspondent to come forward and make good the statement i instantly wrote a letter saying that i was the daily news correspondent in florence that the letter complained of was mine and that for verification of my assertions therein i appended a full and signed statement by dr appleton of what he himself witnessed in the specula it was rather difficult for me then to believe that this letter of mine in italian of course duly signed and authenticated with name date and place was refused publication in the paper wherein i had been challenged to come forward on learning this amazing fact i requested dr appleton to go down again to florence and ask the editor of the nazione to publish my letter if in no other way at least as a paid advertisement 
the answer made by the editor to dr appleton was that it might be inserted but only among the advertisements in certain columns of the paper where no decent reader would look for it n b the nazione replenished its exchequer by the help of that class of notices which are declined by every reputable english newspaper after this dr appleton went in despair to professor schiff himself and told him he was bound in honour seeing as he had made the challenge to us to compel the editor to print our answer the learned and scientific gentleman shrugged his shoulders and laughed in the face of the american who could imagine him to be so simple i left florence soon after this first brush with the demon of vivisection but retained as will easily be understood very strong feelings on the subject at a meeting of the british association in liverpool in eighteen seventy a committee was appointed to consider the subject of physiological experimentation and their report was published in the medical times and gazette february twenty fifth eighteen seventy one and in british association reports eighteen seventy one page one forty four it consists of the following four rules or recommendations on the subject of vivisection one no experiment which can be performed under the influence of an anaesthetic ought to be done without it two no painful experiment is justifiable for the mere purpose of illustrating a law or fact already demonstrated in other words experimentation without the employment of anaesthetics is not a fitting exhibition for teaching purposes three whenever for the investigation of new truth it is necessary to make a painful experiment every effort should be made to ensure success in order that the sufferings inflicted may not be wasted for this reason no painful experiment ought to be performed by an unskilled person with insufficient instruments and assistance or in places not suitable to the purpose that is to say anywhere except in physiological and pathological laboratories under proper regulations four in the scientific preparation for veterinary practice operations ought not to be performed upon living animals for the mere purpose of obtaining greater operative dexterity these four rules were countersigned by m a lawson g m humphrey now sir george humphrey j h balfour arthur gamgee william flower j burden sanderson and george rolleston of course we who attended that celebrated liverpool meeting of the british association and had heard the president laud dr brown secard enthusiastically greatly rejoiced at this humane ukase of autocratic science but as time passed we were surprised to find that nothing was done to enforce these rules in any way or at any place and that the particular practice which they most distinctly condemn namely the use of vivisections as illustrations of recognized facts was flourishing more than ever without let or hindrance the prospectuses of university college for eighteen seventy four five of guy's hospital medical school eighteen seventy four five of st thomas's hospital of westminster hospital medical school etc all mentioned among their attractions demonstrations on living animals gentlemen will themselves perform the experiments etc and quite as if nothing whatever had been said against them but worse remained one of the signatories of the above rules or perhaps as we may properly call them these pious opinions the most eminent of english physiologists professor burden sanderson himself edited and brought out in eighteen seventy three the handbook of the physiological laboratory to which he dr lauder brunton dr klein and dr foster were joint contributors this celebrated work is a manual of exercises in vivisection intended as the preface says for beginners in physiological work the following are observations on this book furnished to the royal commission by mr Collum and printed in appendix four page three seventy nine of their report and minutes of evidence that the object of the editor and his coadjutors was to induce young persons to perform experiments on their own account and without adequate surveillance is manifest throughout the work by the supply of elementary knowledge and elaborate data 
not only are the names and quantities of necessary chemicals given but the most careful description is provided in letter press and plates of implements for holding animals during their struggles so that a novice may learn at home without a teacher besides the editor's preface states that the book is intended for beginners and that difficult and complicated experiments consequently have been omitted and that of dr foster allures the students by assurances of inexpensive as well as easy manipulation very seldom indeed is the student told to anesthetize and then only during an operation it cannot be alleged that beginners know when to narcotize and when not but if they do then the few directions to use chloral etc are unnecessary no doubt should have been left out on this point in a handbook designed for beginners besides where will students find cautions against the infliction of unnecessary pain and wanton experimentation on the contrary the student is encouraged to repeat the torture any number of times these facts are significant in the minutes of evidence of the royal commission we find that the late professor rolleston of oxford being under examination was asked by mr hutton then i understand that your opinion about the handbook is that it is a dangerous book to society and that it has warranted to some extent the feeling of anxiety in the public which its publication has created professor rolleston i am sorry to have to say that i do think it is so thirteen fifty one in his own examination professor burden sanderson admitted that the use of anaesthetics whenever possible ought to have been stated much more distinctly at the beginning of his book twenty two sixty five and agreed to lord cardwell's suggestion then i may assume that in any future communication with beginners greater pains will be taken to make them distinctly understand how animals may be saved from suffering than has been taken in this book yes said dr b s I am quite willing to say that. 2266. Esoteric vivisection, it will be observed, as revealed in Handbooks for Beginners, is a very different thing from exoteric vivisection, described for the benefit of the outside public as if regulated by the four rules above quoted. The following year, 1874, certain experiments were performed before a medical congress at Norwich they consisted in the injection of alcohol and of absinthe in the veins of dogs and were done by m magnan an eminent french physiologist who has in recent years described sympathy for animals as a special form of insanity mr Collum, on behalf of the r s p c a very properly instituted a prosecution against m magnan under the act twelve and thirteen victoria c ninety two and brought sir william ferguson and dr tufnell the president of the irish college of surgeons to swear that his experiments were useless m magnon withdrew speedily to his own country or a conviction would certainly have been obtained against him but it was not merely on proof of the infliction of torture that mr Collum's society relied to obtain such conviction but on the high scientific authority which they were able to bring to prove that the torture was scientifically useless failing such testimony which would generally be unattainable it was recognized that the application of the act in question martin's act amended to scientific cruelties which it had not been framed to meet would always be beset with difficulties it became thenceforth apparent to the friends of animals that some new legislation calculated to reach offenders pleading scientific purpose for barbarous experiments was urgently needed and the existence of the handbook with minute directions for performing hundreds of operations many of them of extreme severity proved that the danger was not remote or theoretical but already present and at our doors a few weeks after this trial at norwich had taken place and had justly gained great applause for mr Collum and the r s p c a mrs luther holden wife of the eminent surgeon then senior surgeon of st bartholomew's hospital called on me in hereford square to talk over the matter and take counsel as to what could be done to strengthen the law in the desired direction the great and wealthy r s p c a was obviously the body with which it properly lay to promote the needed legislation 
and it only seemed necessary to give the committee of that society proof that public opinion would strongly support them in calling for it and to induce them to bring a suitable bill into parliament backed by their abundant influence i agreed to draft a memorial to the committee of the r s p c a praying it to undertake this task after learning from mr Collum that such an appeal would be altogether welcome and i may add that i received cordial assistance from him in arranging for its presentation it was a difficult task for me to draw up that memorial but such as it was it acted as a spark to tinder showing how much latent feeling existed on the subject many ladies and gentlemen notably the countess of camperdown the countess of portsmouth now the dowager countess colonel colin mackenzie colonel wood now sir evelyn and others exerted themselves most earnestly to obtain influential signatures in their circles and distributed in all directions copies of the memorial and of two pamphlets i wrote to accompany it reasons for interference and need of a bill with their help in the course of about six weeks without advertisements or paid agency of any kind we obtained six hundred signatures every one of which represented a man or woman of some social importance the first to sign it was my neighbor and friend rev gerald blunt rector of chelsea after him came mr carlyle tennyson browning mr lecky sir arthur helps sir w ferguson john bright mr jewett the archbishop of york dr thompson sir edwin arnold the primate of ireland marcus beresford cardinal manning then archbishop of westminster the duke and duchess of northumberland john ruskin james martineau the duke of rutland the duke of wellington lord coleridge lord selborne sir fitzroy kelly the bishops of winchester exeter salisbury manchester bath and wells hereford st asaph and derry lord russell and many other peers and m p s and no less than seventy-eight medical men several of whom were eminent in the profession i shall insert here a few of the replies favorable and otherwise which i received to my invitations to sign the memorial bishop thorpe york december twenty eighth eighteen seventy four the archbishop of york presents his compliments to miss cobb and begs to enclose the memorial signed by him exception to suggestion third on the prohibition of publishing which he thinks unworkable and therefore illegible to the memorial if however it is not too late to alter it he will not stand out even on that point he thinks the practices in question detestable the norwich case was a disgrace to the country the archbishop thanks miss cobb for inviting him to sign a b beresford hope to miss f p c bedgebury park cranbrook january twenty sixth eighteen seventy five dear madam lady mildred and myself trust that it is not too late to enclose to you the following signatures to the memorial against vivisection although the day fixed for its return has unfortunately been allowed to elapse we can assure you of our very hearty sympathy in the cause the delay has wholly come of oversight in regard to the details of the suggestions i must be allowed to express my doubt as to the feasibility of the third suggestion its stringency would i fear defeat its own object i sympathize too much with the question in itself to decline signing on account of this proposal but i must request to be considered as a dissentient on that head believe me dear madam yours very faithfully a b beresford hope b jewett to miss f p c dear miss cobb i have much pleasure in signing the paper which you have kindly sent me yours very sincerely b jewett january fifteenth oxford five gordon street w c january fifth eighteen seventy five my dear miss cobb i should have been very sorry not to join in the protest against this hideous offence and i am truly obliged to you for furnishing me with the opportunity the simultaneous loss from the morals of our advanced scientific men of all reverent sentiment towards beings above them and towards beings below is a curious and instructive phenomenon highly significant of the process which their nature is undergoing at both ends with truest wishes for many a happy and beneficent year ever faithfully yours james martineau manchester december twenty sixth eighteen seventy four the bishop of manchester dr fraser presents his compliments to miss cobb 
and thanks her for giving him the opportunity of appending his name to this memorial which has his most hearty concurrence palace salisbury eleventh january eighteen seventy five the bishop of salisbury's compliments to miss cobb he cannot withhold his signature to her paper after reading the reasons which she has kindly sent him addington park croydon january second eighteen seventy five madam i have received your letter of the thirty first ultimo on the subject of the memorial to the society for prevention of cruelty to animals with regard to vivisection i hardly think i should be right considering my imperfect acquaintance with the subject in adding my name thereto at present believe me to be yours faithfully a c cantor archbishop tate deanery carlisle january twentieth eighteen seventy five dear madam if i had a hundred signatures you should have them all my heart has long burned with indignation against these murderers and torturers of innocent animals was it for this that the great god made man the lord of the creation it is incredible hypocrisy and folly to pretend that such wholesale torture is necessary to enlighten these stupid doctors it seems to me peculiarly ungrateful in man to break forth in this wholesale animal inquisition when providence has so recently revealed to us several new natural powers whereby human suffering is so much diminished but i must restrain my feelings and you must pardon me i did not know that this good work was begun only get some thoroughgoing and able friend of the animal world to tell the tale to a british house of parliament and these philosophic torturers will be stayed in their detestable course yours f close dean of carlisle twenty seven cornwall gardens s w december thirtieth eighteen seventy four my dear miss cobb i have an impression that the subject of vivisection is to be brought before the senate of the university of london which consists mainly of great physicians and surgeons but of which i am a member hence i think i hardly ought to sign the paper you have sent me this you see is an official answer but i am glad to be able to make it for the truth is i have neither thought nor inquired sufficiently about vivisection to be ready with a clear opinion even if the utmost be proved against the vivisectors i am inclined to think that they ought to be dealt with as guilty of a new offence and not of an old one i do not at all like the notion of bringing old laws such as martin's act against cruelty to animals to bear on a class of cases never contemplated at the time of their enactment it has a certain resemblance to enforcing the old law of blasphemy against persons who discuss christianity in the modern philosophical spirit perhaps i am the more sensitive on this point since a friend elaborately demonstrated to me that i was liable to prosecution for what seemed to me a very innocent passage in a book of mine believe me very truly yours h s maine sir henry sumner maine sixteen george street hanover square w nineteenth december eighteen seventy four dear miss cobb i have affixed my name with much satisfaction to this memorial and i presume you intend that men should be in largest number on the list yours faithfully w ferguson sir william ferguson f r s sergeant surgeon to the king this memorial having a certain importance in the history of our movement i quote the principal paragraphs here the practice of vivisection has received of recent years enormous extension instead of an occasional experiment made by a man of high scientific attainment to determine some important problem of physiology or to test the feasibility of a new surgical operation it has now become the everyday exercise of hundreds of physiologists and young students of physiology throughout europe and america in the latter country lecturers in most of the schools employ living animals instead of dead for ordinary illustrations and in italy one physiologist alone has for some years past experimented on more than eight hundred dogs annually a recent correspondence in the spectator shows that many english physiologists contemplate the indefinite multiplication of such vivisections some as dr pye smith defending them as illustrations of lectures and some as mr ray lancaster frankly avowing that one experiment must lead to another ad infinitum every real or supposed discovery of one physiologist immediately causes the repetition of his experiments by scores of students 
the most numerous and important of these researches being connected with the nervous system the use of complete anaesthetics is practically prohibited even when employed during an operation the effect of the anaesthetic of course shortly ceases and for the completion of the experiment the animal is left to suffer the pain of the laceration to which it has been subjected another class of experiments consists in superinducing some special disease such as alcoholism tried by m magnon on dogs at norwich and the peculiar malady arising from eating diseased pork trichiniasis superinduced on a number of rabbits in germany by dr virchow how far public opinion is becoming deadened to these practices is proved by the frequent recurrence in the newspapers of paragraphs simply alluding to them as matters of scientific interest involving no moral question whatever one such recently appeared in a highly respectable review detailing a french physiologist's efforts first to drench the veins of dogs with alcohol and then to produce spontaneous combustion such experiments as these it is needless to remark cannot be justified as endeavours to mitigate the sufferings of humanity and are rather to be characterised as gratifications of the dilettantism of discovery the recent trial at norwich has established the fact that in a public medical congress and sanctioned by a majority of the members an experiment was tried which has since been formally pronounced by two of the most eminent surgeons in the kingdom to have been cruel and unnecessary we have therefore too much reason to fear that in laboratories less exposed to public view and among inconsiderate young students very much greater abuses take place which call for repression it is earnestly urged by your memorialists that the great and influential royal society for the prevention of cruelty to animals may see fit to undertake the task which appears strictly to fall within its province of placing suitable restrictions on this rapidly increasing evil the vast benefit to the cause of humanity which the society has in the past century effected would in our humble estimation remain altogether one-sided and incomplete if while brutal carters and ignorant costermongers are brought to punishment for maltreating the animals under their charge learned and refined gentlemen should be left unquestioned to inflict far more exquisite pain upon still more sensitive creatures as if the mere allegation of a scientific purpose removed them above all legal or moral responsibility we therefore beg respectfully to urge on the committee the immediate adoption of such measures as may approve themselves to their judgment as most suitable to promote the end in view namely the restriction of vivisection and we trust that it may not be left to others who possess neither the wealth or organization of the royal society for the prevention of cruelty to animals to make such efforts in the same direction as might prove to be in their power it was arranged that the memorial should be presented in german street in a formal manner on the twenty fifth january eighteen seventy five by a deputation introduced by my cousin's husband mr john locke m p q c and consisting of sir frederick elliot lord jocelyn percy general g lawrence mr r h hutton mr leslie stephen dr walker colonel wood now sir evelyn and several ladies prince lucian bonaparte who always warmly befriended the cause took the chair at first and was succeeded by lord harrowby president of the r s p c a supported by lady burdett coutts lord mount temple then mr cooper temple and others after some friendly discussion it was agreed that the committee of the r s p c a would give the subject their most zealous attention and a subcommittee to deal with the matter was accordingly appointed immediately afterwards when i drove home to hereford square from german street that day i rejoiced to think that i had accomplished a step toward obtaining the protection of the law for the victims of science and i fully believed that i was free to return to my own literary pursuits and to the journalism which then occupied most of my time a few days later i was requested to attend for the occasion only the first meeting of the subcommittee for vivisection of the r s p c a on entering the room my spirits sank for i saw round the table a number of worthy gentlemen mostly elderly but not one of the more distinguished members of their committee or i think a single peer or member of parliament 
in short they were not the men to take the lead in such a movement and make a bold stand against the claims of science after a few minutes the chairman himself asked me whether i could not undertake to get a bill into parliament for the object we desired as if all my labor with the memorial had not been spent to make them do this very thing it was obviously felt by others present that this suggestion was out of place and i soon retired leaving the subcommittee to send mr Collum round to make enquiries among the physiologists a mission which might perhaps be represented as a friendly request to be told frankly whether they were really cruel i understood later that he was shown a painless vivisection on a cat and offered a glass of sherry and there so far as i know or ever heard the labours of that subcommittee ended mr Collum afterwards took immense pains to collect evidence from the published works of vivisectors of the extent and severity of their operations and this very valuable mass of materials was presented by him some months later to the royal commission and is published in the blue book as an appendix to their minutes i was of course miserably disappointed at this stage of affairs but on the second february eighteen seventy five there appeared in the morning post the celebrated letter from dr george hoggan in which without naming claude bernard he described what he had himself witnessed in his laboratory when recently working there for several months this letter was absolutely invaluable to our cause giving as it did reality and first-hand testimony to all we had asserted from books and reports in the course of it dr hoggan said i venture to record a little of my own experience in the matter part of which was gained as an assistant in the laboratory of one of the greatest living experimental physiologists in that laboratory we sacrificed daily from one to three dogs besides rabbits and other animals and after four months experience i am of opinion that not one of those experiments on animals was justified or necessary the idea of the good of humanity was simply out of the question and would be laughed at the great aim being to keep up with or get ahead of one's contemporaries in science even at the price of an incalculable amount of torture needlessly and iniquitously inflicted on the poor animals during three campaigns i have witnessed many harsh sights but i think the saddest sight i ever witnessed was when the dogs were brought up from the cellar to the laboratory for sacrifice instead of appearing pleased with the change from darkness to light they seemed seized with horror as soon as they smelt the air of the place divining apparently their approaching fate they would make friendly advances to each of the three or four persons present and as far as eyes ears and tail could make a mute appeal for mercy eloquent they tried it in vain were the feelings of the experimental physiologists not blunted they could not long continue the practice of vivisection they were always ready to repudiate any implied want of tender feeling but i must say that they seldom show much pity on the contrary in practice they frequently show the reverse hundreds of times i have seen when an animal writhed with pain and thereby deranged the tissues during a delicate dissection instead of being soothed it would receive a slap and an angry order to be quiet and behave itself at other times when an animal had endured great pain for hours without struggling or giving more than an occasional low whine instead of letting the poor mangled wretch loose to crawl painfully about the place in reserve for another day's torture it would receive pity so far that it would be said to have behaved well enough to merit death and as a reward would be killed at once by breaking up the medulla with a needle or pithing as this operation is called i have often heard the professor say when one side of an animal had been so mangled and the tissues so obscured by clotted blood that it was difficult to find the part searched for why don't you begin on the other side or why don't you take another dog what is the use of being so economical one of the most revolting features in the laboratory was the custom of giving an animal on which the professor had completed his experiment and which had still some life left to the assistants to practice the finding of arteries nerves etc in the living animal or for performing what are called fundamental experiments upon it in other words repeating those which are recommended in the laboratory handbooks i am inclined to look upon anaesthetics as the greatest curse to vivisectable animals 
they alter too much the normal conditions of life to give accurate results and they are therefore little depended upon they indeed prove far more efficacious in lulling public feeling towards the vivisectors than pain in the vivisected i had met dr hoggan one day just before this occurrence at madame bodichon's house but i had no idea that he would or could bear such valuable testimony and i have never ceased to feel that in thus nobly coming forward to offer it spontaneously he struck the greatest blow on our side in the whole battle of course i expressed to him all the gratitude i felt and we thenceforth took counsel frequently as to the policy to be pursued in opposing vivisection it soon became evident that if a bill were to be presented to parliament that session it must be promoted by some parties other than the committee of the r s p c a indeed in the following december the animal world in a leading article avowed that the royal society p c a is not so entirely unanimous as to desire the passing of any special legislative enactment on this subject vivisection feeling convinced that some such obstacle was in the way i turned to my friends to see if it might be possible to push on a bill independently and with the most kind help of sir william hart dyke the conservative whip it was arranged that a bill for regulating the practice of vivisection should be introduced with the sanction of government into the house of lords by lord henniker lord hardismer it is impossible to describe all the anxiety i endured during the interval up to the fourth may when this bill was actually presented lord henniker was exceedingly good about it and took much pains with the draft prepared at first by sir frederick elliot and afterwards completed for lord henniker by mr fitzgerald lord coleridge also took great interest in it and gave most valuable advice and mr lowe who afterwards bitterly opposed the almost identical measure of lord cross in the commons was willing to give this earlier bill much consideration i met him one day at luncheon at airly lodge where were also lord henniker lady minto lord airly and others interested and the bill was gone over clause by clause till adjusted to mr lowe's counsels lord henniker introduced the bill thus drafted for regulating the practice of vivisection into the house of lords on the fourth may eighteen seventy five but on the twelfth may to our great surprise another bill to prevent abuse and experiments on animals was introduced into the house of commons by dr now lord playfair on the appearance of this latter bill which was understood to be promoted by the physiologists themselves notably by dr burden sanderson and by mr charles darwin the government which had sanctioned lord henniker's bill thought it necessary to issue a royal commission of enquiry into the subject before any legislation should be proceeded with this was done accordingly on the twenty second june and both bills were then withdrawn the student of this old chapter of the history of the anti-vivisection crusade will find both of the above-named bills and also the ineffective sketch of what might have been the bill of the r s p c a in the appendix to the report of the royal commission pages three thirty six to three thirty eight mr charles darwin in a letter to the times april eighteenth eighteen eighty one said that he took an active part in trying to get a bill passed such as would have removed all just cause of complaint and at the same time would have left the physiologists free to pursue their researches a bill very different from that which has since been passed as mr darwin's biographer while reprinting this letter has not quoted my challenge to him in the times of the twenty third to point out in what respect the former bill is very different from the act of eighteen seventy six i think it well to cite here the lucid definition of that difference as delineated in the spectator of may fifteenth doubtless by the editor mr hutton the vivisection restriction bills on wednesday afternoon last dr lyon playfair laid on the table of the house of commons a bill for the restriction of vivisection which has been drawn up by physiologists no doubt in part in the interest of physiological science but also in part no doubt in the interest of humanity the contents of this bill are the best answer which it is possible to give to the ignorant attack made in a daily contemporary on tuesday on lord henniker's bill introduced into the house of lords last week the two bills differ in principle only on one important point both of them clearly have been maturely considered by men of science as well as by humanitarians both of them assume the great and increasing character of the evil which has to be dealt with 
both of them approach that evil in the same manner by insisting that scientific experiments which are painful to animals should be tried only on the avowed responsibility of men of the highest education whose right to try them may be withdrawn if it be abused both of them aim at compelling the physiologists who are permitted to try such experiments at all to use anaesthetics throughout the experiment whenever the use of anaesthetics is not fatal to the investigation itself the bills differ however on a most important point it is certain that all the contempt showered on lord henniker's bill by the ignorant assailants of the humanitarian party might equally have been showered on dr lyon playfair's but lord henniker's bill contemplates making physiological and pathological experiments on living animals even under complete anaesthesia illegal except under the same responsibility and on the same conditions as those experiments which are not and cannot be conducted under complete anaesthesia while dr lyon playfair leaves all experiments conducted under anaesthetics and will practically though not theoretically leave we fear those which only profess to be so conducted a very different thing as utterly without restriction as they now are indeed it attempts no sort of limitation upon them if a whole hecatomb of guinea-pigs or even dogs were known to be imported and their carcasses exported daily from the private house of any man who declared that he always used anaesthetics dr playfair's bill provides we believe no sort of machinery by which the truth of his assertion could even be tested it is however no small matter to have obtained this clear admission on scientific authority that the victimization of animals in the interest of science is an evil of growing and serious kind which needs legislative interference and calls for at least the threat of serious penalties in short the bill promoted by the physiologists and mr darwin was like the resolutions of the liverpool british association a pious opinion or brutum fulman nothing more end of section twenty eight section twenty nine of life of francis power cobb is told by herself by francis power cobb this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty the claims of brutes part two the royal commission on vivisection was issued as i have said on the twenty second june eighteen seventy five and the report was dated january eighth eighteen seventy six the intervening months were filled with anxiety i heard constantly all that went on at the commission and my hopes and fears rose and fell week by week of the constitution of the commission much might be said writing of it in the british friend may eighteen seventy six the late mr j b firth m p q c remarked if it were possible for a royal commission to be appointed to acquire into the practice of thuggy i should have very little confidence in their report if one-third of the commissioners were prominent practisers of the art on the same principle the constitution of this commission is open to the observation that it included two notorious advocates of vivisection dr erickson and professor huxley both of whom had to explain their writings and practices in connection with it in the course of the inquiry certain it is as i heard at the time and as any one may verify by looking over the minutes of evidence these two able gentlemen acted not as judges on the bench examining evidence dispassionately but as exceedingly vigorous and keen-eyed counsel for the physiologists on the humanitarian side there was but a single pronounced opponent of vivisection mr r h hutton who nobly sacrificed his time for half a year to doing all that was in the power of a single member of the commission and he a layman to elicit the truth concerning the alleged cruelty of the practice at the end after receiving a mass of evidence in answer to three thousand seven hundred sixty four questions from fifty three witnesses the commission reported distinctly in favor of legislative interference they say even if the weight of authority on the side of legislative interference had been less considerable we should have thought ourselves called upon to recommend it by the reason of the thing 
it is manifest that the practice is from its very nature liable to great abuse and since it is impossible for society to entertain the idea of putting an end to it it ought to be subjected to due regulation and control it is not to be doubted that inhumanity may be found in persons of very high position as physiologists besides the cases in which inhumanity exists we are satisfied that there are others in which carelessness and indifference prevail to an extent sufficient to form a ground for legislative interference yet in the face of these and other weighty sentences to the same purpose it has been persistently asserted that the royal commission exonerated english physiologists from all charge of cruelty in mr darwin's celebrated letter to professor holmgren of upsala published in the times april eighteen eighty one he said the investigation of the matter by a royal commission proved that the accusations made against our english physiologists were false commenting on this letter the spectator april twenty third eighteen eighty one doubtless mr hutton himself observed the royal commission did not report this they came to no such conclusion and though that may be mr darwin's own inference from what they did say it is only his inference not theirs in our opinion it was proved that very great cruelty had been practised with hardly any appreciable results by more than one british physiologist nor must it be left out of sight in estimating the disingenuousness of the advocates of vivisection that the above quoted sentences from the report of the commission were countersigned by those representatives of science professor huxley and mr erickson as were of course also the subsequent paragraphs formally recommending a measure almost identical with lord carnarvon's bill in spite of this the vivisecting clique has not ceased to assert that english physiologists were exculpated and to protest against the measure which we introduced in strict accordance with that recommendation a measure which was even still further mitigated as regarded freedom to the vivisectors under the pressure of their deputation to the home office till it became the present quasi ineffectual act while the royal commission was still sitting in the autumn and when it had become obvious that much would remain to be done before any effectual check could be placed on vivisection dr hoggins suggested to me that we should form a society to carry on the work i abhorred societies and knew only too well the huge additional labour of working the machinery of one over and above any direct help to the object in view i had hitherto worked independently and freely taking always the advice of the eminent men who were so good as to counsel me at every step but i felt that this plan could not suffice much longer and that the authority of a formally constituted society was needed to make headway against an evil which daily revealed itself as more formidable accordingly i agreed with dr hoggan that we should do well to form such a society he and i being the honorary secretaries provided we could obtain the countenance of some men of eminence to form the nucleus i will write i said to lord shaftesbury and to the archbishop of york if they will give me their names we can conjure with them if not i will not undertake to form a society i wrote that night to those two eminent persons i received next day from lord shaftesbury a telegram which he must have dispatched instantly on receiving my letter which answered yes next day the post brought from him the letter which i shall here print the next post brought also the letter from archbishop thompson thus the society consisted for two days of lord shaftesbury the archbishop dr hoggan and myself lord shaftesbury to miss f p c st giles house cranburn salisbury november seventeenth eighteen seventy five dear miss cobb it is needful i am sure to found a society in order to have unity and persistency of action i judge by the terms of the circular that the object of the society will be restriction and not prohibition possibly this end is as much as you will be able to attain prohibition i doubt not would be evaded but restriction will i am certain be exceeded not but that a little is better than nothing but you will find many who will think with much show of reason that by surrendering the principle you have surrendered the great argument 
faithfully yours shaftesbury bishop thorpe york november sixteenth eighteen seventy five my dear miss cobb i am quite ready to join the society for restricting vivisection i agree with you total prohibition would be impossible i am yours very truly w eber with these names to conjure with as i have said we found it easy to enroll a goodly company in the ranks of our new society cardinal manning was one of the first to join us on the second december eighteen seventy five the first committee meeting was held in the house of dr and mrs hoggan thirteen granville place portman square mr stanfeld taking the chair mrs wedgwood wife of mr hensley wedgwood and mother of my friend miss julia wedgwood was present at that first meeting and so long as her health permitted at those which followed a worthy example of heredity since her father and mother sir james and lady mackintosh had been among the principal supporters of richard martin and founders of the r s p c a at the third meeting of the committee on february eighteenth eighteen seventy six lord shaftesbury took the chair for the first time and again he took it on the occasion of a memorable meeting on the first of march but vacated it on the arrival of archbishop thompson who proved to be an admirably efficient chairman we had a serious job that day that of discussing the statement of our position and objects i had drafted this statement in preparation as well as compiled from the minutes of evidence a series of extracts exhibiting the extension and abuses of vivisection and also evidence regarding anaesthetics and regarding foreign physiologists these appendices were all accepted and appear in the pamphlet but my statement was most minutely debated clause for clause and at last adopted not without several modifications after summarizing the report of the royal commission which has been in some respect seriously misconstrued i might add persistently misconstrued ever since and also mr hutton's independent report in which he desired that the household animals should be exempted from vivisection the committee carefully criticized this report and expressed their confident hope that a bill may be introduced immediately by government to carry out the recommendations of the commission they observe in conclusion that they find a just summary of their sentiments in mr hutton's expression of his view the measure will not at all satisfy my own conceptions of the needs of the case unless it result in putting an end to all experiments involving not merely torture but anything at all approaching thereto such was our attitude at that memorable date when we commenced the regular steady work which has now gone on for just eighteen years on the second or third of march i took possession of the offices where so large a part of my life was henceforth to be spent when my kind colleagues had left me and i locked the outer door of the offices and knew myself to be alone i resolved very seriously to devote myself so long as might be needful to this work of trying to save god's poor creatures from their intolerable doom and i resolved never to go to bed at night leaving a stone unturned which might help to stop vivisection i believe i have kept that resolution i commend it to other workers it may interest the reader to know who were the persons then actually aiding and supporting our movement there was first and most important my colleague and friend dr george hoggan who laboured incessantly and wholly gratuitously for the cause his wife dr francis hoggan whom i am thankful to say still survives was also a most useful member of the committee the other members of the executive were sir frederick elliot k c m g who had long been permanent secretary at the colonial office major-general colin mackenzie a noble old hero of the afghan wars and the mutiny mr leslie stephen mr hensley wedgwood dr vaughan the late master of the temple the countess of portsmouth the countess of camperdown my friend miss lloyd my cousin mr locke m p q c dr william shane colonel now sir evelyn wood and mr edward de fonblanc the latter gentleman was one of the most useful members of the committee whose retirement three years later after our adoption of a more advanced policy i have never ceased to regret besides these members of the committee we had then as vice-presidents the archbishop of york the marquis of butte cardinal manning 
lord portsmouth mr cooper temple afterwards lord mount temple right honourable james stansfeld lord shaftesbury the bishop of gloucester and bristol dr ellicott the bishop of manchester dr fraser lord chief justice coleridge and the lord chief baron sir fitzroy kelly dr hawken had invited mr spurgeon to join our society but received from him the following reply rev c h spurgeon to dr hawken nightingale lane clapham december twenty fourth dear sir i do not like to become an officer of a society for i have no time to attend to the duties of such an office and it strikes me as a false system which is now so general which allows names to appear on committees and requires no service from the individuals in all efforts to spare animals from needless pain i wish you the utmost success there are cases in which they must suffer as we also must but not one pang ought to be endured by them from which we can screen them yours heartily c h spurgeon i shall aid your effort in my own way mr spurgeon wrote on one occasion a letter to lord shaftesbury to be read from the chair at a meeting but much as we wished to use it the extreme strength of the expletives was considered to transgress the borders of expediency we invited professor rolleston to give us his support the following was his reply oxford november twenty eighth eighteen seventy five dear miss cobb i would have answered your letter before had i been able to make up my mind to do as you ask this however i think i should not in the interests of the line of legislation which i advocate do well to do i believe i speak with greater weight from keeping an independent position and as i have a great desire to throw away none of the advantages which that position gives me i am obliged to decline your invitation allow me to say that i am much gratified by your writing to ask me to do what i decline to do out of considerations of expediency it is also a great pleasure to me to think that what i said at bristol has met with your approbation the bearing of parts at the end or towards the end of that address upon the future of vivisection was i hope tolerably obvious i am yours very truly george rolleston the newly formed society had been clumsily named by dr hoggan the society for protection of animals liable to vivisection and its aim was to obtain the greatest possible protection for animals liable to vivisection i was obliged to yield to my colleague as regarded this awkward title which exactly defined the position he desired to take up but it was a constant source of worry and loss to us as soon as possible however after we had taken our offices in victoria street i called our society unofficially and for popular use simply the victoria street society these offices are large and handsome and so conveniently situated that the society has retained them ever since they are on the first floor of a house formerly numbered one now numbered twenty in victoria street ten or eleven doors up the street from the broad sanctuary in the westminster palace hotel and with westminster abbey and the towers of the houses of parliament in view from the street door the offices contain an ante-room now piled with our papers a large airy room with two windows for the clerks a secretary's private room and a spacious and lightsome committee room with three windows out of this last another room was accessible which at one time was taken for my especial use i put up bookshelves pictures curtains and various little feminine relaxations and thus covered as far as might be the frightful character of our work so that friends should find our office no painful place to visit we did not let the grass grow under our feet after we had settled down in these offices on the twentieth march there went out from them to the neighbouring home office a deputation to mr now lord cross to urge the government to bring a bill in accordance with the recommendations of the royal commission the deputation was headed by lord shaftesbury and included the earl of minto cardinal manning mr froude mr mundella sir frederick elliot colonel evelyn wood and mr cooper temple mr carlyle was to have joined the deputation but held back sooner than accompany the cardinal 
chief baron kelly wrote us the following cordial expressions of regret for non-attendance western circuit winchester fourth march eighteen seventy six the lord chief baron presents his compliments to miss cobb and very greatly regrets that being engaged at the assize on the western circuit until nearly the middle of april he will be unable to accompany the deputation to mr cross on the subject of vivisection to which however he earnestly wishes success we had invited canon Lydon, who was a subscriber to our funds from the first to join this deputation but received from him the following reply amon court sixth march eighteen seventy six my dear miss cobb i should be sincerely glad to be able to obey your kind wishes in the matter of the proposed deputation if i could but i am unable to be in london again between to-morrow and april first and this i fear will make it impossible i shall be sincerely glad to hear that the deputation succeeds in persuading the home secretary to make legislation on the report of the vivisection commission a government question mr hutton appeared to me to resist the blank criticisms of the times on the report very admirably thanking you for your note i am my dear miss cobb yours very truly h p Lydon. a few weeks afterwards when i invited him to attend a meeting he wrote again a letter to the last sentence of which i desire to call attention as embodying the opinion of this eminent man on the human moral interest involved in our crusade christ church oxford may twenty second eighteen seventy six my dear miss cobb i sincerely wish that i could obey your summons but as a professor here i have public duties on thursday the first of june which i cannot decline or transfer to other hands i think i told you i was a useless person for these good purposes and so you see it is still you are very well off in the way of speakers and will not miss such a person as i heartily do i hope that the meeting may reward the trouble you have taken about it by strengthening lord carnarvon's hands the cause you have at heart is of even greater importance to human character than to the physical comfort of those of our fellow-creatures who are most immediately concerned i am my dear miss cobb yours very truly h p Lydon. the deputation of march twentieth to the home office was most favorably received and our society was invited to submit to government suggestions respecting the provisions of the intended bill these suggestions were framed at a committee held at our office on the thirtieth march and they were adopted by government after being approved by its official advisers and presented by lord carnarvon in the house of lords the second reading took place on the twenty second may on that occasion lord coleridge made a most judicious speech in defence of the bill and lord shaftesbury the long and beautiful one reprinted in our pamphlet in memoriam the next morning all the newspapers came out with leading articles in praise of the bill it is hard now to realize that previous to undergoing the medical pressure which has twisted the minds or at least the pens of three-fourths of the press even the great paper which has been our relentless opponent for seventeen years was then our cordial supporter everything at that time looked fair for us the bill as we had drafted it did practically fulfil mr hutton's aspiration no experiment whatever under any circumstances was permitted on a dog cat horse ass or mule nor on any other animal except under conditions of complete anaesthesia from beginning to end the bill included licenses but no certificates dispensing with the above provisions our hopes of carrying this bill seemed amply justified by the reception it received from the house of lords and the press and from a great conference of the r s p c a and its branches held on the twenty third may we held our first general meeting at westminster palace hotel on the first june and resolutions in support of the bill were passed enthusiastically lord shaftesbury presiding and the marquis of bute lord glasgow cardinal manning and others speaking with great spirit it only needed to all appearance that the bill should be pushed through its final stage in the lords and sent down to the house of commons to secure its passage intact that same session 
at this most critical moment and through the whole month of june lord carnarvon in whose hands the bill lay was drawn away from london and occupied by the illness and death of lady carnarvon no words can tell the anxiety and alarm this occasioned us when we learned that a large section of the medical profession which had so far seemed quiescent if not approving had been roused by their chief wire-puller into a state of exasperation at the supposed insult of proposing to submit them to legal control and experimenting on living animals as they were already subjected to it by the anatomy act in dissecting dead bodies these doctors to the number of three thousand signed a memorial to the home secretary calling on him to modify the bill so as practically to reverse its character and make it a measure no longer protecting vivisected animals from torture but vivisectors from prosecution under martin's act this memorial was presented on the tenth july by a deputation variously estimated at three hundred and at eight hundred doctors who in either case were sufficiently numerous to overflow the purlieus of the home office and to overawe mr cross on the tenth of august the bill essentially altered in submission to the medical memorialists was brought by dr cross into the house of commons and was read a second time on the fifteenth august eighteen seventy six it received the royal assent and became the act thirty nine forty victoria c seventy seven commonly called the vivisection act the world has never seemed to me quite the same since that dreadful time my hopes had been raised so high to be dashed so low as even to make me fear that i had done harm instead of good and brought fresh danger to the hapless brutes for whose sake as i realized more and more their agonies i would have gladly died i was baffled in an aim nearer to my heart than any other had ever been and for which i had strained every nerve for many months and of all the hundreds of people who had seemed to sympathize and had signed our memorials and petitions there was none to say this shall not be justice and mercy seemed to have gone from the earth we left london the session and the summer being over and came as usual to wales but our enjoyment of the beauty of this lovely land had in great measure vanished even after twenty years my friend and i look back to our joyous summers before that miserable one and say ah that was when we knew very little of vivisection in my despair i wrote several letters of bitter reproach to friends in parliament who had allowed our bill to be so mutilated as that the british medical journal crowed over it as affording full liberty to science and i also wrote to several newspapers saying that after this failure to obtain a reasonable restrictive bill i for one should labor henceforth to obtain total prohibition in reply to my letter i fear a very petulant one lord shaftesbury wrote me this full and important explanation which i commend to the careful reading of such of our friends as desire now to rescind the act of eighteen seventy six castle weems weems bay n b august sixteenth eighteen seventy six dear miss cobb until we shall have seen the act in print we cannot form a just estimate of the force of the amendments some few so i see by the papers were introduced in committee after my last interview with mr cross but of their character i know nothing i am disposed however to believe that he would not have admitted anything of real importance mr cross's difficulties were very great at all times but they increased much as the session was drawing to a close the want of time the extreme pressure of business the active malignity of the scientific men and the indifference of his colleagues left the secretary of state in a very weak and embarrassing position your letter which i have just received asks whether the bill cannot be turned out in the house of lords the reply is that whether advisable or unadvisable it cannot now be done for the parliament is prorogued in the bill as submitted to me just before the second reading at a final interview with mr cross mr holt and lord cardwell being present some changes were made which i by no means approved but the question then was simply the bill is propounded or no bill 
for mr cross stoutly maintained that without the alterations suggested he had no hope of carrying anything at all i reverted therefore to my first opinion stated at the very commencement of my cooperation with your committee that it was of great importance nay indispensable to obtain a bill however imperfect which should condemn the practice put a limit on the exercise of it and give us a foundation on which to build amendments hereafter as evidence and opportunity shall be offered to us the bill is of that character i apprehended that if there were no bill then there would be none at any time no private member i believe and i still believe could undertake such a measure with even a shadow of hope and there was more than doubt whether a secretary of state would again entangle himself with so bitter and so wearisome a question in the face of all science and the antipathies of most of his colleagues public sympathy would have declined and would not have easily been aroused a second time the public sympathy at its best was only noisy and not effective and this assertion is proved by the few signatures to petitions compared with the professed feeling and by the extreme difficulty to raise any funds in proportion to the exigency of the case the evidence too given to the commission which was after all our main reliance would have grown stale and the physiologists would have taken good care that for some time at least nothing should transpire to take its place we have gained an enactment that experiments shall be performed by none but licensed persons thereby excluding should the act be well enforced the host of young students in their bedchamber practices we have gained an enactment that all experiments shall be performed under the influence of anaesthetics and thirdly the greatest enactment of all that the secretary of state is responsible for the due execution of all these provisions in parliament and in his office instead of the college of physicians or some such unreachable and intangible body as many secretaries of state except mr cross would have evasively appointed this provision under the statutes so unexpected and valuable could have been suggested to parliament by a secretary of state only and i feel sure that no secretary of state in any liberal administration would listen to the proposal and i very much doubt whether mr cross himself had his present bill been rejected would have in the case of a new bill repeated his offer of making it a measure for which the cabinet has to answer i have seen your letter to the echo in the daily news you are quite justified in your determination to agitate the country on the subject of vivisection and obtain if it be possible the total abolition of it such an issue may be within reach and it is only by experience that we can ascertain how far such a blessed consummation is practicable you will have a good deal of sympathy with your efforts and from no one more than from myself yours truly shaftesbury when we all returned to town in october the committee placed on the minutes a letter from me saying that i could only retain the office of honorary secretary if the society should adopt the principle of total prohibition a circular was sent out calling for votes on the point and by the twenty second november eighteen seventy six the resolution was carried that the society would watch the existing act with a view to the enforcement of its restrictions and its extension to the total prohibition of painful experiments on animals in february eighteen seventy seven the committee to my satisfaction unanimously agreed to support mr holt's bill for total prohibition and in aid thereof exhibited on the hoardings of london seventeen hundred handbills and three hundred posters which were enlarged reproductions of the illustrations of vivisection from the physiological handbooks these posters certainly were more effective than as many thousands of speeches and pamphlets and the indignation of the scientific party sufficiently proved that such was the case on the twenty seventh april we held our second annual meeting in support of mr holt's bill and had for speakers lord shaftesbury the good bishop of winchester dr harold brown now alas dead lord mount temple professor sheldon amos cardinal manning and prince lucien bonaparte the last remarkable man and erudite scholar 
who most closely resembled his uncle in person if we could imagine napoleon i commanding only armies of books was from first to last a warm friend of our cause after this meeting we elected him vice-president and here is his letter of acknowledgment prince lucien bonaparte to miss f p c six norfolk terrace bayswater fourth may eighteen seventy seven my dear miss cobb i feel highly honored at being nominated one of the vice-presidents of the society for protection of animals liable to vivisection and ask you to return the committee my best thanks i am a great admirer of a society which like yours opposes so strongly the abominable practice of vivisection because for my own part i consider it even in its mildest form as a shame to science a dishonor to modern civilization and what i think more important a great offence against the law of god believe me my dear miss cobb yours very sincerely l bonaparte here are some further letters concerned with that meeting or written to me soon afterwards christ church oxford march twenty sixth eighteen seventy seven my dear miss cobb i beg to thank you sincerely for your kind letter so far as i can see there is i fear little chance of my being at liberty to take part in the proceedings on the twenty seventh of april however with the names which you announce you will be more than able to dispense with any assistance that i could lend to the common object you will i trust be able to strengthen mr holt's hands if what i have heard of his measure is at all accurate it seems to be at once moderate and efficient i was much struck by an observation which you were i think said to have made the other day at bristol to the effect that as matters now stand everything depends upon the discretion or rather upon the moral sympathies of the home secretary mr cross i believe would always do well in all such matters but it does not do to reckon with the roman empire as if it were always to be governed by a marcus aurelius i am my dear miss cobb yours very truly h p lydon house of commons twenty sixth march dear miss cobb i am sorry i cannot undertake to speak at your meeting on the twenty seventh april i am not sure that i shall be in london on that day but request you to send me any notice of the meeting my time and strength are somewhat overtaxed owing to an inability and i may add indisposition to say no when i think i may be useful i am however i can assure you in sympathy with you in your attempt to put down torture in every form i am yours very sincerely s morley samuel morley m p my dear miss cobb i will come in at some stage of your proceedings i am bound first to convocation and am engaged at kingston before five what i should like would be to thank lord shaftesbury but this must depend on the time that i come and that must depend on the exigencies of convocation yours truly a p stanley the dean of westminster april twenty fifth eighteen seventy seven my dear miss cobb i am very sorry that through absence from home my answer to your note has been delayed i shall not be able to take part in your meeting on the twenty seventh for i am not in a state of health to take part in any public meeting but if i am at all able i should like much to attend it and hear for myself the views of the speakers i have not expressed publicly any opinion on the question of vivisection being anxious at first to await the determination of the commission and then to see how the restrictions were likely to work i confess that my own mind is leaning very strongly to the conclusion that there is no safe right course other than entire prohibition the more i think of it the more i dread the brutality which in spite of the influence of the best men will inevitably be developed in our young experimenters in these days of almost fanatical devotion to scientific research it seems to me to more than counterbalance the physical advantages to our sick what may grow out of the practice of vivisection and i am very sceptical about these physical advantages i doubt whether the secrets of nature can be successfully discovered by torture any more than the secrets of hearts we have abandoned the one endeavour finding the results to be by no means worth the cost i am persuaded that we shall soon for the same reason have to abandon the other i am not able as i say to take part in a meeting 
but as soon as i am able i intend to preach on the subject and if you can forward to me any information which will be useful i shall be much obliged to you believe me ever my dear miss cobb yours very faithfully j baldwin brown rev j b brown by this time there were two other anti-vivisection societies in london besides mr jesse's society at macclesfield all working for total prohibition and though of course we had various small difficulties and rivalries in the course of time yet practically we all helped each other in the cause eventually the international society of which mr and mrs adlam were the spirited leaders coalesced with ours and added to our committee several of its most valuable members including our present much-respected chairman, Mr. Ernest Bell. The London Anti-Vivisection Society, though I expended all my blandishments on it, has never consented to amalgamation, but has done a great work of its own for which we all have reason to hold it in honour. The revolt against the cruelties of science spread also about this time to the continent, baron weber read his torture chamber of science in dresden and created thereby a great sensation followed by the formation of the german league of which he is president and the foundation of its organ the tiers und menschen freund edited by dr paul forster now a member of the reichstag other anti-vivisection societies were founded then or in subsequent years in hanover in berlin and in stockholm in copenhagen those devoted friends of animals monsieur and madame lembeck had long contended vigorously against the local vivisector panem in italy the florence societa protettrice of which our queen is patroness and countess baldelli the indefatigable honourable secretary has steadily worked against vivisection from its foundation and so has the tornanese society of which dr riboli is president and countess biandrate morelli the leading member in rica there has also been a persevering movement against vivisection by the excellent society of which the anval tertiaire is the first-class organ and madame v schilling the presiding spirit in short by the end of the decade though we had been so cruelly defeated we were conscious that our movement had extended and had become to all appearances one of those permanent agitations which once begun go on till the abuses which aroused them are abolished in america the movement only took definite shape in february eighteen eighty three when under the auspices of the indefatigable mrs white the american anti-vivisection society was founded at philadelphia to be followed up by its most flourishing illinois branch carried on with immense spirit by mrs fairchild allen mr peabody and mr green have since established at boston the new england anti-vivisection society which has already become one of our most powerful allies on the second may mr holt's bill for total prohibition was debated in the house of commons and on a division there were eighty-three votes in its favour and two hundred twenty-two against it at last the committee of the victoria street society formally adopted the thoroughgoing policy and at a meeting august seventh eighteen seventy eight resolved to appeal henceforth to public opinion in favour of the total prohibition of vivisection we then changed our title to that of the society for protection of animals from vivisection dr hoggen and his wife mrs hoggen m d and also mr de fonblanc retired from the committee with cordial good will on both sides and the archbishop of york withdrew from the vice-presidency but besides these losses i do not believe that we had any others and there was soon a large batch of fresh recruits of new members who had long resented our previous half-hearted policy as they considered it to have been for my own part i had accepted from the outset the assurance i received on all hands that a bill for the total prohibition of vivisection had not the remotest chance of passing through parliament in the present state of public opinion but that a bill might be framed which proceeding only on the grounds of restriction might effectually and thoroughly exclude not only torture but anything at all approaching thereto and that such a bill had every chance of becoming law to promote such a bill had been my single aim and hope and when it had been prepared and presented and received so favourably it really appeared as if we were on the right and reasonable tack much as we hated any concession whatever to the demands of the vivisectors 
but when we found that the compromise which we proposed had failed and that our bill providing the minimum of protection for animals at all acceptable by their friends was twisted into a bill protecting their tormentors we were driven to raise our demands to the total prohibition of the practice and to determine to work upon that basis for any number of years till public opinion be ripe for our measure this was one aspect of our position but there was another we had in truth gone into this crusade almost as our forefathers had set off for the holy land with scarcely any knowledge of the power which we were invading we knew that dreadful cruelties had been done but we fondly imagined they were abuses which were separable from the practice of experimenting on living animals we accepted blindly the representation of vivisection by its advocates as a rare resource of baffled surgeons and physicians intent on some discovery for the immediate benefit of humanity or the solution of some pressing and important physiological problem and we thought that with due and well-considered restrictions and safeguards on these occasional experiments we might effectually shut out cruelty by slow very slow degrees we learned that nothing was much further from the truth than these fancy pictures of ideal vivisection and that real vivisection is not the occasional and regretfully adopted resource of a few but the daily employment carl vogt called it his daily bread of hundreds of men and students devoted to it as completely and professionally as butchers to cutting up carcasses finally we found that to extend protection by any conceivable act of parliament to animals once delivered to the physiologists in their laboratories was chimerical vivisection we recognized at last to be a method of research which may be either sanctioned or prohibited as a method but which cannot be restricted efficiently by rules founded on humane considerations wholly irrelevant to the scientific inquiry on the moral side also we became profoundly impressed with the truth of the principle to which canon Lydon refers in the letter i have quoted viz that the anti-vivisection cause is of even greater importance to human character than to the physical comfort of our fellow-creatures who are most immediately concerned as i wrote of it about this time in bernard's martyrs we stand face to face with a new vice new at least in its vast modern development and the passion wherewith it is pursued the vice of scientific cruelty it is not the old vice of cruelty for cruelty's sake it is not the careless brutal cruelty of the half-savage drunken drover the low ruffian who skins living cats for gain or of the classic roman or modern spaniard watching the sports of the arena with fierce delight in the sight of blood and death the new vice is nothing of this kind it is not like most other human vices hot and thoughtless the man possessed by it is calm cool deliberate perfectly cognizant of what he is doing understanding as indeed no other man understands the full meaning and extent of the waves and spasms of agony he deliberately creates it does not seize the ignorant or hunger-driven or brutalized classes but the cultivated the well-fed the well-dressed the civilized and it is said the otherwise kindly disposed and genial men of science forming part of the most intellectual circles in europe sometimes it would appear as we read of these horrors the baking alive of dogs the slow dissecting out of quivering nerves and so on that it would be a relief to picture the doer of such deeds as some unhappy half-witted wretch hideous and filthy and mean or stupefied by drink so that the full responsibility of a rational and educated human being should not belong to him and that we might say of him he scarcely understands what he does but alas this new vice has no such palliations and is exhibited not by such unhappy outcasts but by some of the very foremost men of our time men who would think scornfully of being asked to share the butcher's honest trade men addicted to high speculation on all the mysteries of the universe men who hope to found the religion of the future 
and to leave the impress of their minds upon their age and upon generations yet to be born regarding the matter from this point of view as our leaders the most eminent philanthropists of their generation lord shaftesbury lord mount temple samuel morley and cardinal manning emphatically did the reasons for calling for the total prohibition of vivisection rather than for its restriction became actually clearer in our eyes on the side of the human moral interests than on the side of the physical interests of the poor brutes we felt that so long as the practice should be sanctioned at all so long the vice of scientific cruelty would spring up in the fresh minds of students and be kept alive everywhere it was therefore absolutely needful to reach the germ of the disease and not merely to endeavour to allay the worst symptoms and outbreaks it is the passion itself which needs to be sternly suppressed and this can only be done by stopping altogether the practice which is its outcome and on which it feeds and grows but say our opponents are you prepared to relinquish all the benefits which this practice brings to humanity at large our answer to them of course is that we question the reality of those benefits altogether but that placing them at their highest estimation they are of no appreciable weight compared to the certain moral injury done to the community by the sanction of cruelty the discovery of the elixir vitae itself would be too dearly purchased if the hearts of men were to be rendered one degree more callous and selfish than they are now and that the practice of vivisection by a body of men at the intellectual summit of our social system whose influence must dribble down through every stratum of society would infallibly tend to increase such callousness there can exist no reasonable doubt for my own part though believing that little or nothing worth mentioning has been discovered for the healing art through vivisection and that dr leffingwell is right in saying that if agony could be measured in money no mining company in the world would sanction prospecting in such barren regions i yet deprecate the emphasis which many of our friends have laid on this argument against vivisection we have gone off our rightful ground of the simple moral issues of the question and have seemed to admit what very few of us would deliberately do that if some important discovery had been made by vivisection our case against it would be lost or weakened i have been so anxious to warn our friends against this as i think very grave mistaken tactics that i circulated some time ago a little parable which i may as well summarize here a party of filibusters once proposed to ravage a neighbouring island inhabited by poor and humble people who had always been faithful servants and friends of our country and had in no way deserved ill-treatment some friends of justice protested that the filibusters ought to be prohibited from carrying on their expedition but unluckily they did not simply arraign the moral lawfulness of the project but went on to discuss the inexpediency of the invasion arguing that the island was very poor and barren and would not repay the cost of conquest here the filibuster saw their advantage and broke in no such thing we are the only people who know anything about the island and we assure you it is full of mines of gold and silver bosh replied the just men we defy you to show us a single nugget on this there was a good deal of shuffling of feet among the filibusters and they exhibited some glittering fragments as gold but being tested these proved to be worthless and again other fragments which they produced were traced to quite another part of the district far away from the island still it became evident that the filibusters would go on interminably bringing up specimens and some day might possibly produce one the value of which could not be well disputed moreover the filibusters who like other pirates were addicted to telling fearful yarns had the great advantage of talking all along of things they had studied and seen whereas the men of the party of justice were imperfectly informed about the resources of the island having never gone thither and thus they were easily placed at a disadvantage and made to appear foolish it is true that the filibusters had set them on the wrong track by clamouring for the invasion on the avowed ground of the spoil they should gather for the nation and they had only tried to nullify the effect of such appeals to general selfishness by showing that there was really no spoil to be had 
and that the invasion was a blunder as well as a crime but in banding such appeals to expediency they had put themselves in the wrong box because to discuss the value of the spoil was by implication to admit that if only it were rich it might possibly be justifiable to go and seize it i have made this long explanation of our policy because i am painfully aware that among practical people and men of the world accustomed to compromise on public questions our adoption of the demand for total prohibition has placed us at a great disadvantage as irreconcilables and our movement has appeared as the fad of enthusiasts and fanatics for the reasons i have given above i think it will appear that while compromise offered any hope of protecting our poor clients from the very worst cruelties we tried it frankly and in earnest first in lord henniker's and secondly in lord carnarvon's bill but when this last effort failed we were left no choice but either to abandon our dumb friends to their fate or demand for them the removal of the source of their danger End of section twenty nine section thirty of the life of francis power cobb is told by herself by francis power cobb this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty the claims of brutes part three it will not be necessary for me to recount further with as much detail the history of the victoria street society of which i continued to act as honorary secretary till i finally left london in eighteen eighty four abundance of other friends of animals active and energetic were in the field and our movement in spite of a score of checks and defeats continued to spread and deepen campbell's familiar line often occurred to me with a variation the cause of mercy once begun though often lost is always won on july fifteenth eighteen seventy nine lord truro brought into the house of lords a bill for the prohibition of vivisection it was not promoted by us and was in many respects unfortunately managed but our society of course supported it lord shaftesbury made in defence of it one of his longest speeches i was in the house of lords at the time and thought that there could never be a much more affecting sight than that of the noble old man who had pleaded so often in that gilded chamber for men women and children standing there at last in his venerable age urging with all his simple eloquence the claims of dumb animals to mercy against him rose and spoke lord aberdare actually as he took pains to explain as president of the society for prevention of cruelty to animals the bishop of peterborough dr mcgee afterwards archbishop of york also made then his unhappy speech about the rabbits and the surgical operation with which the inventor of that operation dr clay said they had no more to do than the pope of rome only sixteen peers voted for the bill ninety-seven against it on the sixteenth march eighteen eighty mr holt's bill for total prohibition was down for second reading in the house of commons but was stopped by notice of dissolution from that time our friend sir eardley wilmot took charge of a similar bill promoted by our society notice of it was given by mr firth on the third february eighteen eighty one the second reading was postponed first to july thirteenth next to july twenty seventh and then that day was taken by government in october of that year eighteen eighty one mr r t reed took charge of our bill on the resignation of sir eardley wilmot the second reading was postponed on july twenty eighth eighteen eighty two and not till the fourth of april eighteen eighty three after all these heartbreaking postponements and failures there was at last a debate mr reed and mr george russell spoke admirably in favour of the bill but they were talked out without a division by a whole series of advocates of vivisection of whom sir william harcourt mr cartwright and lord playfair were most eminent this was the last occasion on which we have been able to obtain a debate in either house mr reed brought in his bill again in eighteen eighty four but could obtain no day for a second reading one touching incident of these earlier years i must not omit our honourable correspondent at the hague madame van manen Fessing, had written me several letters exhibiting remarkable good sense as well as ardent feeling 
one day i received a short note from her telling me that she was dying and begging me to send over some trustworthy agent at once to the hague if as she feared i could not go to her myself i telegraphed her that i would be with her next day and accordingly sailed that night to flushing when i reached her house m van menen received me very kindly but as a man half bewildered with grief his wife's disease was cancer of the tongue and she could no longer speak she was waiting for me in her drawing-room it may be imagined how affecting was our half speechless interview after a time m van menen at a sign from his wife unlocked a bureau and took out a large packet of papers these he placed before her on the table and then left the room of course i understood this proceeding was intended to satisfy me that it was with her husband's entire consent that madame van menen gave these papers to me there were a great many of them dutch russian and american securities of one sort or another and she marked them off one by one on a list which she had prepared then she wrote down that she gave me all these and also some laces and jewellery to further the anti-vivisection cause in whatever way i thought best reserving a donation for the london anti-vivisection society a few efforts to convey my gratitude and sympathy were all i could make the dear noble woman stood calm and brave in the immediate prospect of death in its most painful form and all her anxieties seemed to be that the poor brute should be effectually aided by her gifts i left her sorrowfully and carried her parcel in my travelling bag first to amsterdam for a day or two and then to london where having summoned our finance committee i placed it in their hands the contents duly estimated and sold through the army and navy society realized over and above the legacy to the london society about one thousand three hundred fifty pounds with this sum we started the zoophilist the zoophilist thus founded may second eighteen eighty one under the editorship of mr adams then our secretary has of course been of enormous value to our cause a new series began on first january eighteen eighty three which i edited till my resignation of the honorary secretaryship june eighteen eighty four i also started and edited a french journal of the same size and character le zoophile from november first eighteen eighty three to april eighteen eighty four when the undertaking was abandoned french readers having obviously found the paper too dry for their taste some of them also remonstrated with me against the occasional references in it to religious considerations and i was frankly counselled by a very influential french gentleman to cease altogether to mention god a piece of advice which i distinctly declined to take the late celebrated mademoiselle de Reim sent me a beautiful article for les zoophiles of which i should have gladly availed myself if she would have allowed me the editorial privilege of dropping about half a page of aggressive atheism but this after a pretty sharp correspondence she refused peremptorily to do altogether i was evidently out of touch with both my french staff and french readers besides these two periodicals our society from the first issued an almost incredible multitude of pamphlets and leaflets i should be afraid to make any calculation of the number of them and of the thousands of copies sent into circulation my own share must have exceeded four hundred beside these and those of our successive secretaries some extremely able we printed valuable pamphlets sermons and speeches by lord shaftesbury cardinal manning the lord chief justice the dean of landaff professor ruskin bishop barry mr r t reed hon b coleridge lady paget canon wilberforce mr mark thornhill mr leslie stephen the bishop of oxford dr mccarness rev f o morris dr arnold george macdonald mr ernest bell baron weber and above all for scientific importance mr lawson tate dr bell taylor dr burdo and dr clark some of my own anti-vivisection pamphlets were collected a few years ago and published by messrs sonnenschein in a volume crown eight volume pages two seventy two entitled the modern rack several very useful books of reference were compiled by our secretary mr bryan and published by the society 
notably the vivisectors directory the english vivisectors directory and anti-vivisection evidences of the nine circles compiled for me in printed first edition at my expense i shall speak presently i must here be allowed to say that the spirited letters pamphlets and articles by our medical allies dr birdo dr clark dr bowie and dr arnold above all dr birdo's contributions to our scientific literature have been an immeasurable value to our cause the day of dr birdo's accession to our party at one of our annual meetings must be ever remembered by me with gratitude his ability courage and disinterestedness have been far beyond any praise i can give them mr mark thornhill also a distinguished indian civil servant author of the indian mutiny etc has done us invaluable service by his calm lucid and most convincing writings notably the case against vivisection and experiments on hospital patients mr perkis r n has been for many years not only by his steady attendance at the committee but by his unwearied exertions in preparing and disseminating anti-pasteur literature one of the chief benefactors of the society among our undertakings on behalf of the victims of science was the prosecution of professor ferrier at bow street on the seventeenth november eighteen eighty one on the strength of certain reports in the two leading medical journals we had ascertained that he had no license for vivisection and yet we read as follows in a report of the proceedings at the international medical congress of eighteen eighty one the members were shown two of the monkeys a portion of whose cortex had been removed by professor ferrier british medical journal twentieth august eighteen eighty one the interest attaching to the discussion was greatly enhanced by the fact that professor ferrier was willing to exhibit two monkeys which he had operated on some months previously in startling contrast to the dog were two monkeys exhibited by professor ferrier one of them had been operated upon in the middle of january the left motor area having been destroyed lancet october eighth eighteen eighty one when the reporters who had sent in their reports to the two journals were produced the following ludicrous examination took place in court dr charles smart roy the reporter for the british medical journal was asked q did professor ferrier offer to exhibit two of the monkeys upon which he had so operated a at the congress no q did he subsequently a no he showed certain of the members of the congress two monkeys at king's college q what two monkeys a two monkeys upon which an operation had been performed q by whom a by professor yao the editor of the lancet dr wakeley was next examined dr wakeley sworn examined by mr waddy q are you the editor of the lancet a i am q can you tell me who it was furnished his report a i have the permission of the gentleman to give his name professor gamgee of owens college manchester mr waddy what i should ask is that one might have an opportunity of calling professor gamgee mr gully counsel for the defendant we have communicated with professor gamgee and i know very well he will say precisely what was said by dr roy report of trial november seventeenth eighteen eighty one the position of the anti-vivisectionists on the occasion was it must be confessed like that of the simple countryman in the fair you lay your money that professor ferrier is under that cup yes certainly i saw both professor roy and professor gamgee put him there about five minutes ago here then see hey presto hocus pocus there is only professor yao the group of vivisectors and their allies dr michael foster dr burden sanderson dr ernest hart professor ferrier dr roy and many more who filled the court all evinced the utmost hilarity at the success of the device whereby as a matter of necessity the anti-vivisection case collapsed at last in the philosophical transactions of the royal society for eighteen eighty four the truth came to light in the prefatory note to a record of experiments by david ferrier and gerald f yo m d occurs the statement the facts recorded in this paper are partly the results of a research made conjointly by doctors ferrier and yo 
aided by a grant from the british medical association and partly of a research made by dr ferrier alone aided by a grant from the royal society the conjoint experiences are distinguished by an asterisk and among them we find those of the two monkeys which formed the subject of the trial thus it stands confessed actually in the transactions of the royal society that professor ferrier had the leading share his name always appears first in the experiments and that conjointly with professor yo he received a grant from the british medical association for performing the same if after this experience we have ceased to hope much from proceedings in the courts of justice against our antagonists it will not be thought surprising the society has been frequently twitted with the failure of this prosecution for which our opponents say we had not a tittle of evidence elaborate reports in the two leading medical journals do not it appears afford even a tittle of evidence among other modes in which we endeavoured to push forward our cause have been special appeals to win over particular churches or other bodies to adopt our principles enormous numbers of circulars have been addressed in this manner by our society to the clergy of the church of england and it is believed that at least four thousand are on our side in the controversy more than two thousand had signed our memorial several years ago another appeal was addressed by me personally to the society of friends through the clerks of the monthly and quarterly meetings in england and ireland it has proved eminently successful and has led to the formation of a powerful friends anti-vivisection society which lately issued an appeal to other members of their body signed by two thousand friends many of them being among the most eminent in england this has again formed the ground of a fresh appeal on an immense scale in pennsylvania another recent appeal to the congregationalists has i hear been very well received on one occasion a special petition to the house of lords was signed by every unitarian minister in london it was presented by the archbishop of york who also presented a memorial for restriction in eighteen seventy six signed by all the heads of colleges in oxford another appeal which i ventured to make printed as a large pamphlet to the humane jews of england entreating them to remonstrate with the german jews who are the worst vivisectors in europe was unfortunately a deplorable failure four of my own private friends jewesses all expressed their sympathy warmly and sent handsome contributions to our funds but not one other jew or jewess high or low rallied to us albeit i presented pamphlets to nearly two hundred recommended to me as specially well disposed i shall never be tempted to address the humane jews of england again one other circular i may mention is more successful i sent to seven hundred head schoolmasters the following letter with which were enclosed the pamphlets mentioned therein hangwort dolgelly september eighteen eighty six permit me respectfully to ask your perusal of the accompanying little paper on physiology as a branch of education i have written it under a strong sense of the necessity which at present exists for some similar caution the leaflet describing a specimen of modern physiological instruction refers to a scene in paris which could not be precisely paralleled in an english school so far as concerns the actual torture of the animals used for exhibition since the vivisection act of eighteen seventy six provided that anaesthetics must be used in all cases of vivisection for illustration of lectures it is however to be seriously questioned whether even painless and therefore not shocking operations on living animals performed before boys and girls by the enthusiastic english admirers of claude bernard and paul burt may not excite in the minds of the young witnesses a curiosity unmingled with pity such as may subsequently prompt them to become the most merciless experimenters or at least advocates and apologists of scientific cruelty trusting sir that you will pardon the trespass of this letter i am sincerely yours francis power cobb twelve of these headmasters including some of the most eminent e g mr weldon of harrow dr haig of the charter house and the lamented dr thring of uppingham wrote me the most interesting letters in reply expressing approval of my views i shall here insert that of mr thring as in many respects noteworthy 
rev edward thring to miss f p c pitlochry perthshire m b september sixth eighteen eighty nine my dear madam i received your little pamphlet on physiology but i hardly know what you expect me to do my writings on education sufficiently show how strongly i feel on the subject of a literary education or rather how confident i am in the judgment that there can be no worthy education which is not based on the study of the highest thoughts of the highest men in the best shape as for science most of it falsely so called if a few leading minds are accepted it simply amounts to the average dull worker to no more than a kind of upper shop work weighing out and labelling and learning alphabetical formulae a superior grocery assistant's work and has not a single element of higher mental training in it not to mention that it leaves out all knowledge of man and life and therefore is eminently fitted to train men for life and its struggles physiology in its worser sense adds to this a brutalizing of the average practitioner or rather a devilish combination of intellect worship and cruelty at the expense of feeling and character for my part if it were true that vivisection had wonderfully relieved bodily disease for men if it were at the cost of lost spirits then i should say let the body perish and it is at the cost of lost spirits i do not say that under no circumstances should an experiment take place but i do say that under no circumstances should an experiment take place for teaching purposes you will see how decided my judgment is on this matter i send you three addresses on education which in smaller space than my books will illustrate the positive side of my experience and beliefs yours faithfully edward thring our committee was in all the years in which i had to do with it the most harmonious and friendly of which i have ever heard lord shaftesbury who presided forty-nine times and never once failed us when he was expected was of course as all the world knows a first-rate chairman getting through an immense amount of business while allowing every member his or her legitimate rights of speech and voting he never showed himself i have been told anywhere more genial and zealous than with us lord mount temple attended very frequently and lady mount temple from first to last has been one of our warmest and wisest friends general colin mackenzie a devout and noble old soldier spoke little but what he did say was always straight to the mark and the affectionate respect we all felt for him made his presence delightful lady portsmouth now the dowager countess attended in those days very regularly and lady camperdown has given us her unwearied help from that time to this i have spoken of the very valuable services of mr e de fonblanc in later years my friend rev william henry channing was a great support to me the cardinal was perhaps a little reserved but always carefully kind and courteous and whatever he said bore great weight lord bute's advice was very valuable and full of good sense mr shane's legal knowledge served us often in brief each member was useful there never were any parties or cabals in the committee it was my business as honorary secretary especially after my colleague dr hoggan retired to lay proposals for action before the committee they were sometimes rejected and often completely modified but we all felt that the one thing we desired was simply to find the best way of forwarding our cause and we were thankful for the guidance of the wise and experienced men who were our leaders in short the feelings which inspired us round that long oak office table were not ill befitting our work and now that so many of those who sat there beside me in the earlier years have passed from earth i find myself pondering whether they have met elsewhere where ere long i may join them they must form a blessed company in any world may my place be with them please god rather than with the votaries of science in the secular to be in the later years the personnel of the committee has of course been largely renewed lady mount temple lady camperdown and mrs frank morrison almost alone remain from the earlier body miss marston also who originally founded the london anti-vivisection society has been for many years one of the firmest and wisest friends of the victoria street society also 
i have spoken above of all we owe to captain perkis's unfailing help at the committee even while residing far out of town and of the zeal wherewith he and his gifted wife founded the first of our branches and have laboured in circulating our literature miss monroe miss rees miss bryant and mrs arthur arnold have never wearied through many years in patiently and vigorously aiding our work of our excellent chairman mr ernest bell's services to the anti-vivisection cause it is needless for me to speak as they must be recognized gratefully by the whole party throughout england we have had several successive secretaries who sometimes took the work much off my hands sometimes left it to fall very heavily on me and miss lloyd on one occasion we too having also lost the clerk did the entire work of the office for many weeks inclusive of writing editing folding addressing and actually posting an issue of the zoophilist but my toils and many of my anxieties ended when i was fortunate enough to obtain the services as secretary of mr benjamin bryan who had long shown his genuine interest in the cause as editor of a northern newspaper and after a year or two of work in concert with him i felt free to leave the whole burden on his shoulders and tendered my resignation the constant presence on the committee of my long-tried and most valued allies mr ernest bell captain perkis and miss marston left me entirely at rest respecting the course of our future policy in the straight direction of prohibition the last event which i need record is a disagreeable incident which occurred in the autumn of eighteen ninety two i had been seriously ill with acute sciatica and had been only partially relieved by a large subcutaneous dose of morphia given me by my country doctor in this state with my head still swimming and scarcely able to sit at a table i found myself involved in the most acrimonious newspaper controversy which i ever remember to have seen in any respectable journal it will be best that another pen than mine should tell the story so i will quote the calm and lucid statement of the author of the excellent pamphlet vivisection at the folkestone church congress page six after a resume of the notorious debate at folkestone the writer says the main point of attack in mr victor horsley's paper was a book called the nine circles which had been published some months before and contained reports of different classes of cruel experiments on animals both in england and on the continent to this book miss cobb had given the sanction of her name but she was not personally responsible for any of the quotations having entrusted the compilation of the book to friends living in london and who had access to the journals and papers in which the experiments were recorded mr horsley's indignation was roused because in a certain number of cases twenty-two out of the one hundred seventy narratives of different classes of experiments many of them involving a series and the use of large numbers of animals in each the mention of the use of morphia or chloroform was omitted miss cobb in a letter to the times of october eleventh while acknowledging that the compilers were bound to quote the fact if stated expressed her conviction that such statements are misleading because insensibility is not and cannot be complete during the whole period of the experiment dr burdow also wrote in several papers defending miss cobb against mr horsley's imputations of fraud and intent to deceive etc and explaining that the compilers of the book were alone responsible for the omissions he added however a further explanation that as it was often the painful results and not the operations which caused them that it was desired to illustrate and as these results lasted sometimes for many days or weeks or months and to maintain insensibility during that period was impossible the omissions were not so important after all the assailant however returned to the charge and in a more violent style than before his letter to the times of october seventeenth was a tirade against miss cobb worthy as the spectator remarked only of the fifteenth century in which the words false and lie were freely used it was a letter of so libellous a character that it is a matter of wonder that it obtained publication miss cobb very naturally and properly at once retired from a controversy conducted as she expressed it in a letter to the times outside of all my experience of civilized journalism she concluded with these words 
i need scarcely say that i maintain the veracity of every word of the letter which you did me the honour to publish of the fifteenth instant as well as the bona fides of all i have spoken or written on this or other subjects during my threescore years and ten after a week or two i went to bath to recruit my health after the attack of sciatica and the first newspaper i took up at the york hostel contained a still more violent attack on me than those which had preceded it on reading it i walked into the telegraph office next door wired for rooms at my favourite south kensington hotel and went up to town with my maid presenting myself at once to our committee which happened to be sitting and arranging for the impending meeting in st james's hall shall i attend said i and speak or not i will do exactly what you wish the committee were unanimously of opinion that i should go to the meeting and take part in the proceedings and i have ever since rejoiced that i did so it was on the evening of october twenty seventh my ever kind friend canon basil wilberforce took the chair colonel lockwood bishop barry dr burdo mr bell and captain purgus were on the platform supporting me but above all mr george w e russell then under secretary of state for india made a speech on my behalf for which i shall feel grateful to him so long as i live we had but slight acquaintance previously and i shall always feel that it was a most generous and chivalrous action on his part to stand forth in so public a manner as my champion on such an occasion the audience was more than sympathetic there was a storm of genuine feeling when i rose to make my explanation and i found it for once hard to command my voice this is what i said as reported in the zoophilist november first eighteen ninety two now to come to the story of the nine circles which i will tell as quickly as possible when i gave up the honorary secretaryship of the victoria street society six years ago i retired to live among the mountains in wales and the chief thing which remained for me to do was to publish as many pamphlets and papers as seemed likely to help the cause i have just got here my printer's list of the papers which i have printed in those six years i have made up the totals and i find that the number in the six years of books pamphlets and leaflets has been three hundred twenty that is about one a week and that two hundred seventy one thousand three hundred fifty copies of them were printed one hundred seventy three papers having been written by myself cheers some of these were adopted by the society and honoured by coming out under its auspices and others i issued quite independently amongst those which i issued on my own hook i am happy to say was this book called the nine circles therefore our dear and honoured society is not responsible for that book i am alone responsible it was printed at my expense and Monsieur sonnenschein published it for me therefore i am the only person concerned with it and the society has nothing to do with it i am thankful to hear that the revised edition will come out under the auspices of the society my only privilege will be to pay for it and that i shall most thankfully do in order to wipe out the wrong i have done as concerns the present edition when the present book was got up i sketched a plan of it and asked a lady often employed by us who was living in london and who is a good german scholar to make extracts for me she knows a great deal about the subject she also knows german which i do not do sufficiently for the purpose and she was living in london while i was two hundred miles away therefore i asked her to make the extracts of which this book is compiled and it was afterwards revised as dr burdo has told us by him the book came out and it appears now that there are some mistakes in it my assistant had left out certain things which ought to have been stated i took it for granted i was quite wrong to do so that all my directions had been carried out and i made myself responsible for the book therefore whatever error there is in the matter is mine and i beg that that will be quite understood cheers but what is all this tremendous storm which has been raised and this pulling of the house down about these mistakes do they wish us to understand that there are no such things as painful experiments in england apparently that is what they are trying to make us think that there never has been anything of the kind that they are perfectly incapable of putting any animal to pain do they really mean that is that what they wish us to understand if they do not mean that i do not know what it is they mean 
it seems to me that they are raising this tremendous storm very much as if the old slaveholders were to have danced a war dance around mrs stowe and scalped her for having said that legree had flogged uncle tom with a thousand lashes when really there were only nine hundred and ninety nine laughter that seems to me to be the case in a nutshell zoophilus november first eighteen ninety two i had the gratification to receive soon after the following most kind address and expression of confidence from the leading members of the victoria street society to miss frances power cobb we the undersigned being supporters of the victoria street society and others interested in the movement against vivisection wish to express the strong feeling of indignation with which we have seen your integrity called in question by men who seem unable to conceive of the pure unselfish devotion of high intellectual gifts to the service of god's humbler creatures it is impossible for those who know anything of the early history of this movement to forget the great personal sacrifice at which you undertook to make it the chief work of your life it is equally impossible for us who have watched its progress to say how highly we have esteemed the indomitable courage and forcible eloquence with which you have exposed the evils inseparable from experiments on living animals further we wish to record our firm conviction that you have throughout recognized the wisdom and the duty of founding your attack on vivisection upon the truth and nothing but the truth so far as you have been able to arrive at it we wish in conclusion to assure you not only of our special sympathy with you at a time when you have been subjected to a personal attack of an unusually coarse and violent character but also of our determination to give still more earnest support to the cause to which you have at so great a cost devoted yourself strafford earl of strafford coleridge lord chief justice worcester marquis of worcester haddington earl of haddington arthur bath and wells bishop of bath and wells j manchester bishop of manchester w walsham wakefield bishop of wakefield h b coventry bishop of coventry john mitchinson bishop f kramer roberts bishop edward g bagshaw r c bishop of nottingham sidmouth viscount sidmouth pollington viscount pollington colville of colross lord colville of colross cardross lord cardross h abinger lady abinger robart lord robart lee lord lee c buchan dowager countess of buchan harriet de clifford dowager lady de clifford f camperdown countess of camperdown kinnaird lord kinnaird alma kinnaird lady kinnaird clementine mitford lady clementine mitford evelyn portsmouth dowager countess of portsmouth georgina mount temple lady mount temple h kemble lady kemble j brotherton lady brotherton evelyn ashley honorable evelyn ashley bernard coleridge honorable b coleridge m p geraldine coleridge honorable mrs s coleridge stephen coleridge honorable stephen coleridge george duckett sir george duckett b t henry a hoare sir henry hoare b t george f shaw l l d samuel smith m p theodore fry m p george w e russell m p jacob bright m p theodore burt m p julius barris colonel richard h hutton r payne smith h wilson white d d l l d edward waitley archdeacon waitley george w cox rev sir george cox bart r m greer prebendary greer eleanor vere c boyle hon mrs r c boyle e g dean morgan hon mrs dean morgan charles bell taylor m d edward burdo m r c s alexander bowie m d c m john h clark m d henry downs m d henry m duncalf william adamson d d william adlam amelia e arnold ernest bell rhoda broughton olive s bryant w k burford a galenga and mrs galenga maria g gray emily a e sheriff francis holden 
eleanor mary james francis griffith jones e j kennedy edith leister w s lilly mary charlotte lloyd ann marston mary j martin s s monroe frank morrison harriet morrison josiah oldfield rose pender frederick pennington herbert phillips fred e perkus and mrs perkus rev l i price evelyn price r m price lester reed ellen elcom rees j herbert satchel mark thornhill j p looking back on this long struggle of twenty years in which so much of my happiness and the happiness of others dearer than myself has been engulfed i can see that starting from the apparently small and subordinate question of scientific cruelty the controversy has been growing and widening till the whole department of ethics dealing with man's relation to the lower animals has gradually been included in it that this department is an obscure one and that neither the christian churches nor yet philosophic moralists have hitherto paid it sufficient attention is now admitted that it is time that it should be carefully studied and worked out is also clear sometimes i have thought as by a law of our being we seem driven to do whenever our hearts are deeply concerned that a divine guidance may have presided over all the heart-breaking delays and disappointments of this weary movement and that it has not been allowed to terminate as it would certainly have done had we carried our bill of eighteen seventy six in its original form through parliament then our society would have dissolved at once and after a time perhaps the act however well designed would have become more or less a dead letter and the hydra heads of vivisection would have reared themselves once more but as it has actually happened the delay and failure of our earlier efforts and our consequent persistence in them have fixed attention on this culminating sin against the lower animals and through it on all other sins against them a great revision of opinion on the subject is undoubtedly taking place and while some especially roman catholic zoophilists have diligently sought in decrees and manuals and treatises of casuistry for some authority defining cruelty to animals to be a sin the poverty of the results of all such investigations and of the anxious collation of biblical texts by protestants is gradually revealing the fact that in this whole department of human duty we must look to the god-enlightened consciences of living men rather than to the dicta of departed saints or casuists whose attention was directed exclusively to the relations of human beings with each other and with god and who obviously never contemplated those which we hold to the brutes with adequate seriousness if at all of course we are here met just as the first anti-slavery apostles were met and as the advocates of every fresh development of morality will be met for many a day to come by by the fundamental fallacy of the christian churches in that respect resembling islam that there is a finality in divine teaching and that they have been for two thousand years in possession of the last word of god to man protestants are certainly not bound in any way to occupy such a position or to assume that a final revise has ever been issued or ever will be issued by divine authority of a whole duty of man rather are they called on piously and gratefully to look for fresh light to come down age after age from the father of lights or if they please rather so to consider it further development of the christian spirit to be manifested as men learn better to incarnate it in their minds and lives as for theists like myself it is natural for us and in accordance with all our opinions to believe that such a movement as is now taking place over the civilized world on behalf of dumb animals is a fresh divine impulse of mercy stirring in thousands of human hearts and deserving of reverent cherishing and thankful acceptance it is my supreme hope that when with god's help our anti-vivisection controversy ends in years to come long after i have passed away mankind will have attained through it a recognition of our duties towards the lower animals far in advance of that which we now commonly hold if the beautiful dream of the later isaiah can never be perfectly realized on this planet and none may ever find that thrice holy mountain whereon they shall not hurt nor destroy 
yet at least the time will come when no man worthy of the name will take pleasure in killing and he who would torture an animal will be looked upon as in the truest sense inhuman unworthy of the friendship of man or the love of woman the long oppressed and suffering brutes will then be spared many a pang and their innocent lives made far happier while the hearts of men will grow more tender to their own kind by cultivating pity and tenderness to the beasts and birds the earth will at last cease to be full of violence and cruel habitations september eighteen ninety eight the too confident expectations which i entertained of my permanent connection till death with the society which i had founded and which i designed to make my heir have alas been disappointed it was perhaps natural that in my long exile from london and consequent absence from the committee my continual letters of enquiry advice and as i fondly and foolishly imagined assistance in the work were felt to be obtrusive especially by the newer members one change after another in the constitution and in the name of the society left me more or less in opposition to the ruling spirits and before long a much more serious difference arose the very able and energetic honorary secretary hon stephen coleridge who had entered on his office in april eighteen ninety seven after making the changes to which i have referred proposed that we should introduce a bill into parliament no longer on the old lines asking for the total prohibition of vivisection but on quite a different basis demanding certain lesser measures not yet distinctly formulated but intended to supply checks to the practical lawlessness of licensed vivisectors mr coleridge and his brother now lord coleridge had twelve or fourteen years before urged me to abandon the demand for total prohibition and to adopt the policy of restriction and bring in a bill accordingly but to this proposal i had made the most strenuous resistance writing a long pamphlet on the fallacy of restriction for the purpose and it had been as i thought altogether given up and forgotten it would appear however that the idea remained in mr coleridge's mind with the modification that he now regarded lesser measures not as final restriction but as steps to prohibition and for this policy he obtained the suffrage of the majority of the council though not of the oldest members the reader who will kindly glance back over the preceding pages three hundred to three o six will see the exceeding importance i attach to the maintenance of the strict principle of abolition whereby our party renounces all compromise with the abominable sin and refuses to be again cheated by the hocus-pocus of vivisectors and their deceptive anaesthetics but an overestimate as it seems to me of the importance of parliamentary action and certainly an underestimate of that of the great popular propaganda whereon our hopes must ultimately rest a propaganda which would be paralyzed by the advocacy of half measures caused mr coleridge and his friends to take an opposite view after a long and to me heart-breaking struggle i was finally defeated by a vote of twenty nine to twenty three at a council meeting on the ninth february eighteen ninety eight the policy of lesser measures was adopted by the newly christened national society and i and all the oldest members and founders of the victoria street society sorrowfully withdrew from what we had proudly but very mistakenly called our society amongst us were mr mark thornhill miss marston mr and mrs adam lady mount temple mr and mrs frank morrison lady paget madame van eyes and countess baldelli to all workers in the cause these names will stand as representing the very nucleus of the whole party since it began its life twenty-three years ago the oldest and most faithful worker of all lady camperdown who had aided me with the first memorial in eighteen seventy four and who had attended the committee from first to last had risen from her deathbed to write a letter imploring the chairman not to support the demand for lesser measures she died before the decision was reached and her touching letter in spite of my entreaties was not read to the congress after leaving the old society with unspeakable pain and mortification i felt it incumbent on me while i yet had a little strength left for work it was not wholly played out as i believe i was supposed to be by the new spirits at the office 
to establish some centre where the only principle on which the cause can in my opinion be safely maintained should be permanently established and to which i could transfer the legacy of ten thousand pounds which then stood in my will bequeathed unconditionally to the committee of the national society my first effort was to request the committee of the london anti-vivisection society to give me such pledge as it was competent to afford that it would not promote any measure in parliament short of abolition this pledge being formally refused there remained for me no resource but to attempt once more in my old age to create a new anti-vivisection society and i resolved to call it the british union for the abolition of vivisection and to make it a federation of branch societies having its centre in bristol where my staunch old fellow-workers had had their office for many years established and in first-rate order i invited as many friends as seemed desirous of joining in my undertaking to a private conference here at hengward and i had the pleasure of receiving and entertaining them for three days while we quietly arranged the constitution of the new union with the invaluable help of our chairman mr norris k c late one of the justices of the supreme court calcutta the british union was in the following month june eighteen ninety eight formally constituted at a public conference in bristol and is at present working vigorously in bristol and at its various branches in wales liverpool york macclesfield sheffield yarmouth and london all information concerning it and its special constitution whereby the branches will all profit by bequests to the union may be obtained by enquiry from either our admirable honorary secretary mrs roscoe crete hill westbury on trim bristol our zealous secretary miss baker twenty triangle bristol or our honorary treasurer john norris esq k c devonshire club london to those of my readers who may desire to contribute to the anti-vivisection cause and who have shared my views on it as set forth in my numberless pamphlets and letters and to those especially who like myself intend to bequeath money to carry on the war against scientific cruelty i now earnestly say as my final counsel support the british union end of section thirty section thirty one of life of francis power cobb is told by herself by francis power cobb this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty one my home in wales in april eighteen eighty four my friend and i quitted london having permanently let our house in south kensington to mrs kemble the strain of london life had become too great for me and advancing years and narrowed income together counselled retreat in good time i continued then and ever since of course to work for the anti-vivisection cause but i resigned my honorary secretaryship june twenty sixth eighteen eighty four and left the entire charge of the office and of editing the zoophilist to mr bryan a few months later i was disturbed to hear that the hon stephen coleridge lord coleridge's second son who had always been particularly kind and considerate towards me had started a fund to form a farewell testimonial to me from my fellow-workers mr coleridge addressed our leading members and friends in the following letter twelve ovington gardens s w august eighteen eighty four sir or madam at the general meeting of the victoria street and international societies for the total abolition of vivisection on the twenty sixth june miss frances power cobb for reasons set forth in the annual report gave in her resignation of the post of honorary secretary and it was accepted with deep reluctance the executive committee meeting shortly afterwards unanimously passed a resolution to the effect that the occasion ought not to be passed over by the society unrecognized and a list of subscribers to a testimonial for miss cobb has been opened the object of this letter is to acquaint you of these facts and to afford you the opportunity of adding your name to the list should you desire to do so year after year from the foundation of the societies and before miss cobb has fought against the practice of the torture of animals with constant earnestness conspicuous power and enthusiasm born of a noble cause the testimonials are too plentiful it may perhaps be urged with truth 
but many of us who deprecate the practice of vivisection feel that such a life as this of honor and devotion were it to stand unrecognized and unacknowledged would mark us as entirely ungrateful i remain your faithful servant stephen coleridge honorary secretary and treasurer to the fund in a short space of time i was told a thousand pounds was collected and it was kindly and thoughtfully expended in buying me an annuity of one hundred pounds a year the amount of labor and trouble which all these arrangements must have cost mr stephen coleridge must have been very great indeed and only most genuine kindness of heart and regard for me could have induced him to undertake them i was very much startled when i heard of this gift and very unwilling to accept it as in some degree taking away the pleasurable sense i had had of working all along gratuitously for the poor beasts and of having sacrificed for some years nearly all my literary earnings to devote myself to their cause my objections were overruled by friendly insistence and lord shaftesbury presented the testimonial to me in the following letter twenty four grosvenor square w february twenty sixth eighteen eighty five my dear miss cobb the committee of the anti vivisection society and other contributors have assigned to me the agreeable duty of requesting you to do them the kindness and the honour to accept the accompanying testimonial it expresses i can assure you their deep and real sense of the vast services you have rendered to the world by the devotion of your time your talents and indefatigable zeal to the assertion of principles which though primarily brought into action for the benefit and protection of the inferior orders of the creation are of paramount importance to the honour and security of the whole human race we heartily pray that you may enjoy all health and happiness in your retirement which we trust will be but temporary we shall frequently ask the aid of your counsels and live in hope of your speedy return to active exertion in the career in which you have laboured so vigorously and which you so sincerely love believe me to be very truly yours shaftesbury i acknowledge lord shaftesbury's letter as follows Hengwart, Dalgelly, North Wales, February 27th. Dear Lord Shaftesbury, I find it very difficult to express to you the feelings with which I have just read your letter, and received the noble gift which accompanied it. You and all the good friends and fellow workers who have thus done me honor and kindness will have added much to the material comfort and enjoyment of such years as may remain to me but you have done still more for me by filling my heart with the happy sense of being cared for that you should estimate such work as i have been able to do so highly as your letter expresses while it far surpasses anything i can myself think i have accomplished yet makes me very proud and very thankful to god whatever has been done by me in the way of raising up opposition to scientific cruelty has been attained only because i had the inestimable advantage of being supported and guided by you from first to last and aided step by step by the unwearied sympathy and cooperation of my dear and generous fellow labourers these words are very inadequate to convey my thanks to you for this gift and all your past goodness towards me and those which i would fain offer through you to the committee and all the subscribers to this splendid testimonial especially to the honorary secretary who has undertaken the great trouble which the collection of it must have involved i can but repeat i thank you and them with my whole heart most sincerely dear lord shaftesbury and gratefully yours francis power cobb this addition to my little income made up for certain losses which i had incurred and raised it to about its original moderate level enabling me to share the expenses of our welsh cottage i was however of course a poor woman and not in a position to help my friend to live as we both earnestly desired to do in her larger house in hengward we made an effort to arrange it so loving the place and enjoying the beauty of the woods and gardens exceedingly but we knew it could not be our permanent home and a suitable tenant having come on the field offering to take it for a term of years which would naturally reach beyond our lives we felt that the end of our possession was drawing near i was very sorrowful for my own sake and still more for that of my friend 
who had always had peculiar attachment to the place i reflected painfully that if i had been only a little better off she might not have been obliged to relinquish her proper home all this was occupying me much it was a thursday morning and the gentleman who proposed to become the tenant of hangward was to come on monday to make a definite offer which once accepted would have been held to bind my friend i went downstairs into the old oak hall in the morning and opened the post-bag among the large packet of letters which usually awaits me there there was one from a solicitor in liverpool i knew that my kind old friend mrs yates had died the week before and i had been informed that she had left me her residuary legatee but i imagined her to be in narrow circumstances and that a few hundreds would be the uttermost of my possible inheritance not sufficient at all events to affect appreciably my available income i opened the solicitor's letter very coolly and found myself to be so far as all my wants and wishes extend a rich woman the story of this legacy is a very touching one i never saw or heard of mrs yates till a few years before her death and when she was already very aged she began by sending large and generous donations of fifty pounds and eighty pounds at a time to our society later she came up from liverpool to london when i was managing affairs without a secretary and finding me at the office she gave me a still larger donation actually in banknotes she was a unitarian or rather a theist like myself and having taken very warm interest in my books she seemed to be drawn to me by a double sympathy both on account of my religious sympathies and those we shared on behalf of the vivisected animals of course i explained to her the details of my work and she took the warmest interest in it after i resigned my office of honorary secretary she seemed to prefer to give her principal contributions personally to me to expend for the cause according to my judgment and twice she sent me large sums with strictest injunction to keep her name and even the locality of the donor secret i called these gifts my trust fund and made grants from it to working allies all over the world i also spent a great deal of it in printing large quantities of papers of course i began by sending her a balance sheet of my expenditure but this she forbade me to repeat so i could only from time to time write her long letters copied for me by my friend as my writing taxed her sight telling her all we were doing at last she came to see us here in answer to our repeated invitations but could not be persuaded to stop more than one night talking to me out walking she asked me would i take charge of some money she wished to leave for protection of animals in liverpool i answered that i could not engage to do this and begged her to entrust it as she eventually did to some friend resident in the place then she said shyly well you do not object to my leaving you something for yourself to my making you my residuary legatee adding to the question some words of affection of course i could only press her hand and say i was grateful for her kind thought she did it all so simply that being prepossessed with the idea that she was in rather narrow circumstances and that she had already given me the savings of her lifetime in the trust fund it never even occurred to me that this residuary legateeship could be an important matter after she had provided as she was sure to do for all legitimate claims upon her nothing could exceed my astonishment when i found how large was the sum bequeathed in this unpretending way my friend thought i must be ill from the difficulty i seemed to have found in commanding my voice to tell her the strange news when she came into the hall a quarter of an hour after i had read that epoch-making letter certainly never was a great gift made with such perfect delicacy mrs yates had taken care that i should have no reason so long as she lived to suppose myself under any personal obligation to her since then it may be believed that my heart has never ceased to cherish her memory with tender gratitude and to associate the thought of her with all the comforts of the home which her wealth has secured for me mrs yates at the time i knew her had been for thirty or forty years the widow of mr richard vaughan yates a liverpool merchant 
the following obituary notice of her appeared in the zoophilist november second eighteen ninety one i may add that beside her personal legacy to me given simply by her will to her friend miss frances power cobb without comment of any kind mrs yates gave one thousand pounds to the victoria street society as well as one thousand pounds to the liverpool society for prevention of cruelty to animals both bequests being over and above legacies to her executors relatives and dependents obituary the late mrs yates the victoria street society and the cause of anti-vivisection have lost their most generous supporter in mrs richard yates of liverpool a good and noble woman if ever there were one born in humble circumstances she was one of the truest gentlewomen who ever lived her wide cultivation of mind broadly liberal but deeply religious spirit and sound clear judgment remained conspicuous even in extreme old age the hearts of those whom she aided in their toil for the poor brutes with a generosity only equalled by the delicacy of its manifestations will ever keep her memory in tender and grateful respect a warmly feeling article in the inquirer october tenth eighteen ninety one known to be by her friend and pastor rev valentine davies gave the following sketch of her life it is due to her whose generosity has so brightened my later years that my autobiography should contain some such record of her goodness and usefulness mrs richard vaughan yates on thursday evening october first there passed peacefully away one who was the last of her generation bearing a name honored in liverpool since the rev john yates in the latter part of last century in the early years of this ministered in paradise street chapel and his sons took their places in the first rank of the merchants and philanthropic citizens of the town anne simpson was born november tenth eighteen o five and to the last retained happy recollections of her childhood's home a simple cottage in the pleasant cheshire country she married in the midsummer of eighteen thirty two mr richard vaughan yates having first spent a year for purposes of education in the household of dr lant carpenter at bristol of whom she always spoke with great veneration richly endowed with natural grace and delicacy of feeling true nobility of heart and great simplicity sustained by earnest religious feeling and a strong sense of duty there was never happier choice than this which gave mrs yates the larger opportunities of wealth and freedom in society she shared her husband's interest in many philanthropic labors his care for the harrington schools founded by his father and for the liverpool institute his pleasure and his anxieties in the making of the prince's park opened in eighteen forty nine as his gift to the town she also shared to the full his delight in works of art and in foreign travel the late rev charles wicksteed published some charming reminiscences of one of their italian journeys and still more notable was that journey through egypt sinai and palestine recorded by miss harriet martineau in her eastern travel since her husband's death in eighteen fifty six mrs yates has stood bravely alone living very quietly but keenly alive to all the interests of the world with ardent sympathy for every righteous cause and generous help ever ready for public needs as for private charity no one will ever know the full measure of her acts of kindness her care for the least defended her many quiet ways of doing good she was a great lover of dumb creatures and felt a passionate indignation at every kind of cruelty four-footed waifs and strays often found a pleasant refuge in her house and for many years she was an active worker for the local branch of the society for the prevention of cruelty to animals the cabmen and donkey boys of liverpool at their annual suppers have long been familiar with her kindly face and gracious word and many a time has her intrepid protest checked an act of cruelty in the public streets the friend of francis power cobb she took a deep and painful interest in the work of the victoria street society for the suppression of vivisection and sustained its work through many years by generous gifts herself a solitary woman in these later years it was to the solitary and defenceless that her sympathies most quickly went 
she desired for women larger powers to defend their own helplessness to share in government for the amelioration of society and to share also in the world's work she had a surprising energy and persistence of will in attending to her own affairs and doing the unselfish work she had most at heart with a plain tenacity to the duty that was clear she went out to the last whenever it was possible to vote at every election where she had a vote to give and to attend meetings of a political and useful social character hers was a life of great unselfishness and true humility suffering most of all through sympathy with others she longed for more light to dissipate the darker shadows of the world and she herself whenever it was possible to her patient faithfulness and generous kindness drove away the darkness praying thus the best of prayers and making light and gladness in innumerable hearts after only a few days of illness she fell asleep a memorial service was held on sunday last in the ancient chapel of toxteth where for many years she regularly worshipped the rev v d davis preached the sermon and also on the following day at the birkenhead flaybrick hill cemetery spoke the words of faith at her grave inquirer october tenth i have erected over her last resting-place as i learned that she disliked heavy horizontal tombstones a large upright slab of polished red aberdeen granite after her name and the dates of her birth and death shakespeare's singularly appropriate line is inscribed on the stone sweet mercy is nobility's true badge on receiving that eventful thursday morning the news of the unlooked-for riches which had fallen to my lot our first act was naturally to telegraph to the would-be tenant that another offer to wit mine had been accepted for hengwart the miseries of house letting and home leaving were over for us we trust so long as our lives may last there is not much more to be told in this last chapter of my story the expansion of life in many directions which wealth brings with it is as easy and pleasant as the contraction of it by poverty is the reverse yet i have not altered the opinion i formed long ago when i became poor after my father's death that the importance we commonly attach to pecuniary conditions is somewhat exaggerated so long as a competence is left and that other things for example the possession of good walking powers or of strong eyesight or of good hearing not to speak of the still more precious things of the affections and spirit are larger elements by far in human happiness than that which riches contributes thereto of course i have been very glad of this unlooked-for wealth in my old age i have felt first and before all things else the immense satisfaction of being able to help the anti-vivisection cause in all parts of the world while i live and to provide for some further continuance of such help after i die and next to this i have rejoiced that the comfort and repose of our beautiful and beloved home is secured to my friend and myself the friendly reader who has travelled with me through the journey of my threescore years and ten from my singularly happy childhood in my old home at newbridge to this far burn on the road will now i hope leave me with kindly wishes for a peaceful evening and a not too distant curfew bell in this dear old house and with my beloved friend for companion the photograph of hengwart which will be inserted in these last pages gives a good idea of the house itself but can convey none of the beauty of the rivers woods and mountains all around no spot in the kingdom i think not even in the lovely lake country unites so many elements of beauty as this part of wales the mountains are not very lofty even the glorious cotter where the giant idris so says the legend sat in the rocky chair cotter on the summit and studied the stars is trifling compared to alpine height and a molehill to andes and himalayas yet is its form and that of all these cambrian rocks so majestic and their tilt so great that no one could treat them as merely hills or liken them to irish mountains which resemble banks of rain clouds on the horizon the deep true purple heather and the emerald green fern robe these welsh mountains in summer in regal splendour of colouring and in autumn wrap them in rich russet brown cloaks 
down between every chain and ridge rush brooks always bright and clear and in many places leaping into lovely waterfalls the broad and brawling maudoc runs through all the valley from heights far out of sight till just below hengward it meets the almost equally beautiful stream of the winyon and the two together wind their way through the tidal estuary out into the sea at the aber maudoc or abermaw in english barmouth eight miles to the west on both north and south of the valley and on the sides of the mountains are woods endless woods of oak and lark and scotch fir interspersed with sycamore wild cherry horse chestnut elm holly and an occasional beech never was there a country in which were to be found growing freely and almost wild so many different kinds of trees creating of course the loveliest wood scenery and variety of colouring the oaks and elms and sycamores which grow in hengward itself are the oldest and some of the finest in this part of wales and here also flourish the largest laurels and rhododendrons i have ever seen anywhere the luxuriance of their growth towering high on each side of the avenue and in the shrubberies is a constant subject of astonishment to our visitors the blossoms of the rhodos are sometimes twenty or twenty-five feet from the ground and the laurels almost resemble forest trees it has been one of my chief pleasures here to prune and clip and clear the way for these beautiful shrubs through the midst of them all from one end of the place to the other rushes the dearest little brook in the world singing away constantly in so human a tone that over and over again i have paused in my labours of saw and clippers and said to myself there must be someone talking in that walk it is a lady's voice too it can't be only the brook this time but the brook it has always proved to be on further investigation of the interior of this dear old home i shall not write now it is interesting from its age one of the oak-panelled rooms contains a bed placed there at the dissolution of the neighbouring monastery of kimmer abbey but it is not in the least a gloomy house altogether the reverse the drawing-room commands a view to right and left of almost the whole valley of the maudoc for nine or ten miles and just opposite lies the pretty village of clonachtide at the foot of the wooded hills which rise up behind it to the heights of moyle ispry and kevin calm it is a panorama of splendid scenery not darkening the room but making one side of it into a great picture full of exquisite details of old stone bridge and ruined abbey rivers woods and rocks among the objects in that wide view and also in the still more extensive one from my bedroom above is the little ivy-coloured church of clenictide and below it a bit of ground sloping to the westering sun dotted over with grey and white stones where the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep together with a few others who have been our friends and neighbours there in that quiet enclosure will in all probability be the bourne of my long journey of life with a grey headstone for the finis of the last chapter of the book which i have first lived and now have written i hope that the reader who perhaps may drive some day along the road below in the enjoyment of an autumn holiday in this lovely land will cast a glance upon that churchyard and give a kindly thought to me when i have gone to rest september eighteen ninety eight the grey granite stone is standing already in clanictide burying ground though my place beneath it still waits for me the friend who made my life so happy when i wrote the last pages of this book and who had then done so for thirty-four blessed years lies there under the rose trees in the mignonette alone till i may be laid beside her it would be some poor comfort to me in my loneliness to write here some little account of mary charlotte lloyd and to describe her keen highly cultivated intellect her quick sense of humour her gifts as sculptor and painter the pupil and friend of john gibson and of rosa bonheur her practical ability and strict justice in the administration of her estate above all to speak of her character cast as one who knew her from childhood said in an heroic mould of fortitude and loftiness 
her absolute unselfishness in all things large and small but the reticence which belonged to the greatness of her nature made her always refuse to allow me to lead her into the more public life whereto my work necessarily brought me and in her last sacred directions she forbids me to commemorate her by any written record only then in the hearts of the few who really knew her must her noble memory live i wrote the following lines to her some twenty-five years ago when spending a few days away from her in our home in london i found them again after her death among her papers they have a doubled meaning for me now when the time has come for me to need her most of all to mary c lloyd written in hartley combe lists about eighteen seventy three friend of my life whene'er my eyes beat with sudden glad surprise on nature's scene of earth and air sublimely grand or sweetly fair i want you mary when men and women gifted free speak their fresh thoughts ungrudgingly and springing forth each kindling mind streams like a meteor in the wind i want you mary when soft the summer evenings close and crimson in the sunset rose our cater glows majestic grand the crown of all your lovely land i want you mary and when the winter nights come round to our ain fireside cheerly bound with our dear rembrandt girl so brown smiling serenely on us down i want you mary now while the vigorous pulses leap still strong within my spirit's deep now while my yet unwearied brain weaves its thick web of thoughts amain i want you mary hereafter when slow ebbs the tide and age drains out my strength and pride and dim-grown eyes and trembling hand no longer list my soul's command i'll want you mary in joy and grief in good and ill friend of my heart i need you still my playmate friend companion love to dwell with here to clasp above i want you mary for oh if past the gates of death to me the unseen openeth immortal joys to angels given upon the holy heights of heaven i'll want you mary god has given me two priceless benedictions in life in my youth a perfect mother in my later years a perfect friend no other gifts had i possessed them genius or beauty or fame or the wealth of the indies could have been worthy to compare with the joy of those affections to live in companionship almost unbroken by separation and never marred by a doubt or a rough word with a mind in whose working my own found inexhaustible interest and my heart its rest a friend who knew me better than any one beside could ever know me and yet strange to think could love me better than any other this was happiness for which even now that it is over i thank god from the depths of my soul i thank him that i have had such a friend and i thank him that she died without prolonged suffering or distress with her head resting on my breast and her hand pressing mine calm and courageous to the last her old physician said when all was over i have seen many a great many men and women die but i never saw one die so bravely it has been possible for me through the kindness of my friend's sister to whom hengwert now belongs to obtain for my remaining months or years a lease of this dear old house and beautiful grounds and my winters of entire solitude and summers when a few friends or relations gather round me glide rapidly away i am still struggling on as my friend bade me literally with her dying breath working for the cause of the science-tortured brutes and i have even spoken again in public and written many pamphlets and letters for the press i hope as tennyson told me to do to fight the good fight quite to the end but there is a price which every aged heart perforce must pay for the long enjoyment of one soul-satisfying affection when that affection is lost it must be evermore lonely
End of section 31. Read by Chufi Galeazzi, Roner Park, California. End of Life of Frances Power Cobb as told by herself by Frances Power Cobb.